Section 1 of The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gabi The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin Introduction Part 1 Many works have been written on expression, but a greater number on physiognomy, that is, on the recognition of character through the study of the permanent form of the features. With this latter subject I am not here concerned. The older treatises which I have consulted have been of little or no service to me. The famous Conference of the painter Lebrun, published in 1667, is the best-known ancient work and contains some good remarks. Another somewhat old essay, namely the Discours, delivered 1774 to 1782 by the well-known Dutch anatomist Camper, can hardly be considered as having made any marked advance in the subject. The following works, on the contrary, deserve the fullest consideration. Sir Charles Bell, so illustrious for his discoveries in physiology, published in 1806 the first edition, and in the third edition of his Anatomy and Philosophy of Expression, he may with justice be said not only to have laid the foundations of the subject as a branch of science, but to have built up a noble structure. His work is in every way deeply interesting. It includes graphic descriptions of the various emotions and is admirably illustrated. It is generally admitted that his service consists chiefly in having shown the intimate relation which exists between the movements of expression and those of respiration. One of the most important points, small as it may at first appear, is that the muscles round the eyes are involuntarily contract during violent expiratory efforts in order to protect these delicate organs from the pressure of the blood. This fact, which has been fully investigated for me with the greatest kindness by Professor Stunders of Utrecht, throws, as we shall hereafter see, a flood of light on several of the most important expressions of the human countenance. The merits of Sir Charles Bell's work have been undervalued or quite ignored by several foreign writers, but have been fully admitted by some, for instance, by M. Lemoin, who with great justice says, Le livre de Charbel devrait être médité par quiconque essaye de faire parler le visage de l'homme, par les philosophes aussi bien que par les artistes, car, sous une apparence plus légère et sous le prétexte de l'esthétique, c'est un des plus beaux monuments de la science des rapports du physique et du moral. From reasons which will presently be assigned, Sir Charles Bell did not attempt to follow out his views as far as they might have been carried. He does not try to explain why different muscles are brought into action under different emotions, why, for instance, the inner ends of the eyebrows are raised and the corners of the mouth depressed by a person suffering from grief or anxiety. In 1807, M. Moreau edited an edition of Lavaté on Physiognomy, in which he incorporated several of his own essays, containing excellent descriptions of the movements of the facial muscles, together with many valuable remarks. He throws, however, very little light on the philosophy of the subject. For instance, M. Moreau in speaking of the act of frowning, that is, the contraction of the muscle called by French writers the soucilier, corrugator supercilii, remarks with truth. Cette action de sourcilier est un des symptômes les plus tranchés de l'expression des affections pénibles ou concentrées. 
He then adds that these muscles from the attachment and position are fitted à resserrer, à concentrer les principaux traits de la face, comme il convient dans toutes ces passions, vraiment oppressives ou profondes, dont ces affections dans le sentiment semblent porter l'organisation à revenir sur elle-même, à se contracter et à s'amoindrir, comme pour offrir moins de prise et de surface à des impressions redoutables ou importunes. He who thinks that remarks of this kind throw any light on the meaning or origin of the different expressions takes a very different view of the subject to what I do. The earliest edition of this work, referred to in the preface to the edition of 1820 in ten volumes, as containing the observations of Monsieur Moreau, is said to have been published in 1807, and I have no doubt that this is correct, because the Notice sur la Vate at the commencement of volume one is dated April 13, 1806. In some bibliographical works, however, the date of 1805 to 1809 is given, but it seems impossible that 1805 can be correct. Dr. Duchesne remarks, Mécanisme de la physionomie humaine, octavo édition, 1862, page 5, and Archive générale de médecine, Janvier et février 1862. That Monsieur Moreau a composé pour son ouvrage un article important, etc. In the year 1805, and I find in volume one of the edition of 1820 passages bearing the dates of December 12, 1805, and another January 5, 1806. Besides that of April 13, 1806, above referred to, in consequence of some of these passages having thus been composed in 1805, Dr. Duchesne assigns to Monsieur Moreau the priority over Sir Charles Bell, whose work, as we have seen, was published in 1806. This is a very unusual manner of determining the priority of scientific works, but such questions are of extremely little importance in comparison with their relative merits. The passages above, quoted from Monsieur Moreau and from Lebrun, are taken in this and all other cases from the edition of 1820 of Lavatee, tome 4, page 228, and tome 9, page 279. In the above passage there is but a slight, if any, advance in the philosophy of the subject beyond that reached by the painter Lebrun, who, in 1667, in describing the expression of fright, says, Le sourcil qui est abaissé d'un côté et élevé de l'autre Fait voir que la partie élevée semble le vouloir joindre au cerveau pour le garantir du mal que l'âme aperçoit. Et le côté qui est abaissé et qui paraît enflé nous fait trouver dans cet état par les esprits qui viennent du cerveau en abondance comme pour couvrir l'âme et la défendre du mal qu'elle crée. La bouche forte ouverte fait voir le saisissement du cœur par le sang qui se retire vers lui, ce qui l'oblige, voulant respirer, à faire un effort qui est cause que la bouche s'ouvre extrêmement et qui, lorsqu'il passe par les organes de la voix, forme un sang qui n'est point articulé, que si les muscles et les veines paraissent enflés, ce n'est que par les esprits que les cerveaux en voient en ces parties-là. I have thought the foregoing sentences worth quoting as specimens of the surprising nonsense which has been written on the subject. The physiology or mechanism of blushing by Dr. Burgess appeared in 1839 and to this work I shall frequently refer in my thirteenth chapter. 
In 1862, Dr. Duchenne published two editions, in folio and octavo, of his Mécanisme de la Physionomie Humaine, in which he analyzes by means of electricity and illustrates by magnificent photographs the movements of the facial muscles. He has generously permitted me to copy as many of his photographs as I desired. His works have been spoken lightly of, or quite passed over, by some of his countrymen. It is possible that Dr. Duchenne may have exaggerated the importance of the contraction of single muscles in giving expression for, owing to the intimate manner in which the muscles are connected, as may be seen in handless anatomical drawings, the best I believe ever published, it is difficult to believe in their separate action. Nevertheless, it is manifest that Dr. Duchenne clearly apprehended this and other sources of error, and as it is known that he was eminently successful in elucidating the physiology of the muscles of the hand by the aid of electricity, it is probable that he is generally in the right about the muscles of the face. In my opinion, Dr. Duchenne has greatly advanced the subject by his treatment of it. No one has more carefully studied the contraction of each separate muscle and the consequent furrows produced on the skin. He has also, and this is a very important service, shown which muscles are least under the separate control of the will. He enters very little into theoretical considerations and seldom attempts to explain why certain muscles and not others contract under the influence of certain emotions. A distinguished French anatomist, Pierre Graciolet, gave a course of lectures on expression at the Sorbonne, and his notes were published 1865 after his death, under the title of De la physionomie et des mouvements d'expression. This is a very interesting work, full of valuable observations. His theory is rather complex and, as far as it can be given in a single sentence, is as follows. Il résulte de tous les faits que j'ai rappelés que le sens, l'imagination et la pensée elle-même, si élevée, si abstraite qu'on la suppose, ne peuvent s'exercer sans éveiller un sentiment corrélatif, et que ce sentiment se traduit directement, sympathiquement, symboliquement ou métaphoriquement dans toutes les sphères des organes extérieurs qui la racontent tous, suivant leurs modes d'action propres comme si chacun d'eux avait été directement affecté. Graciolet appears to overlook inherited habit, and even to some extent habit in the individual, and therefore he fails, as it seems to me, to give the right explanation, or any explanation at all, of many gestures and expressions. As an illustration of what he calls symbolic movements, I will quote his remarks, taken from Monsieur Chevreul, on a man playing at billiards. Si une bille dévie légèrement de la direction que le joueur prétend lui imprimer, ne l'avez-vous pas vu cent fois la poussée du regard, de la tête et même des épaules, comme si ces mouvements, purement symboliques, pouvaient rectifier son trajet Des mouvements non moins significatifs se produisent quand la bille manque d'une impulsion suffisante. Et chez les joueurs novices, ils sont quelquefois accusés au point d'éveiller le sourire sur les lèvres du spectateur. Such movements, as it appears to me, may be attributed simply to habit. As often as a man has wished to move an object to one side, he has always pushed it to that side. When forwards, he has pushed it forwards, and if he has wished to arrest it, he has pulled backwards. Therefore, when a man sees his ball traveling in a wrong direction, and he intensely wishes it to go in another direction, he cannot avoid, from long habit, unconsciously performing movements which in other cases he has found effectual. 
As an instance of sympathetic movements, Graciolet gives the following case. A jeune chien à oreille droite, auquel son maître présente de loin quelque viande appétissante, fixe avec ardeur ses yeux sur cet objet dont il suit tous les mouvements, et pendant que les yeux regardent, les deux oreilles se portent en avant comme si cet objet pouvait être entendu. Here, instead of speaking of sympathy between the ears and eyes, it appears to me more simple to believe that as dogs during many generations have, whilst intently looking at any object, pricked their ears in order to perceive any sound, and conversely have looked intently in the direction of a sound to which they may have listened, the movements of these organs have become firmly associated together through long-continued habit. Dr. Piederit published in 1859 an essay on expression, which I have not seen, but in which, as he states, he forestalled Graciolet in many of his views. In 1867 he published his Wissenschaftliches System der Mimik und Physiognomik. It is hardly possible to give in a few sentences a fair notion of his views. Perhaps the two following sentences will tell as much as can be briefly told. The muscular movements of expression are in part related to imaginary objects and in part to imaginary central impressions. In this proposition lies the key to the comprehension of all expressive muscular movements. Again, Expressive movements manifest themselves chiefly in the numerous and mobile muscles of the face, partly because the nerves by which they are set into motion originate in the most immediate vicinity of the mind organ, but partly also because these muscles serve to support the organs of sense. If Dr. Peterit had studied Sir Charles Bell's work, he would probably not have said that violent laughter causes a frown from partaking of the nature of pain, or that with infants the tears irritate the eyes and thus excite the contraction of the surrounding and muscles. Many good remarks are scattered throughout this volume, to which I shall hereafter refer. Short discussions on expression may be found in various works which need not here be particularized. Mr. Bain, however, in two of his works, has treated the subject at some length. He says, I look upon the expression so called as part and parcel of the feeling. I believe it to be a general law of the mind that along with the fact of inward feeling or consciousness, there is a diffusive action or excitement over the bodily members. In another place he adds, A very considerable number of the facts may be brought under the following principle, namely, that states of pleasure are connected with an increase, and states of pain with an abatement, of some or all of the vital functions. But the above law of the diffusive action of feeling seems to general to throw much light on special expressions. Mr. Herbert Spencer, in treating of the feelings in his Principles of Psychology, 1855, makes the following remarks. Fear, when strong, expresses itself in cries, in efforts to hide or escape, in palpitations and tremblings, and these are just the manifestations that would accompany an actual experience of the evil feared. The destructive passions are shown in a general tension of the muscular system, in gnashing of the teeth and protrusion of the claws, in dilated eyes and nostrils and growls, and these are weaker forms of the actions that accompany the killing of prey. Here we have, as I believe, the true theory of a large number of expressions, but the chief interest and difficulty of the subject lies in following out the wonderfully complex results. I infer that someone, but who he is I have not been able to ascertain, 
formally advanced a nearly similar view for sir charles bell says it has been maintained that what are called the external signs of passion are only the concomitants of those voluntary movements which the structure renders necessary mr spencer has also published a valuable essay on the physiology of laughter in which he insists on the general law that feeling passing a certain pitch habitually vents itself in bodily action and that an overflow of nerve force undirected by any motive will manifestly take first the most habitual roots and if these do not suffice will next overflow into the less habitual ones this law i believe to be of the highest importance in throwing light on our subject all the authors who have written on expression with the exception of mr spencer the great expounder of the principle of evolution appear to have been firmly convinced that species men of course included came into existence in their present condition sir charles bell being thus convinced maintains that many of our facial muscles are purely instrumental in expression or are a special provision for the sole object but the simple fact that the anthropoid apes possess the same facial muscles as we do renders it very improbable that these muscles in our case serve exclusively for expression for no one i presume would be inclined to admit that monkeys have been endowed with special muscles solely for exhibiting their hideous grimaces distinct uses independently of expression can indeed be assigned with much probability for almost all the facial muscles. Sir Charles Bell evidently wished to draw as broad a distinction as possible between man and the lower animals, and he consequently asserts that with the lower creatures there is no expression but what may be referred more or less plainly to their acts of volition or necessary instincts. He further maintains that their faces seem chiefly capable of expressing rage and fear. But man himself cannot express love and humility by external signs so plainly as does a dog, when with drooping ears, hanging lips, flexuous body and wagging tail he meets his beloved master. Nor can these movements in the dog be explained by acts of volition or necessary instincts any more than the beaming eyes and smiling cheeks of a man when he meets an old friend. If Sir Charles Bell had been questioned about the expression of affection in the dog, he would no doubt have answered that this animal had been created with special instincts, adapting him for association with man, and that all further inquiry on the subject was superfluous although graciolet emphatically denies that any muscle has been developed solely for the sake of expression he seems never to have reflected on the principle of evolution he apparently looks at each species as a separate creation so it is with the other writers on expression for instance dr duchenne after speaking of the movements of the limbs refers to those which give expression to the face and remarks le créateur n'a donc pas eu à se préoccuper ici des besoins de la mécanique il a pu selon sa sagesse ou que l'homme pardonne cette manière de parler par une divine fantaisie mettre en action tel ou tel muscle un seul ou plusieurs muscles à la fois Lorsqu'il a voulu que les signes caractéristiques des patients, même les plus fugaces, fussent écrits passagèrement sur la face de l'homme. Ce langage de la physionomie une fois créé, il lui a suffi, pour le rendre universel et immuable, de donner à tout être humain la faculté instinctive d'exprimer toujours ses sentiments par la contraction des mêmes muscles. 
many writers consider the whole subject of expression as inexplicable thus the illustrious physiologist muller says the completely different expression of the features in different passions shows that according to the kind of feeling excited entirely different groups of the fibers of the facial nerve are acted on of the cause of this we are quite ignorant no doubt as long as man and all other animals are viewed as independent creations an effectual stop is put to our natural desire to investigate as far as possible the causes of expression by this doctrine anything and everything can be equally well explained and it is proved as pernicious with respect to expression as to every other branch of natural history with mankind some expressions such as the bristling of the hair under the influence of extreme terror or the uncovering of the teeth under that of furious rage can hardly be understood except on the belief that man once existed in a much lower and animal-like condition the community of certain expressions in distinct though allied species as in the movements of the same facial muscles during laughter by man and by various monkeys is rendered somewhat more intelligible if we believe in their descent from a common progenitor he who admits on general grounds that the structure and habits of all animals have been gradually evolved we we'll look at the whole subject of expression in a new and interesting light the study of expression is difficult owing to the movements being often extremely slight and of a fleeting nature a difference may be clearly perceived and yet it may be impossible at least i have found it so to state in what the difference consists when we witness any deep emotion our sympathy is so strongly excited that close observation is forgotten or rendered almost impossible of which fact i have had many curious proofs our imagination is another and still more serious source of error for if from the nature of the circumstances we expect to see any expression we readily imagine its presence notwithstanding dr duchenne's great experience he for a long time fancied as he states that several muscles contracted under certain emotions whereas he ultimately convinced himself that the movement was confined to a single muscle end of section one section two of the expression of the emotions in man and animals this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by patrick mcafee chicago introduction part two in order to acquire as good a foundation as possible and to ascertain independently of common opinion how far particular movements of the features and gestures are really expressive of certain states of the mind i have found the following means the most serviceable in the first place to observe infants for they exhibit many emotions as sir c bell remarks with extraordinary force whereas in after life some of our expressions cease to have the pure and simple source from which they spring in infancy in the second place it occurred to me that the insane ought to be studied as they are liable to the strongest passions and give uncontrolled vent to them i had myself no opportunity of doing this so i applied to dr maudsley and received from him an introduction to dr j crichton brown who has charge of an immense asylum near wakefield and who as i found had already attended to the subject this excellent observer has with unwearied kindness sent me copious notes and descriptions with valuable suggestions on many points and i can hardly overestimate the value of his assistance i owe also to the kindness of mr patrick nicole of the sussex lunatic asylum interesting statements on two or three points 
Thirdly, Dr. Duchenne galvanized, as we have already seen, certain muscles in the face of an old man whose skin was little sensitive and thus produced various expressions which were photographed on a large scale. It fortunately occurred to me to show several of the best plates, without a word of explanation, to above twenty educated persons of various ages in both sexes, asking them, in each case, by what emotion or feeling the old man was supposed to be agitated, and I recorded their answers in the words which they used. Several of the expressions were instantly recognized by almost everyone, though described in not exactly the same terms, and these may, I think, be relied on as truthful, and will hereafter be specified. On the other hand, the most widely different judgments were pronounced in regard to some of them. This exhibition was of use in another way, by convincing me how easily we may be misguided by our imagination. For when I first looked through Dr. Duchenne's photographs, reading at the same time the text, and thus learning what was intended, I was struck with admiration at the truthfulness of all, with only a few exceptions. Nevertheless, if I had examined them without any explanation, no doubt I should have been as much perplexed in some cases as other persons have been. Fourthly, I had hoped to derive much aid from the great masters in painting and sculpture, who are such close observers. Accordingly, I have looked at photographs and engravings of many well-known works, but, with a few exceptions, have not thus profited. The reason, no doubt, is that in works of art, beauty is the chief object, and strongly contracted facial muscles destroy beauty. The story of the composition is generally told with wonderful force and truth by skillfully given accessories. Fifthly, it seemed to me highly important to ascertain whether the same expressions and gestures prevail, as has often been asserted without much evidence, with all the races of mankind, especially with those who have associated but little with Europeans. Whenever the same movements of the features or body express the same emotions in several distinct races of man, we may infer with much probability that such expressions are true ones, that is, are innate or instinctive. Conventional expressions or gestures acquired by the individual during early life would probably have differed in the different races in the same manner as do their languages. Accordingly, I circulated, early in the year 1867, the following printed queries with a request, which has been fully responded to, that actual observations and not memory might be trusted. These queries were written after a considerable interval of time, during which my attention had been otherwise directed, and I can now see that they might have been greatly improved. To some of the later copies, I appended in manuscript a few additional remarks. 1. Is astonishment expressed by the eyes and mouth being opened wide and by the eyebrows being raised? 2. Does shame excite a blush when the color of the skin allows it to be visible, and especially how low down the body does the blush extend? 3. When a man is indignant or defiant, does he frown, hold his body and head erect, square his shoulders, and clench his fists? 4. When considering deeply on any subject or trying to understand any puzzle, does he frown or wrinkle the skin beneath the lower eyelids? 5. When in low spirits are the corners of the mouth depressed and the inner corner of the eyebrows raised by that muscle, which the French call the grief muscle. The eyebrow in this state becomes slightly oblique, with a little swelling at the inner end, and the forehead is transversely wrinkled in the middle part, but not across the whole breadth, as when the eyebrows are raised in surprise. 6. When in good spirits do the eyes sparkle? with the skin a little wrinkled round and under them, and with the mouth a little drawn back at the corners. 
7. When a man sneers or snarls at another, is the corner of the upper lip over the canine or eye tooth raised on the side facing the man whom he addresses? 8. Can a dogged or obstinate expression be recognized, which is chiefly shown by the mouth being firmly closed, a lowering brow, and a slight frown? 9. Is contempt expressed by a slight protrusion of the lips and by turning up the nose and with a slight expiration? 10. Is disgust shown by the lower lip being turned down, the upper lip slightly raised with a sudden expiration, something like incipient vomiting or like something spit out of the mouth? 11. Is extreme fear expressed in the same general manner as with Europeans? 12. Is laughter ever carried to such an extreme as to bring tears into the eyes? 13. When a man wishes to show that he cannot prevent something being done, or cannot himself do something, does he shrug his shoulders, turn inwards his elbows, extend outwards his hands, and open the palms with the eyebrows raised. 14. Do the children, when sulky, pout or greatly protrude the lips? 15. Can guilty or sly or jealous expressions be recognized, though I know not how these can be defined? 16. Is the head nodded vertically in affirmation and shaken laterally in negation? Observations on natives who have had little communication with Europeans would be, of course, the most valuable, though those made on any natives would be of much interest to me. General remarks on expression are of comparatively little value, and memory is so deceptive that I earnestly beg it may not be trusted. A definite description of the countenance under any emotion or frame of mind with a statement of the circumstances under which it occurred, would possess much value. To these queries I have received 36 answers from different observers, several of them missionaries or protectors of the Aborigines, to all of whom I am deeply indebted for the great trouble which they have taken and for the valuable aid thus received. I will specify their names, etc., towards the close of this chapter, so as not to interrupt my present remarks. The answers relate to several of the most distinct and savage races of man. In many instances, the circumstances have been recorded under which each expression was observed, and the expression itself described. In such cases, much confidence may be placed in the answers. When the answers have been simply yes or no, I have always received them with caution. It follows from the information thus acquired that the same state of mind is expressed throughout the world with remarkable uniformity, and this fact is in itself interesting as evidence of the close similarity in bodily structure and mental disposition of all the races of mankind. Sixthly, and lastly, I have attended as closely as I could to the expression of the several passions in some of the commoner animals, and this I believe to be of paramount importance, not, of course, for deciding how far in man certain expressions are characteristic of certain states of mind, but as affording the safest basis for generalization on the causes or origin of the various movements of expression. In observing animals, we are not so likely to be biased by our imagination, and we may feel safe that their expressions are not conventional. From the reasons above assigned, namely the fleeting nature of some expressions, the changes in the features being often extremely slight, our sympathy being easily aroused when we behold any strong emotion, and our attention thus distracted, our imagination deceiving us from knowing in a vague manner what to expect, though certainly few of us know what the exact changes in the countenance are, 
And lastly, even our long familiarity with the subject. From all these causes combined, the observation of expression is by no means easy, as many persons whom I have asked to observe certain points have soon discovered. Hence it is difficult to determine with certainty what are the movements of the features and of the body, which commonly characterize certain states of the mind. Nevertheless, some of the doubts and difficulties have, as I hope, been cleared away by the observation of infants, of the insane, of the different races of man, of works of art, and lastly, of the facial muscles under the action of galvanism, as effected by Dr. Duchenne. But there remains the much greater difficulty of understanding the cause or origin of the several expressions and of judging whether any theoretical explanation is trustworthy. Besides, judging as well as we can by our reason, without the aid of any rules, which of two or more explanations is the most satisfactory, or are quite unsatisfactory, I see only one way of testing our conclusions. This is to observe whether the same principle by which our one expression can, as it appears, be explained, is applicable in other allied cases, and especially whether the same general principles can be applied with satisfactory results both to man and the lower animals. This latter method, I am inclined to think, is the most serviceable of all. The difficulty of judging of the truth of any theoretical explanation and of testing it by some distinct line of investigation is the great drawback to that interest which the study seems well fitted to excite. Finally, with respect to my own observations, I may state that they were commenced in the year 1838, and from that time to the present day I have occasionally attended to the subject. At the above date, I was already inclined to believe in the principle of evolution, or of the derivation of species from other and lower forms. Consequently, when I read Sir C. Bell's great work, his view that man had been created with certain muscles specially adapted for the expression of his feelings struck me as unsatisfactory. It seemed probable that the habit of expressing our feelings by certain movements, though now rendered innate, had been in some manner gradually acquired. But to discover how such habits had been acquired was perplexing in no small degree. The whole subject had to be viewed under a new aspect, and each expression demanded a rational explanation. This belief led me to attempt the present work however imperfectly it may have been executed. I will now give the names of the gentlemen to whom, as I have said, I am deeply indebted for information in regard to the expressions exhibited by various races of man, and I will specify some of the circumstances under which the observations were in each case made. Owing to the great kindness and powerful influence of Mr. Wilson of Hayes Place, Kent, I have received from Australia no less than 13 sets of answers to my queries. This has been particularly fortunate, as the Australian Aborigines rank amongst the most distinct of all the races of man. It will be seen that the observations have been chiefly made in the south, in the outlying parts of the colony of Victoria, but some excellent answers have been received from the north. Mr. Dyson Lacey has given me in detail some valuable observations made several hundred miles in the interior of Queensland. To Mr. R. Bro Smith of Melbourne, I am much indebted for observations made by himself and for sending me several of the following letters, namely, from the Reverend Mr. Hagenauer of Lake Wellington, a missionary in Gippsland, Victoria, who has had much experience with the natives. From Mr. Samuel Wilson, a landowner residing at Langaranong, Wimera, Victoria, 
from the Reverend George Taplin, Superintendent of the Native Industrial Settlement at Port McLeay, from Mr. Archibald G. Lang of Corinderic, Victoria, a teacher at a school where Aborigines, old and young, are collected from all parts of the colony, from Mr. H. B. Lane of Belfast, Victoria, a police magistrate and warden, whose observations, I am assured, are highly trustworthy, from Mr. Templeton Bunnett of Echuca, whose station is on the borders of the colony of Victoria, and who has thus been able to observe many Aborigines who have had little intercourse with white men. He compared his observations with those made by two other gentlemen long resident in the neighborhood. Also from Mr. J. Bulmer, a missionary in the remote part of Gippsland, Victoria. I am also indebted to the distinguished botanist, Dr. Ferdinand Muller of Victoria, for some observations made by himself, and for sending me others made by Mrs. Green, as well as for some of the foregoing letters. In regard to the Maoris of New Zealand, the Reverend J. W. Stack, has answered only a few of my queries, but the answers have been remarkably full, clear, and distinct, with the circumstances recorded under which the observations were made. The Raja Brook has given me some information with respect to the Dyaks of Borneo. Respecting the Malays, I have been highly successful, for Mr. F. Geach, to whom I was introduced by Mr. Wallace, during his residence as a mining engineer in the interior of Malacca, observed many natives who had never before associated with white men. He wrote me two long letters with admirable and detailed observations on their expression. He likewise observed the Chinese immigrants in the Malay archipelago. The well-known naturalist, H. M. Consul, Mr. Swinho, also observed for me the Chinese in their native country, and he made inquiries from others whom he could trust. In India, Mr. H. Erskine, whilst residing in his official capacity in the Admednugur district in the Bombay Presidency, attended to the expression of the inhabitants but found much difficulty in arriving at any safe conclusions, owing to their habitual concealment of all emotions in the presence of Europeans. He also obtained information for me from Mr. West, the judge in Kanara, and he consulted some intelligent native gentlemen on certain points. In Calcutta, Mr. J. Scott, curator of the Botanic Gardens, carefully observed the various tribes of men therein employed during a considerable period, and no one has sent me such full and valuable details. The habit of accurate observation gained by his botanical studies has been brought to bear on our present subject. For Ceylon, I am much indebted to the Reverend S. O. Glennie for answers to some of my queries. Turning to Africa, I have been unfortunate with respect to the Negroes, though Mr. Winwood Reed aided me as far as lay in his power. It would have been comparatively easy to have obtained information in regard to the Negro slaves in America, but as they have been long associated with white men, such observations would have possessed little value. In the southern parts of the continent, Mrs. Barber observed the Kafirs and Fingos and sent me many distinct answers. Mr. J. P. Mansell Wheel also made some observations on the natives and procured for me a curious document, namely the opinion, written in English, of Christian Gaika, brother of the chief Sandili, on the expressions of his fellow countrymen. In the northern regions of Africa, Captain Speedy, who long resided with the Abyssinians, answered my queries partly from memory and partly from observations made on the son of King Theodore, 
who was then under his charge. Professor and Mrs. Asa Gray attended to some points in the expressions of the natives as observed by them whilst ascending the Nile. On the great American continent, Mr. Bridges, a catechist residing with the Fuegians, answered some few questions about their expression, addressed to him many years ago. In the northern half of the continent, Dr. Rothrock attended to the expressions of the wild Atna and Espiox tribes on the Nase River in northwestern America. Mr. Washington Matthews, assistant surgeon in the United States Army, also observed with special care after having seen my queries as printed in the Smithsonian Report, some of the wildest tribes in the western parts of the United States, namely the Tetons, Groventras, Mondons, and Assiniboines, and his answers have proved of the highest value. Lastly, besides these special sources of information, I have collected some few facts incidentally given in books of travels. As I shall often have to refer, more especially in the latter part of this volume, to the muscles of the human face, I have had a diagram, copied and reduced from Sir C. Bell's work, and two others with more accurate details, from her day's well-known Handbuch de Systematischen Anatomie des Menschen. The same letters refer to the same muscles in all three figures, but the names are given of only the more important ones to which I shall have to allude. The facial muscles blend much together, and as I am informed, hardly appear on a dissected face so distinct as they are here represented. Some writers consider that these muscles consist of 19 pairs, with one unpaired, but others make the number much larger, amounting even to 55, according to Moreau. They are, as is admitted by everyone who has written on the subject, very variable in structure and Moreau remarks that they are hardly alike in half a dozen subjects. They are also variable in function. Thus the power of uncovering the canine tooth on one side differs much in different persons. The power of raising the wings of the nostrils is also, according to Dr. Pideri, variable in a remarkable degree, and other such cases could be given. Finally, I must have the pleasure of expressing my obligations to Mr. Rejlander for the trouble which he has taken in photographing for me various expressions and gestures. I am also indebted to Herr Kindermann of Hamburg for the loan of some excellent negatives of crying infants, and to Dr. Wallach for a charming one of a smiling girl. I have already expressed my obligations to Dr. Duchenne for generously permitting me to have some of his large photographs copied and reduced. All these photographs have been printed by the heliotype process, and the accuracy of the copy is thus guaranteed. These plates are referred to by Roman numerals. I am also greatly indebted to Mr. T. W. Wood, for the extreme pains which he has taken in drawing from life the expressions of various animals. A distinguished artist, Mr. Riviere, has had the kindness to give me two drawings of dogs, one in a hostile and the other in a humble and caressing frame of mind. Mr. A. May has also given me two similar sketches of dogs. Mr. Cooper has taken much care in cutting the blocks. Some of the photographs and drawings, namely those by Mr. May and those by Mr. Wolf of the Sinopithecus, were first reproduced by Mr. Cooper on wood by means of photography and then engraved. By this means, almost complete fidelity.
Section 3 of the Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin. Chapter 1 General Principles of Expression. Part 1. The three chief principles stated. The first principle, serviceable actions become habitual in association with certain states of the mind, and are performed whether or not of service in each particular case. The force of habit. Inheritance. Associated habitual movements in man. Reflex actions. Passage of habits into reflex actions. Associated habitual movements in the lower animals. Concluding remarks. I will begin by giving the three principles, which appear to me to account for most of the expressions and gestures involuntarily used by man and the lower animals, under the influence of various emotions and sensations. I arrived, however, at these three principles only at the close of my observations. They will be discussed in the present and two following chapters in a general manner. Facts observed both with man and the lower animals will be here made use of, but the latter facts are preferable, as less likely to deceive us. In the fourth and fifth chapters I will describe the special expressions of some of the lower animals, and in the succeeding chapters those of man. Every one will thus be able to judge for himself how far my three principles throw light on the theory of the subject. It appears to me that so many expressions are thus explained in a fairly satisfactory manner, that probably all will hereafter be found to come under the same or closely analogous heads. I need hardly premise that movements or changes in any part of the body, as the wagging of a dog's tail, the drawing back of a horse's ears, the shrugging of a man's shoulders, or the dilatation of the capillary vessels of the skin, may all equally well serve for expression. The three principles are as follows. 1. The principle of serviceable associated habits. Certain complex actions are of direct or indirect service under certain states of the mind, in order to relieve or gratify certain sensations, desires, etc., and whenever the same state of mind is induced, however feebly, there is a tendency through the force of habit and association for the same movements to be performed, though they may not then be of the least use. Some actions ordinarily associated through habit with certain states of the mind may be partially repressed through the will, and in such cases the muscles which are least under the separate control of the will are the most liable still to act, causing movements which we recognize as expressive. In certain other cases, the checking of one habitual movement requires other slight movements, and these are likewise expressive. 2. The Principle of Antithesis Certain states of the mind lead to certain habitual actions which are of service, as under our first principle. Now, when a directly opposite state of mind is induced, there is a strong and involuntary tendency to the performance of movements of a directly opposite nature, though these are of no use, and such movements are in some cases highly expressive. 3. The principle of actions due to the constitution of the nervous system, independently from the first of the will, and independently to a certain extent of habit. When the sensorium is strongly excited, nerve force is generated in excess, and is transmitted in certain definite directions, depending on the connection of the nerve cells, and partly on habit. Or the supply of nerve force may, as it appears, be interrupted. Effects are thus produced, which we recognize as expressive. This third principle may, for the sake of brevity, 
be called that of the direct action of the nervous system. With respect to our first principle, it is notorious how powerful is the force of habit. The most complex and difficult movements can in time be performed without the least effort or consciousness. It is not positively known how it comes that habit is so efficient in facilitating complex movements, but physiologists admit quote, that the conducting power of the nervous fibers increases with the frequency of their excitement. End quote. This applies to the nerves of motion and sensation as well as to those connected with the act of thinking. That some physical change is produced in the nerve cells, or nerves which are habitually used, can hardly be doubted, for otherwise it is impossible to understand how the tendency to certain acquired movements is inherited. That they are inherited we see with horses in certain transmitted paces, such as cantering and ambling, which are not natural to them in the pointing of young pointers and the setting of young setters, in the peculiar manner of flight of certain breeds of the pigeon, etc. We have analogous cases with mankind in the inheritance of tricks or unusual gestures to which we shall presently recur. To those who admit the gradual evolution of species, a most striking instance of the perfection with which the most difficult consensual movements can be transmitted is afforded by the hummingbird sphinx moth, macroglossa. For this moth, shortly after its emergence from the cocoon, as shown by the bloom on its unruffled scales, may be seen poised stationary in the air, with its long hair-like proboscis uncurled, and inserted into the minute orifices of flowers. And no one, I believe, has ever seen this moth learning to perform its difficult task, which requires such unerring aim. When there exists an inherited or instinctive tendency to the performance of an action, or an inherited taste for certain kinds of food, some degree of habit in the individual is often or generally requisite. We find this in the paces of the horse, and to a certain extent in the pointing of dogs, although some young dogs point excellently the first time they are taken out, yet they often associate the proper inherited attitude with a wrong odor, and even with eyesight. I have heard it asserted that if a calf is allowed to suck its mother only once, it is much more difficult afterwards to rear it by hand. Caterpillars which have been fed on the leaves of one kind of tree have been known to perish from hunger rather than eat the leaves of another tree, although this afforded them their proper food under a state of nature. And so it is in many other cases. The power of association is admitted by everyone. Mr. Bain remarks that, quote, actions, sensations, and states of feeling occurring together or in close succession, tend to grow together, or cohere, in such a way that, when any of them is afterwards presented to the mind, the others are apt to be brought up in idea. End quote. It is so important for our purpose fully to recognize that actions readily become associated with other actions, and with various states of the mind, that I will give a good many instances, in the first place relating to man, and afterwards to the lower animals. Some of the instances are of a very trifling nature, but they are as good for our purpose as more important habits. It is known to everyone how difficult, or even impossible it is, without repeated trials, to move the limbs in certain opposed directions which have never been practiced. Analogous cases occur with sensations, as in the common experiment of rolling a marble beneath the tips of two crossed fingers, when it feels exactly like two marbles. Everyone protects himself when falling to the ground by extending his arms, and as Professor Allison has remarked, few can resist acting thus, when voluntarily falling on a soft bed. A man, when going out of doors, puts on his gloves quite unconsciously. And this may seem an extremely simple operation, 
but he who has taught a child to put on gloves knows that this is by no means the case. When our minds are much affected, so are the movements of our bodies. But here another principle besides habit, namely the undirected overflow of nerve force, partially comes into play. Norfolk, in speaking of Cardinal Wolsey, says, quote, Some strange commotion is in his brain. He bites his lip and starts, stops on a sudden, looks upon the ground, then lays his finger on his temple, straight springs out into fast gait, then stops again, strikes his breast hard, and anon he casts his eye against the moon. In most strange postures we have seen him set himself. End quote. Henry the Eighth, Act Three, Scene Two. A vulgar man often scratches his head when perplexed in mind, and I believe that he acts thus from habit, as if he experienced a slightly uncomfortable body sensation, namely the itching of his head, to which he is particularly liable, and which he thus relieves. Another man rubs his eyes when perplexed, or gives a little cough when embarrassed, acting in either case as if he felt a slightly uncomfortable sensation in his eyes or windpipe. From the continued use of the eyes, these organs are especially liable to be acted on through association under various states of the mind, although there is manifestly nothing to be seen. A man, as Gratiolet remarks, who vehemently rejects a proposition, will almost certainly shut his eyes or turn away his face, but if he accepts the proposition, he will nod his head in affirmation and open his eyes widely. The man acts in this latter case as if he clearly saw the thing, and in the former case as if he did not or would not see it. I have noticed that persons in describing a horrid sight often shut their eyes momentarily and firmly, or shake their heads, as if not to see or drive away something disagreeable and I have caught myself when thinking in the dark of a horrible spectacle, closing my eyes firmly, in looking suddenly at any object, or in looking all around, every one raises his eyebrows, so that the eyes may be quickly and widely opened. And Duchenne remarks that a person in trying to remember something often raises his eyebrows as if to see it. A Hindu gentleman made exactly the same remark to Mr. Erskine in regard to his countrymen. I noticed a young lady earnestly trying to recollect a painter's name, and she first looked to one corner of the ceiling and then to the opposite corner, arching the one eyebrow on that side, although, of course, there was nothing to be seen there. In most of the foregoing cases, we can understand how the associated movements were acquired through habit. But with some individuals, certain strange gestures or tricks have arisen in association with certain states of the mind, owing to wholly inexplicable causes, and are undoubtedly inherited. I have elsewhere given one instance from my own observation of an extraordinary and complex gesture associated with pleasurable feelings, which was transmitted from a father to his daughter, as well as some other analogous facts. Another curious instance of an odd inherited movement, associated with the wish to obtain an object, will be given in the course of this volume. There are other actions which are commonly performed under certain circumstances, independently of habit, and which seem to be due to imitation or some sort of sympathy. Thus persons cutting anything with a pair of scissors may be seen to move their jaws simultaneously with the blades of the scissors. Children learning to write often twist about their tongues as their fingers move, in a ridiculous fashion. When a public singer suddenly becomes a little hoarse, Many of those present may be heard, as I have been assured by a gentleman on whom I can rely, to clear their own throats. 
but here habit probably comes into play as we clear our own throats under similar circumstances i have also been told that at leaping matches as the performer makes his spring many of the spectators generally men and boys move their feet but here again habit probably comes into play for it is very doubtful whether women would thus act reflex actions reflex actions in the strict sense of the term are due to the excitement of a peripheral nerve which transmits its influence to certain nerve cells and these in their turn excite certain muscles or glands into action and all this may take place without any sensation or consciousness on our part though often thus accompanied as many reflex actions are highly expressive the subject must here be noticed at some little length we shall also see that some of them graduate into and can hardly be distinguished from actions which have arisen through habit coughing and sneezing are familiar instances of reflex actions with infants the first act of respiration is often a sneeze although this requires the coordinated movement of numerous muscles respiration is partly voluntary but mainly reflex and is performed in the most natural and best manner without the interference of the will a vast number of complex movements are reflex as good an instance as can be given is the often quoted one of a decapitated frog which cannot of course feel and cannot consciously perform any movement yet if a drop of acid be placed on the lower surface of the thigh of a frog in this state it will rub off the drop with the upper surface of the foot of the same leg if this foot be cut off it cannot thus act Quote, after some fruitless efforts therefore it gives up trying in that way seems restless as though says fluger that it was seeking some other way and at last it makes use of the foot of the other leg and succeeds in rubbing off the acid notably we have here not merely contractions of muscles but combined and harmonized contractions in due sequence for a special purpose these are actions that have all the appearance of being guided by intelligence and instigated by will in an animal the recognized organ of whose intelligence and will has been removed End quote. we see the difference between reflex and voluntary movements in very young children not being able to perform as i am informed by sir henry holland certain acts somewhat analogous to those of sneezing and coughing namely in their not being able to blow their noses in other words to compress the nose and blow violently through the passage and in their not being able to clear their throats of phlegm they have to learn to perform these acts yet they are performed by us when a little older almost as easily as reflex actions sneezing and coughing however can be controlled by the will only partially or not at all whilst the clearing the throat and blowing the nose are completely under our command when we are conscious of the presence of an irritating particle in our nostrils or windpipe that is when the same sensory nerve cells are excited as in the case of sneezing and coughing we can voluntarily expel the particle by forcibly driving air through these passages but we cannot do this with nearly the same force rapidity and precision as by a reflex action in this latter case the sensory nerve cells apparently excite the motor nerve cells without any waste of power by first communicating with the cerebral hemispheres the seat of our consciousness and volition in all cases there seems to exist a profound antagonism between the same movements as directed by the will and by a reflex stimulant in the force with which they are performed and in the facility with which they are excited 
as Claude Bernard asserts, l'influence du cerveau tend donc à entraver les mouvements réflexes et limiter leur force et leur attendu. End quote. The conscious wish to perform a reflex action sometimes stops or interrupts its performance, though the proper sensory nerves may be stimulated. For instance, many years ago I laid a small wager with a dozen young men that they would not sneeze if they took snuff, although they all declared that they invariably did so. Accordingly, they all took a pinch, but from wishing much to succeed, not one sneezed though their eyes watered, and all, without exception, had to pay me the wager. Sir H. Holland remarks that attention paid to the act of swallowing interferes with the proper movements, from which it probably follows, at least in part, that some persons find it so difficult to swallow a pill. Another familiar instance of a reflex action is the involuntary closing of the eyelids when the surface of the eye is touched. A similar winking movement is caused when a blow is directed towards the face, but this is an habitual and not a strictly reflex action, as the stimulus is conveyed through the mind and not by the excitement of a peripheral nerve. The whole body and head are generally at the same time drawn suddenly backwards. These latter movements, however, can be prevented if the danger does not appear to the imagination imminent. But our reason telling us that there is no danger does not suffice. I may mention a trifling fact, illustrating this point, and which at the time amused me. I put my face close to the thick glass plate in front of a puff adder in the zoological gardens, with the firm determination of not starting back if the snake struck at me. But as soon as the blow was struck, my resolution went for nothing, and I jumped a yard or two backwards with astonishing rapidity. My will and reason were powerless against the imagination of a danger which had never been experienced. The violence of a start seems to depend partly on the vividness of the imagination and partly on the condition, either habitual or temporary, of the nervous system. He who will attend to the starting of his horse, when tired and fresh, will perceive how perfect is the gradation from a mere glance at some unexpected object, with a momentary doubt whether it is dangerous, to a jump so rapid and violent that the animal probably could not voluntarily whirl round in so rapid a manner. The nervous system of a fresh and highly fed horse sends its order to the motory system so quickly that no time is allowed for him to consider whether or not the danger is real. After one violent start, when he is excited and the blood flows freely through his brain, he is very apt to start again. And so it is, as I have noticed, with young infants. A start from a sudden noise, when the stimulus is conveyed through the auditory nerves, is always accompanied in grown-up persons by the winking of the eyelids. I observed, however, that though my infants started at sudden sounds, when under a fortnight old, they certainly did not always wink their eyes, and I believe never did so. The start of an older infant apparently represents a vague catching hold of something to prevent falling. I shook a pasteboard box close before the eyes of one of my infants, when 114 days old, and it did not in the least wink. But when I put a few comfits into the box, holding it in the same position as before, and rattled them, the child blinked its eyes violently every time, and started a little. It was obviously impossible that a carefully guarded infant could have learnt by experience that a rattling sound near its eyes indicated danger to them. But such experience will have been slowly gained at a later age 
during a long series of generations. And from what we know of inheritance, there is nothing improbable in the transmission of a habit to the author. Section 4 of The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rick of Las Vegas, Nevada. The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin. Chapter 1, Part 2. From the foregoing remarks, it seems probable that some actions, which were at first performed consciously, have become, through habit and association, converted into reflex actions, and are now so firmly fixed and inherited that they are performed, even when not of the least use, as often as the same causes arise, which originally excited them in us through the volition. In such cases, the sensory nerve cells excite the motor cells, without first communicating with those cells on which our consciousness and volition depend. It is probable that sneezing and coughing were originally acquired by the habit of expelling, as violently as possible, any irritating particle from the sensitive air passages. As far as time is concerned, there has been more than enough for these habits to have become innate or converted into reflex actions, for they are common to most or all of the higher quadrupeds, and must therefore have been first acquired at a very remote period. Why the act of clearing the throat is not a reflex action, and has to be learnt by our children, I cannot pretend to say but we can see why blowing the nose on a handkerchief has to be learnt. It is scarcely credible that the movements of a headless frog, when it wipes off a drop of acid or other object from its thigh, and which movements are so well coordinated for a special purpose, were not at first performed voluntarily, being afterwards rendered easy through long-continued habit, so as at last to be performed unconsciously, or independently of the cerebral hemispheres. So again it appears probable that starting was originally acquired by the habit of jumping away as quickly as possible from danger whenever any of our senses gave us warning. Starting, as we have seen, is accompanied by the blinking of the eyelids, so as to protect the eyes, the most tender and sensitive organs of the body. And it is, I believe, always accompanied by a sudden and forcible inspiration, which is the natural preparation for any violent effort. But when a man or horse starts, his heart beats wildly against his ribs. And here, it may be truly said, we have an organ which has never been under the control of the will, partaking in the general reflex movements of the body. To this point, however, I shall return in a future chapter. The contraction of the iris, when the retina is stimulated by a bright light, is another instance of a movement which it appears cannot possibly have been at first voluntarily performed and then fixed by habit, for the iris is not known to be under the conscious control of the will in any animal. In such cases, some explanation, quite distinct from habit, will have to be discovered. The radiation of nerve force from strongly excited nerve cells to other connected cells, as in the case of a bright light on the retina, causing a sneeze, may perhaps aid us in understanding how some reflex actions originated. A radiation of nerve force of this kind, if it caused a movement tending to lessen the primary irritation, as in the case of the contraction of the iris, preventing too much light from falling on the retina, might afterwards have been taken advantage of and modified for this special purpose. It further deserves notice that reflex actions are, in all probability, liable to slight variations, as are all corporeal structures and instincts, and any variations which were beneficial and of sufficient importance would tend to be preserved and inherited. 
Thus, reflex actions, when once gained for one purpose, might afterwards be modified independently of the will or habit, so as to serve for some distinct purpose. Such cases would be parallel with those which, as we have every reason to believe, have occurred with many instincts. For although some instincts have been developed simply through long-continued and inherited habit, other highly complex ones have been developed through the preservation of variations of pre-existing instincts, that is, through natural selection. I have discussed at some little length, though as I am well aware, in a very imperfect manner, the acquirement of reflex actions, because they are often brought into play in connection with movements expressive of our emotions, and it was necessary to show that at least some of them might have been erst acquired through the will, in order to satisfy a desire, or to relieve a disagreeable sensation." Associated Habitual Movements in the Lower Animals I have already given, in the case of man, several instances of movements associated with various states of the mind or body, which are now purposeless, but which were originally of use, and are still of use under certain circumstances. As this subject is very important for us, I will here give a considerable number of analogous facts, with reference to animals, although many of them are of a very trifling nature. My object is to show that certain movements were originally performed for a definite end, and that under nearly the same circumstances they are still pertinaciously performed through habit, when not of the least use. That the tendency in most of the following cases is inherited, we may infer from such actions being performed in the same manner by all the individuals, young and old, of the same species. We shall also see that they are excited by the most diversified, often circuitous, and sometimes mistaken associations. Dogs, when they wish to go to sleep on a carpet or other hard surface, generally turn round and round, and scratch the ground with their forepaws in a senseless manner as if they intended to trample down the grass and scoop out a hollow, as no doubt their wild parents did when they lived on open grassy plains or in the woods. Jackals, fennecs, and other allied animals in the zoological gardens treat their straw in this manner, but it's a rather odd circumstance that the keepers, after observing for some months, have never seen the wolves thus behave. A semi-idiotic dog and an animal in this condition would be particularly liable to follow a senseless habit, was observed by a friend, to turn completely round on a carpet thirteen times before going to sleep. Many carnivorous animals, as they crawl towards their prey and prepare to rush or spring on it, lower their heads and crouch partly, as it would appear, to hide themselves, and partly to get ready for their rush. And this habit, in an exaggerated form, has become hereditary in our pointers and setters. Now I have noticed scores of times that when two strange dogs meet on an open road, the one which first sees the other, though at the distance of one or two hundred yards, after the first glance always lowers its head, generally crouches a little, or even lies down. That is, he takes the proper attitude for concealing himself and for making a rush or spring, although the road is quite open and the distance great. Again, dogs of all kinds, when intently watching and slowly approaching their prey, frequently keep one of their four legs doubled up for a long time, ready for the next cautious step and this is eminently characteristic of the pointer. But from habit they behave in exactly the same manner, whenever their attention is aroused. I have seen a dog at the foot of a high wall listening attentively to a sound on the opposite side, with one leg doubled up, and in this case there could have been no intention of making a cautious approach. Dogs, after voiding their excrement, often make with all four feet a few scratches backwards, even on a bare stone pavement, as if for the purpose of covering up their excrement with earth, in nearly the same manner as do cats. Wolves and jackals behave in the zoological gardens in exactly the same manner, 
Yet, as I am assured by the keepers, neither wolves, jackals, nor foxes, when they have the means of doing so, ever cover up their excrement any more than do dogs. All these animals, however, bury superfluous food. Hence, if we rightly understand the meaning of the above cat-like habit, of which there can be little doubt, we have a purposeless remnant of an habitual movement which was originally followed by some remote progenitor of the dog genus for a definite purpose, and which has been retained for a prodigious length of time. Dogs and jackals take much pleasure in rolling and rubbing their necks and backs on carrion. The odor seems delightful to them, though dogs at least do not eat carrion. Mr. Bartlett has observed wolves for me and has given them carrion, but has never seen them roll on it. I have heard it remarked, and I believe it to be true, that the larger dogs, which are probably descended from wolves, do not so often roll in carrion as do smaller dogs, which are probably descended from jackals. When a piece of brown biscuit is offered to a terrier of mine and she is not hungry, and I have heard of similar instances, she first tosses it about and worries it, as if it were a rat or other prey. She then repeatedly rolls on it precisely as if it were a piece of carrion, and at last eats it. It would appear that an imaginary relish has to be given to the distasteful morsel. And to effect, this the dog acts in his habitual manner, as if the biscuit was a live animal or smelt like carrion, though he knows better than we do that this is not the case. I have seen this same terrier act in the same manner after killing a little bird or mouse. Dogs scratch themselves by a rapid movement of one of their hind feet, and when their backs are rubbed with a stick, so strong is the habit that they cannot help rapidly scratching the air or the ground in a useless and ludicrous manner. The terrier, just alluded to, when thus scratched with a stick, will sometimes show her delight by another habitual movement, namely, by licking the air as if it were my hand. Horses scratch themselves by nibbling those parts of their bodies which they can reach with their teeth, but more commonly one horse shows another where he wants to be scratched, and they then nibble each other. A friend whose attention I had called to the subject observed that when he rubbed his horse's neck, the animal protruded his head, uncovered his teeth, and moved his jaws, exactly as if nibbling on another horse's neck, for he could never have nibbled his own neck. If a horse is much tickled, as when curry combed, his wish to bite something becomes so intolerably strong that he will clatter his teeth together, and though not vicious, bite his groom. At the same time, from habit, he closely depresses his ears, so as to protect them from being bitten, as if he were fighting with another horse. A horse, when eager to start on a journey, makes the nearest approach which he can to the habitual movement of progression by pawing the ground. Now when horses in their stalls are about to be fed and are eager for their corn, they paw the pavement or the straw. Two of my horses thus behave, when they see or hear the corn given to their neighbors. But here we have what may almost be called a true expression, as pawing the ground is universally recognized as a sign of eagerness. Cats cover up their excrements of both kinds with earth, and my grandfather saw a kitten scraping ashes over a spoonful of pure water spilt on the hearth so that here a habitual or instinctive action was falsely excited, not by a previous act or by odor, but by eyesight. It is well known that cats dislike wetting their feet, owing, it is probable, to their having originally inhabited the dry country of Egypt, and when they wet their feet they shake them violently. My daughter poured some water into a glass close to the head of a kitten, and it immediately shook its feet in the usual manner, so that here we have a habitual movement, falsely excited by an associated sound, instead of by the sense of touch. Kittens, puppies, young pigs, and probably many other young animals 
alternately push with their forefeet against the mammary glands of their mothers to excite a freer secretion of milk or to make it flow. Now, it is very common with young cats, and not at all rare with old cats of the common and Persian breeds, believed by some naturalists to be specifically extinct, when comfortably lying on a warm shawl or other soft substance, to pound it quietly and alternately with their forefeet, their toes being spread out and claws slightly protruded, precisely as when sucking their mother. That it is the same movement is clearly shown by their, often at the same time, taking a bit of the shawl into their mouths and sucking it, generally closing their eyes and purring from delight. This curious movement is commonly excited only in association with the sensation of a warm, soft surface. But I have seen an old cat, when pleased by having its back scratched, pounding the air with its feet in the same manner, so that this action has almost become the expression of a pleasurable sensation. Having referred to the act of sucking, I may add that this complex movement, as well as the alternate protrusion of the forefeet, are reflex actions, for they are performed if a finger moistened with milk is placed in the mouth of a puppy, the front part of whose brain has been removed. It has recently been stated in France that the action of sucking is excited solely through the sense of smell, so that if the olfactory nerves of a puppy are destroyed, it never sucks. In like manner, the wonderful power which a chicken possesses only a few hours after being hatched of picking up small particles of food seems to be started into action through the sense of hearing. For with chickens hatched by artificial heat, a good observer found that making a noise with the fingernail against a board, in imitation of the hen mother, first taught them to peck at their meat. I will give only one other instance of an habitual and purposeless movement. The shell drake feeds on the sands left uncovered by the tide. And when a worm cast is discovered, it begins patting the ground with its feet, dancing, as it were, over the hole, and this makes the worm come to the surface. Now, Mr. St. John says that when his tame sheldrakes came to ask for food, they patted the ground in an impatient and rapid manner. This, therefore, may also be considered as their expression of hunger. Mr. Bartlett informs me that the flamingo and the kagu, when anxious to be fed, beat the ground with their feet in the same odd manner. So again, kingfishers, when they catch a fish, always beat it until it is killed. And in the zoological gardens, they always beat the raw meat, with which they are sometimes fed before devouring it. We have now, I think, sufficiently shown the truth of our first principle— namely, that when any sensation, desire, or dislike has led during a long series of generations to some voluntary movement, then a tendency to the performance of a similar movement will almost certainly be excited, whenever the same or any analogous or associated sensation, although very weak, is experienced, notwithstanding that the movement in this case may not be of the least use. Such habitual movements are often or generally inherited, and they then differ but little from reflex actions. When we treat of the special expressions of man, the latter part of our first principle, as given at the commencement of this chapter, will be seen to hold good, namely that when movements associated through habit with certain states of the mind are partially repressed by the will, the strictly involuntary muscles as well as those which are least under the separate control of the will, are liable still to act, and their action is often highly expressive. Conversely, when the will is temporarily or permanently weakened, the voluntary muscles fail before the involuntary. It is a fact, familiar to pathologists, as Sir C. Bell remarks, that when debility arises from affection of the brain, the influence is greatest on those muscles which are, in their natural condition, most under the command of the will. We shall also, in our future chapters, consider another proposition, included in our first principle, namely that the checking of one habitual
Section 5 of the Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Casey Carlson, Los Angeles. www.kaseycarlson.com the Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin Chapter 2 General Principles of Expression The Principle of Antithesis Instances in the Dog and Cat Origin of the Principle Conventional Signs The Principle of Antithesis has not arisen from opposite actions being consciously performed under opposite impulses. We will now consider our second principle, that of antithesis. Certain states of the mind lead, as we have seen in the last chapter, to certain habitual movements which were primarily or may still be of service. And we shall find that when a directly opposite state of mind is induced, there is a strong and involuntary tendency to the performance of movements of a directly opposite nature, though these have never been of any service. A few striking instances of antithesis will be given when we treat of the special expressions of man. But as, in these cases, we are particularly liable to confound conventional or artificial gestures and expressions with those which are innate or universal, and which alone deserve to rank as true expressions, I will, in the present chapter, almost confine myself to the lower animals." When a dog approaches a strange dog or man in a savage or hostile frame of mind, he walks upright and very stiffly. His head is slightly raised or not much lowered. The tail is held erect and quite rigid. The hairs bristle, especially along the neck and back. The pricked ears are directed forwards, and the eyes have a fixed stare. These actions, as will hereafter be explained, follow from the dog's intention to attack his enemy, and are thus to a large extent intelligible. As he prepares to spring with a savage growl on his enemy, the canine teeth are uncovered, and the ears are pressed close backwards on the head. But with these latter actions we are not here concerned. Let us now suppose that the dog suddenly discovers that the man he is approaching is not a stranger, but his master." and let it be observed how completely and instantaneously his whole bearing is reversed. Instead of walking upright, the body sinks downwards or even crouches, and is thrown into flexuous movements. His tail, instead of being held stiff and upright, is lowered and wagged from side to side. His hair instantly becomes smooth. His ears are depressed and drawn backwards, but not closely to the head, and his lips hang loosely. From the drawing back of the ears, the eyelids become elongated, and the eyes no longer appear round and staring. It should be added that the animal is at such times an excited condition from joy, and nerve force will be generated in excess, which naturally leads to action of some kind. Not one of the above movements, so clearly expressive of affection, are of the least direct service to the animal. They are explicable, as far as I can see, solely from being in complete opposition or antithesis to the attitude and movements which, from intelligible causes, are assumed when a dog intends to fight, and which consequently are expressive of anger. I request the reader to look at the four accompanying sketches, which have been given in order to recall vividly the appearance of a dog under these two states of mind. It is, however, not a little difficult to represent affection in a dog, whilst caressing his master and wagging his tail, as the essence of the expression lies in the continuous flexuous movements. We will now turn to the cat. When this animal is threatened by a dog, it arches its back in a surprising manner, erects its hair, opens its mouth and spits. But we are not here concerned with this well-known attitude, expressive of terror combined with anger. We are concerned only with that of rage or anger. This is not often seen, but may be observed when two cats are fighting together. And I have seen it well exhibited by a savage cat whilst plagued by a boy. 
the attitude is almost exactly the same as that of a tiger disturbed and growling over its food, which everyone must have beheld in menageries. The animal assumes a crouching position with a body extended, and the whole tail, or the tip alone, is lashed or curled from side to side. The hair is not in the least erect. Thus far, the attitude and movements are nearly the same as when the animal is prepared to spring on its prey, and when, no doubt, it feels savage. But when preparing to fight, there is this difference, that the ears are closely pressed backwards. The mouth is partially opened, showing the teeth. The forefeet are occasionally struck out with protruded claws, and the animal occasionally utters a fierce growl. All or almost all these actions naturally follow, as hereafter to be explained, from the cat's manner and intention of attacking its enemy. Let us now look at a cat in a directly opposite frame of mind, whilst feeling affectionate and caressing her master. And mark how opposite is her attitude in every respect. She now stands upright with her back slightly arched, which makes the hair appear rather rough, but it does not bristle. Her tail, instead of being extended and lashed from side to side, is held quite still and perpendicularly upwards. Her ears are erect and pointed, her mouth is closed, and she rubs against her master with a purr instead of a growl. Let it further be observed how widely different is the whole bearing of an affectionate cat from that of a dog, when with his body crouching and fluctuous, his tail lowered and wagging, and ears depressed, he caresses his master. This contrast in the attitudes and movements of these two carnivorous animals, under the same pleased and affectionate frame of mind, can be explained, as it appears to me, solely by their movements standing in complete antithesis to those which are naturally assumed, when these animals feel savage and are prepared either to fight or to seize their prey. In these cases of the dog and cat, there is every reason to believe that the gestures both of hostility and affection are innate or inherited, for they are almost identically the same in the different races of the species, and in all the individuals of the same race, both young and old. I will here give one other instance of antithesis in expression. I formerly possessed a large dog who, like every other dog, was much pleased to go out walking. He showed his pleasure by trotting gravely before me with high steps, head much raised, moderately erected ears, and tail carried aloft but not stiffly. Not far from my house, a path branches off to the right, leading to the hot house, which I used often to visit for a few moments to look at my experimental plants. This was always a great disappointment to the dog, as he did not know whether I should continue my walk and the instantaneous and complete change of expression which came over him as soon as my body swerved in the least towards the path, and I sometimes tried this as an experiment, was laughable. His look of dejection was known to every member of the family, and was called his hothouse face. This consisted in the head drooping much, the whole body sinking a little and remaining motionless, the ears and tail falling suddenly down, but the tail was by no means wagged. With the falling of the ears and of his great chaps, the eyes became much changed in appearance, and I fancied that they looked less bright. His aspect was that of piteous, hopeless dejection, and it was, as I have said, laughable, as the cause was so slight. Every detail in his attitude was in complete opposition to his former joyful yet dignified bearing, and can be explained, as it appears to me, in no other way except through the principle of antithesis. Had not the change been so instantaneous, I should have attributed it to his lowered spirits affecting, as in the case of man, the nervous system and circulation, and consequently the tone of his whole muscular frame, and this may have been in part the cause. We will now consider how the principle of antithesis in expression has arisen. With social animals, the power of intercommunication between the members of the same community, and with other species, between the opposite sexes, as well as between the young and the old, is of the highest importance to them. This is generally affected by means of the voice, but it is certain that gestures and expressions are to a certain extent mutually intelligible. Man not only uses inarticulate cries, gestures, and expressions, but has invented articulate language, 
If indeed the word invented can be applied to a process completed by innumerable steps, half consciously made. Any one who has watched monkeys will not doubt that they perfectly understand each other's gestures and expression, and to a large extent, as Renger asserts, those of man. An animal, when going to attack another or when afraid of another, often makes itself appear terrible by erecting its hair. Thus, increasing the apparent bulk of its body by showing its teeth, or brandishing its horns, or by uttering fierce sounds. As the power of intercommunication is certainly of high service to many animals, there is no a priori improbability in the supposition that gestures manifestly of an opposite nature to those by which certain feelings are already expressed should at first have been voluntarily employed under the influence of an opposite state of feeling. The fact of the gestures being now innate would be no valid objection to the belief that they were at first intentional, for if practiced during many generations, they would probably at last be inherited. Nevertheless, it is more than doubtful, as we shall immediately see, whether any of the cases which come under our present head of antithesis have thus originated. With conventional signs which are not innate, such as those used by the deaf and dumb and by savages, the principle of opposition or antithesis has been partially brought into play. The Cistercian monks thought it sinful to speak, and as they could not avoid holding some communication, they invented a gesture language, in which the principle of opposition seems to have been employed. Dr. Scott of the Exeter Deaf and Dumb Institution writes to me that, Opposites are greatly used in teaching the deaf and dumb who have a lively sense of them. Nevertheless, I have been surprised how few unequivocal instances can be adduced. This depends partly on all the signs having commonly had some natural origin, and partly on the practice of the deaf and dumb and of savages to contract their signs as much as possible for the sake of rapidity. Hence their natural source or origin often becomes doubtful or is completely lost, as is likewise the case with articulate language. Many signs, moreover, which plainly stand in opposition to each other, appear to have had on both sides a significant origin. This seems to hold good with the signs used by the deaf and dumb for light and darkness, for strength and weakness. In a future chapter I shall endeavor to show that the opposite gestures of affirmation and negation, namely, vertically nodding and laterally shaking the head, have both probably had a natural beginning. The waving of the hand from right to left, which is used as a negative by some savages, may have been invented in imitation of shaking the head. But whether the opposite movement of waving the hand in a straight line from the face, which is used in affirmation, has arisen through antithesis or in some quite distinct manner, is doubtful. If we now turn to the gestures which are innate or common to all the individuals of the same species, and which come under the present head of antithesis, it is extremely doubtful whether any of them were at first deliberately invented and consciously performed. With mankind, the best instance of a gesture standing in direct opposition to other movements, naturally assumed under an opposite frame of mind, is that of shrugging the shoulders. This expresses impotence or an apology something which cannot be done, or cannot be avoided. The gesture is sometimes used consciously and voluntarily, but it is extremely improbable that it was at first deliberately invented, and afterwards fixed by habit. For not only do young children sometimes shrug their shoulders under the above states of mind, but the movement is accompanied, as will be shown in a future chapter, by various subordinate movements, which not one man in a thousand is aware of, unless he has specially attended to the subject. Dogs, when approaching a strange dog, may find it useful to show by their movements that they are friendly and do not wish to fight. When two young dogs in play are growling and biting each other's faces and legs, it is obvious that they mutually understand each other's gestures and manners. There seems, indeed, some degree of instinctive knowledge in puppies and kittens, that they must not use their sharp little teeth or claws too freely in their play, though this sometimes happens and a squeal is the result. Otherwise, they would often injure each other's eyes. When my terrier bites my hand in play, often snarling at the same time, if he bites too hard and I say, gently, gently, 
He goes on biting, but answers me by a few wags of the tail, which seems to say, never mind, it is all fun. Although dogs do thus express, and may wish to express, to other dogs and to man, that they are in a friendly state of mind, it is incredible that they could ever have deliberately thought of drawing back and depressing their ears, instead of holding them erect, of lowering and wagging their tails, instead of keeping them stiff and upright, because they knew that these movements stood in direct opposition to those assumed under an opposite and savage frame of mind. Again, when a cat, or rather when some early progenitor of this species, from feeling affectionate first slightly arched its back, held its tail perpendicularly upwards and pricked its ears, can it be believed that the animal consciously wished thus to show that its frame of mind was directly the reverse of that, when from being ready to fight or to spring on its prey, it assumed a crouching attitude, curled its tail from side to side and depressed its ears? Even still less can I believe that my dog voluntarily put on his dejected attitude and hothouse face, which formed so complete a contrast to his previous cheerful attitude and whole bearing. It cannot be supposed that he knew that I should understand his expression, and that he could thus soften my heart and make me give up visiting the hothouse. Hence for the development of the movements which come under the present head, some other principle, distinct from the will and consciousness, must have intervened. This principle appears to be that every movement which we have voluntarily performed throughout our lives has required the action of certain muscles. And when we have performed a directly opposite movement, an opposite set of muscles has been habitually brought into play, as in turning to the right or to the left, in pushing away or pulling an object towards us, and in lifting or lowering a weight. So strongly are our intentions and movements associated together that if we eagerly wish an object to move in any direction, we can hardly avoid moving our bodies in the same direction, although we may be perfectly aware that this can have no influence. A good illustration of this fact has already been given in the introduction, namely, in the grotesque movements of a young and eager billiard player, whilst watching the course of his ball, a man or child in a passion, if he tells anyone in a loud voice to be gone, generally moves his arm as if to push him away, although the offender may not be standing near, and although there may be not the least need to explain by a gesture what is meant. On the other hand, if we eagerly desire someone to approach us closely, we act as if pulling him towards us, and so in innumerable other instances." As the performance of ordinary movements of an opposite kind, under opposite impulses of the will, has become habitual in us and in the lower animals, so when actions of one kind have become firmly associated with any sensation or emotion, it appears natural that actions of a directly opposite kind, though of no use, should be unconsciously performed through habit and association, under the influence of a directly opposite sensation or emotion. On this principle alone can I understand how the gestures and expressions which come under the present head of antithesis have originated. If indeed they are serviceable to man or to any other animal, in aid of inarticulate cries or language, they will likewise be voluntarily employed, and the habit will thus be strengthened. But whether or not of service as a means of communication, the tendency to perform opposite movements under opposite sensations or emotions would, if we may judge by analogy, become hereditary through long practice. And there cannot be a doubt that several expressive movements due to the principle of antithesis are inherited. End of section 5. Recording by Casey Carlson, Los Angeles. Section 6 of The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin. Chapter 3 General Principles of Expression Concluded 
The principle of direct action of the excited nervous system on the body, independently of the will and in part of habit. Change of color in the hair. Trembling of the muscles. Modified secretions. Perspiration. Expression of extreme pain. Of rage, great joy, and terror. Contrast between the emotions which cause and do not cause expressive movements. Exciting and depressing states of the mind. Summary. We now come to our third principle, namely that certain actions which we recognize as expressive of certain states of the mind are the direct result of the constitution of the nervous system, and have been from the first independent of the will, and to a large extent of habit. When the sensorium is strongly excited, nerve force is generated in excess, and is transmitted in certain directions dependent on the connection of the nerve cells and, as far as the muscular system is concerned, on the nature of the movements which have been habitually practiced. Or the supply of nerve force may, as it appears, be interrupted. Of course, every movement which we make is determined by the constitution of the nervous system. But actions performed in obedience to the will, or through habit, or through the principle of antithesis, are here as far as possible excluded, our present subject is very obscure, but from its importance must be discussed at some little length, and it is always advisable to perceive clearly our ignorance. The most striking case, though a rare and abnormal one, which can be adduced from the direct influence of the nervous system, when strongly affected on the body, is the loss of color in the hair, which has occasionally been observed after extreme terror or grief. One authentic instance has been recorded in the case of a man brought out for execution in India, in which the change of color was so rapid that it was perceptible to the eye. Another good case is that of the trembling of the muscles, which is common to man and to many or most of the lower animals. Trembling is of no service, often of much disservice, and cannot have been at first required through the will, and then rendered habitual in association with any emotion. I am assured by an eminent authority that young children do not tremble, but go into convulsions under the circumstances which would induce expressive trembling in adults. Trembling is excited in different individuals in very different degrees and by the most diversified causes, by cold to the surface, before fever fits, although the temperature of the body is then above the normal standard, in blood poisoning, delirium tremens, and other diseases, by general failure of power in old age, by exhaustion after excessive fatigue, locally from severe injuries such as burns, and, in an especial manner, by the passage of a catheter. Of all emotions, fear notoriously is the most apt to induce trembling but so do occasionally great anger and joy. I remember once seeing a boy who just shot his first snipe on the wing, and his hands trembled to such a degree from delight that he could not for some time reload his gun. And I have heard of an exactly similar case with an Australian savage, to whom a gun had been lent. Fine music from the vague emotions thus excited causes a shiver to run down the backs of some persons. There seems to be very little in common in the above several physical causes and emotions to account for trembling. And Sir J. Paget, to whom I am indebted for several of the above statements, informs me that the subject is a very obscure one. As trembling is sometimes caused by rage, long before exhaustion can have set in, and as it sometimes accompanies great joy, it would appear that any strong excitement of the nervous system interrupts the steady flow of nerve force to the muscles. The manner in which the secretions of the alimentary canal and of certain glands, as the liver, kidneys, or mammae, are affected by strong emotions, is another excellent instance of the direct action of the sensorium on these organs, independently of the will or of any serviceable associated habit. There is the greatest difference in different persons in the parts which are thus affected, and in the degree of their affection. The heart, which goes on uninterruptedly, beating night and day in so wonderful a manner, 
is extremely sensitive to external stimulants. The great physiologist Claude Bernard has shown how the least excitement of a sensitive nerve reacts on the heart, even when a nerve is touched so slightly that no pain can possibly be felt by the animal under experiment. Hence, when the mind is strongly excited, we might expect that it would instantly affect, in a direct manner, the heart, and this is universally acknowledged and felt to be the case. Claude Bernard also repeatedly insists, and this deserves special notice, that when the heart is affected it reacts on the brain, and the state of the brain again reacts through the pneumogastric nerve on the heart, so that under any excitement there will be much mutual action and reaction between these, the two most important organs of the body. The vasomotor system, which regulates the diameter of the small arteries, is directly acted on by the sensorium, as we see when a man blushes from shame. But in this latter case, the checked transmission of nerve force to the vessels of the face can, I think, be partly explained in a curious manner through habit. We shall also be able to throw some light, though very little, on the involuntary erection of the hair under the emotions of terror and rage. The secretion of tears depends, no doubt, on the connection of certain nerve cells. But here again we can trace some few of the steps by which the flow of nerve force through the requisite channels, has become habitual under certain emotions. A brief consideration of the outward signs of some of the stronger sensations and emotions will best serve to show us, although vaguely, in how complex a manner the principle under consideration of the direct action of the excited nervous system of the body is combined with the principle of habitually associated serviceable movements. When animals suffer from an agony of pain, they generally writhe about with frightful contortions, and those which habitually use their voices utter piercing cries or groans. Almost every muscle of the body is brought into strong action. With man the mouth may be closely compressed, or more commonly the lips are retracted, with the teeth clenched or ground together. There is said to be gnashing of teeth in hell and I have plainly heard the grinding of the molar teeth of a cow which was suffering acutely from inflammation of the bowels. The female hippopotamus in the zoological gardens, when she produced her young, suffered greatly. She incessantly walked about or rolled on her sides, opening and closing her jaws, and clattering her teeth together. With man the eyes stare wildly as in horrified astonishment, or the brows are heavily contracted. Perspiration bathes the body, and drops trickle down the face. The circulation and respiration are much affected. Hence the nostrils are generally dilated and often quiver. Or the breath may be held until the blood stagnates in the purple face. If the agony be severe and prolonged, these signs all change. Utter prostration follows, with fainting or convulsions. A sensitive nerve, when irritated, transmits some influence to the nerve cell, whence it proceeds, and this transmits its influence first to the corresponding nerve cell on the opposite side of the body, and then upwards and downwards along the cerebrospinal column to other nerve cells, to a greater or lesser extent, according to the strength of the excitement, so that ultimately the whole nervous system may be affected. This involuntary transmission of nerve force may or may not be accompanied by consciousness. Why the irritation of a nerve cell should generate or liberate nerve force is not known, but that this is the case seems to be the conclusion arrived at by all the greatest physiologists, such as Muller, Virchow, Bernard, etc. As Mr. Herbert Spencer remarks, it may be received as in, quote, unquestionable truth that at any moment the existing quantity of liberated nerve force, which in an inscrutable way produces in us the state we call feeling, must expend itself in some direction, must generate an equivalent manifestation of force somewhere, end quote. so that when the cerebrospinal system is highly excited and nerve force is liberated in excess, it may be expended in intense sensations, 
active thought, violent movements, or increased activity of the glands. Mr. Spencer further maintains that an, quote, overflow of nerve force, undirected by any motive, will manifestly take the most habitual roots, and if these do not suffice, will next overflow into the less habitual ones, end quote. Consequently, the facial and respiratory muscles, which are the most used, will be apt to be first brought into action, then those of the upper extremities, next those of the lower, and finally those of the whole body. An emotion may be very strong, but it will have little tendency to induce movements of any kind, if it has not commonly led to voluntary action for its relief or gratification. And when movements are excited, their nature is, to a large extent, determined by those which have often and voluntarily been performed for some definite end under the same emotion. Great pain urges all animals, and has urged them during endless generations, to make the most violent and diversified efforts to escape from the cause of suffering. Even when a limb or other separate part of the body is hurt, we often see a tendency to shake it, as if to shake off the cause, though this may obviously be impossible. Thus, a habit of exerting with the utmost force all the muscles will have been established whenever great suffering is experienced. As the muscles of the chest and vocal organs are habitually used, these will be particularly liable to be acted on, and loud, harsh screams or cries will be uttered. But the advantage derived from outcries has here probably come into play in an important manner, for the young of most animals, when in distress or danger, call loudly to their parents for aid as do the members of the same community for mutual aid. Another principle, namely the internal consciousness that the power or capacity of the nervous system is limited, will have strengthened, though in a subordinate degree, the tendency to violent action under extreme suffering. A man cannot think deeply and exert his utmost muscular force. As Hippocrates long ago observed, if two pains are felt at the same time, the severer one dulls the other. Martyrs, in the ecstasy of their religious fervor, have often, as it would appear, been insensible to the most horrid tortures. Sailors who are going to be flogged sometimes take a piece of lead in their mouths, in order to bite it with their utmost force, and thus to bear the pain. Parturient women prepare to exert their muscles to the utmost, in order to relieve their sufferings. We thus see that the undirected radiation of nerve force from the nerve cells which are first affected, the long-continued habit of attempting by struggling to escape from the cause of suffering, and the consciousness that voluntary muscular exertion relieves pain, have all probably concurred in giving a tendency to the most violent, almost convulsive movements under extreme suffering. And such movements, including those of the vocal organs, are universally recognized as highly expressive of this condition. As the mere touching of a sensitive nerve reacts in a direct manner on the heart, severe pain will obviously react on it in like manner, but far more energetically. Nevertheless, even in this case, we must not overlook the indirect effects of habit on the heart, as we shall see when we consider the signs of rage. When a man suffers from an agony of pain, the perspiration often trickles down his face, and I have been assured by a veterinary surgeon that he has frequently seen drops falling from the belly and running down the inside of the thighs of horses and from the bodies of cattle when thus suffering. He has observed this when there has been no struggling which would account for the perspiration. The whole body of the female hippopotamus before alluded to was covered with red-colored perspiration whilst giving birth to her young. So it is with extreme fear. The same veterinary has often seen horses sweating from this cause, as has Mr. Bartlett with the rhinoceros, and with man it is a well-known symptom. The cause of perspiration bursting forth in these cases is quite obscure, but it is thought by some physiologists to be connected with the failing power of the capillary circulation. And we know that the vasomotor system, which regulates the capillary circulation, 
is much influenced by the mind with respect to the movements of certain muscles of the face under great suffering as well as from other emotions these will be best considered when we treat of the special expressions of man and of the lower animals we will now turn to the characteristic symptoms of rage under this powerful emotion the action of the heart is much accelerated or it may be much disturbed the face reddens or it becomes purple from the impeded return of the blood or may turn deadly pale the respiration is labored the chest heaves and the dilated nostrils quiver the whole body often trembles the voice is affected the teeth are clenched or ground together and the muscular system is commonly stimulated to violent almost frantic action but the gestures of a man in this state usually differ from the purposeless writhings and struggles of one suffering from an agony of pain for they represent more or less plainly the act of striking or fighting with an enemy all these signs of rage are probably in large part and some of them appear to be wholly due to the direct action of the excited sensorium but animals of all kinds and their progenitors before them when attacked or threatened by an enemy have exerted their utmost powers in fighting and in defending themselves unless an animal does thus act or has the intention or at least the desire to attack its enemy it cannot properly be said to be enraged an inherited habit of muscular exertion will thus have been gained in association with rage and this will directly or indirectly affect various organs in nearly the same manner as does great bodily suffering the heart no doubt will likewise be affected in a direct manner but it will also in all probability be affected through habit and all the more so from not being under the control of the will we know that any great exertion which we voluntarily make affects the heart through mechanical and other principles which need not be here considered and it was shown in the first chapter that nerve force flows readily through habitually used channels through the nerves of voluntary or involuntary movement and through those of sensation thus even a moderate amount of exertion will tend to act on the heart and on the principle of association of which so many instances have been given we may feel entirely sure that any given sensation or emotion as great pain or rage which has habitually led to much muscular action will immediately influence the flow of nerve force to the heart although there may not be at the time any muscular exertion the heart as i have said will be all the more readily affected through habitual associations as it is not under the control of the will a man when moderately angry or even when enraged may command the movements of his body but he cannot prevent his heart from beating rapidly his chest will perhaps give a few heaves and his nostrils just quiver for the movements of respiration are only in part voluntary in like manner those muscles of the face which are least obedient to the will will sometimes alone betray a slight and passing emotion the glands again are wholly independent of the will and a man suffering from grief may command his features but cannot always prevent the tears from coming into his eyes a hungry man if tempting food is placed before him may not show his hunger by any outward gesture but he cannot check the secretion of saliva under a transport of joy or vivid pleasure there is a strong tendency to various purposeless movements and to the utterance of various sounds we see this in our young children in their loud laughter clapping of hands and jumping for joy in the bounding and barking of a dog when going out to walk with its master and in the frisking of a horse when turned out into an open field joy quickens the circulation and this stimulates the brain which again reacts on the whole body the above purposeless movements and increased heart action may be attributed in chief part to the excited state of the sensorium and to the consequent undirected flow as mr herbert spencer insists of nerve force it deserves notice that 
it is chiefly the anticipation of pleasure and not its actual enjoyment which leads to purposeless and extravagant movements of the body and to the utterance of various sounds we see this in our children when they expect any great pleasure or treat and dogs which have been bounding about at the sight of a plate of food when they get it do not show their delight by any outward action not even by wagging of tails now with animals of all kinds the acquirement of almost all their pleasures with the exception of those of warmth and rest are associated and have long been associated with active movements as in the hunting or search for food and in their courtship moreover the mere exertion of the muscles after long rest or confinement is in itself a pleasure as we ourselves feel and as we see in the play of young animals therefore on this latter principle alone we might perhaps expect that vivid pleasure would be apt to show itself conversely in muscular movements with all or almost all animals even with birds terror causes the body to tremble the skin becomes pale sweat breaks out and the hair bristles the secretions of the alimentary canal and of the kidneys are increased and they are involuntarily voided owing to the relaxation of the sphincter muscles as is known to be the case with man and as i have seen with cattle dogs cats and monkeys the breathing is hurried the heart beats quickly wildly and violently but whether it pumps the blood more efficiently through the body may be doubted or the surface seems bloodless and the strength of the muscles soon fails in a frightened horse i have felt through the saddle the beating of the heart so plainly that i could have counted the beats the mental faculties are much disturbed utter prostration soon follows and even fainting a terrified canary bird has been seen not only to tremble and to turn white about the base of the bill but to faint and i once caught a robin in a room which fainted so completely that for a time i thought it dead most of these symptoms are probably the direct result independently of habit of the disturbed state of the sensorium but it is doubtful whether they ought to be wholly thus accounted for when an animal is alarmed it almost always stands motionless for a moment in order to collect its senses and to ascertain the source of danger and sometimes for the sake of escaping detection but headlong flight soon follows with no husbanding of the strength as in fighting and the animal continues to fly as long as the danger lasts until utter prostration with failing respiration and circulation with all the muscles quivering and profuse sweating renders further flight impossible hence it does not seem improbable that the principle of associated habit may in part account for or at least augment some of the above-named characteristic symptoms of extreme terror that the principle of associated habit has played an important part in causing the movements expressive of the foregoing several strong emotions and sensations we may i think conclude from considering firstly some other strong emotions which do not ordinarily require for their relief or gratification any voluntary movement and secondly the contrast in nature between the so-called exciting and depressing states of the mind no emotion is stronger than maternal love but a mother may feel the deepest love for her helpless infant and yet not show it by any outward sign or only by slight caressing movements with a gentle smile and tender eyes but let any one intentionally injure her infant and see what a change how she starts up with threatening aspect how her eyes sparkle and her face reddens how her bosom heaves nostrils dilate and heart beats for anger and not maternal love has habitually led to action the love between the opposite sexes is widely different from maternal love and when lovers meet we know that their hearts beat quickly their breathing is hurried and their faces flush for this love is not inactive like that of a mother for her infant 
A man may have his mind filled with the blackest hatred or suspicion, or be corroded with envy or jealousy, but as these feelings do not at once lead to action, and as they commonly last for some time, they are not shown by any outward sign, excepting that a man in this state assuredly does not appear cheerful or good-tempered. If indeed these feelings break out into overt acts, rage takes their place, and will be plainly exhibited. Painters can hardly portray suspicion, jealousy, envy, etc., except by the aid of accessories which tell the tale. And poets use such vague and fanciful expressions as, quote, green-eyed jealousy, end quote. Spencer describes suspicion as, quote, foul, ill-favored, and grim, under his eyebrows still askance, end quote, etc., Shakespeare speaks of envy, quote, as lean-faced in her loathsome case, end quote. And in another place he says, quote, no black envy shall make my grave, end quote. And again, as, quote, above pale envy's threatening reach, end quote. Emotions and sensations have often been classed as exciting or depressing. When all the organs of the body and mind, those of voluntary and involuntary movement, of perception, sensation, thought, etc., perform their functions more energetically and rapidly than usual, a man or animal may be said to be excited, and under an opposite state, to be depressed. Anger and joy are from the first exciting emotions and they naturally lead, more especially the former, to energetic movements, which react on the heart and this again on the brain. A physician once remarked to me as proof of the exciting nature of anger that a man, when excessively jaded, will sometimes invent imaginary offenses and put himself into a passion, unconsciously for the sake of reinvigorating himself. And since hearing this remark... I have occasionally recognized its full truth. Several other states of mind appear to be at first exciting, but soon become depressing to an extreme degree. When a mother suddenly loses her child, sometimes she is frantic with grief and must be considered to be in an excited state. She walks wildly about, tears her hair or clothes, and wrings her hands. This latter action is perhaps due to the principle of antithesis, betraying an inward sense of helplessness, and that nothing can be done. The other wild and violent movements may be in part explained by the relief experienced through muscular exertion, and in part by the undirected overflow of nerve force from the excited sensorium. But under the sudden loss of a beloved person, one of the first and commonest thoughts which occurs is that something more might have been done to save the lost one. An excellent observer, in describing the behavior of a girl at the sudden death of her father, says she, quote, went about the house wringing her hands like a creature demented, saying, it was her fault. I should never have left him if I had only sat up with him, end quote. With such ideas vividly present before the mind, they would arise through the principle of associated habit, the strongest tendency to energetic action of some kind. As soon as the sufferer is fully conscious that nothing can be done, despair or deep sorrow takes the place of frantic grief. The sufferer sits motionless, or gently rocks to and fro. The circulation becomes languid, respiration is almost forgotten, and deep sighs are drawn. Pain, if severe, soon induces extreme depression or prostration, but it is at first a stimulant and excites to action as we see when we whip a horse, and as is shown by the horrid tortures inflicted in foreign lands on exhausted dray bullocks, to rouse them to renewed exertion. Fear again is the most depressing of all the emotions, and it soon induces utter helpless prostration as if in consequence of, or in association with, the most violent and prolonged attempts to escape from the danger, though no such attempts have actually been made. Nevertheless, 
Even extreme fear often acts at first as a powerful stimulant. A man or animal driven through terror to desperation is endowed with wonderful strength and is notoriously dangerous in the highest degree. On the whole, we may conclude that the principle of the direct action of the sensorium on the body, due to the constitution of the nervous system and from the first independent of the will, has been highly influential in determining many expressions. Good instances are afforded by the trembling of the muscles, the sweating of the skin, the modified secretions of the alimentary canal and glands, under various emotions and sensations but actions of this kind are often combined with others which follow from our first principle, namely, that actions which have often been of direct or indirect service under certain states of the mind in order to gratify or relieve certain sensations, desires, etc., are still performed under analogous circumstances through mere habit, although of no service. We have combinations of this kind, at least in part, in the frantic gestures of rage and in the writhings of extreme pain, and perhaps in the increased action of the heart and of the respiratory organs. Even when these and other emotions or sensations are aroused in a very feeble manner, there will still be a tendency to similar actions, owing to the force of long-associated habit, and those actions which are least under voluntary control will generally be longest retained. Our second principle of antithesis has likewise occasionally come into play. Finally, so many expressive movements can be explained, as I trust will be seen in the course of this volume, through the three principles which have now been discussed, that we may hope hereafter to see all thus explained, or by closely analogous principles. It is, however, often impossible to decide how much weight ought to be attributed, in each particular case, to one of our principles and how much to another, and very many points in the theory of expression remain. Section 7 of The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin. Chapter 4 means of expression in animals part one the emission of sounds vocal sounds sounds otherwise produced erection of the dermal appendages hair feathers etc under the emotions of anger and terror the drawing back of the ears as a preparation for fighting and as an expression of anger erection of the ears and raising the head a sign of attention in this and the following chapter I will describe, but only in sufficient detail to illustrate my subject, the expressive movements, under different states of the mind, of some few well-known animals. But before considering them in due succession, it will save much useless repetition to discuss certain means of expression common to most of them. The Emission of Sounds with many kinds of animals, man included, the vocal organs are efficient in the highest degree as a means of expression. We have seen in the last chapter that when the sensorium is strongly excited, the muscles of the body are generally thrown into violent action, and as a consequence, local sounds are uttered, however silent the animal may generally be, and although the sounds may be of no use. Hares and rabbits, for instance, never, I believe, use their vocal organs, except in the extremity of suffering, as when a wounded hare is killed by the sportsman, or when a young rabbit is caught by a stoat. Cattle and horses suffer great pain in silence, but when this is excessive, and especially when associated with terror, they utter fearful sounds. 
i have often recognized from a distance on the pampas the agonized death bellow of the cattle when caught by the lasso and hamstrung it is said that horses when attacked by wolves utter loud and peculiar screams of distress involuntary and purposeless contractions of the muscles of the chest and glottis excited in the above manner may have first given rise to the emission of vocal sounds but the voice is now largely used by many animals for various purposes the habit seems to have played an important part in its employment other under circumstances naturalists have remarked i believe with truth that social animals from habitually using their vocal organs as a means of intercommunication use them on other occasions much more freely than other animals but there are marked exceptions to this rule for instance with the rabbit the principle also of association which is so widely extended in its power has likewise played its part hence it follows that the voice from having been habitually employed as a serviceable aid under certain conditions including pleasure pain rage etc is commonly used whenever the same sensations or emotions are excited under quite different conditions or in a lesser degree the sexes of many animals incessantly call to each other during the breeding season and in not a few cases the male endeavors thus to charm or excite the female this indeed seems to have been the primeval use and means of development of the voice as i have attempted to show in my descent of man thus the use of the vocal organs will have become associated with the anticipation of the strongest pleasure which animals are capable of feeling animals which live in society often call to each other when separated and evidently feel much joy at meeting as we shall see with a horse on the return of his companion for whom he has been neighing the mother calls incessantly for her lost young ones for instance a cow for her calf and the young of many animals call for their mothers when a flock of sheep is scattered the ewes bleat incessantly for their lambs and their mutual pleasure at coming together is manifest woe betide the man who meddles with the young of the larger and fiercer quadrupeds if they hear the cry of distress from their young rage leads to the violent exertion of all the muscles including those of the voice and some animals when enraged endeavor to strike terror into their enemies by its power and harshness as the lion does by roaring and the dog by growling i infer that their object is to strike terror because the lion at the same time erects the hair of its mane and the dog the hair along its back and thus they make themselves appear as large and terrible as possible rival males try to excel and challenge each other by their voices and this leads to deadly contests thus the use of the voice will have become associated with the emotion of anger however it may be aroused we have also seen that intense pain like rage leads to violent outcries and the exertion of screaming by itself gives some relief and thus the use of the voice will have become associated with suffering of any kind the cause of widely different sounds being uttered under different emotions and sensations is a very obscure subject nor does the rule always hold good that there is any marked difference for instance with the dog the bark of anger and that of joy do not differ much though they can be distinguished it is not probable that any precise explanation of the cause or source of each particular sound under different states of mind will ever be given we know that some animals after being domesticated have acquired the habit of uttering sounds which were not natural to them thus domestic dogs and even tamed jackals have learned to bark which is a noise not proper to any species of the genus with the exception of the canis iatrans of north america which is said to bark some breeds also of the domestic pigeon have learned to coo in a new and quite peculiar manner the character of the human voice under the influence of various emotions has been discussed by mr herbert spencer in his interesting essay on music he clearly shows that the voice alters much under different conditions in loudness and in quality that is in resonance and timbre in pitch and intervals 
no one can listen to an eloquent orator or preacher or to a man calling angrily to another or to one expressing astonishment without being struck with the truth of mr spencer's remarks it is curious how early in life the modulation of the voice becomes expressive with one of my children under the age of two years i clearly perceived that his humph of assent was rendered by a slight modulation strongly emphatic and that by a peculiar whine his negative expressed obstinate determination mr spencer further shows that emotional speech in all the above respects is intimately related to vocal music and consequently to instrumental music and he attempts to explain the characteristic qualities of both on physiological grounds namely quote, on the general law that a feeling is a stimulus to muscular action end quote. it may be admitted that the voice is affected through this law but the explanation appears to me too general and vague to throw much light on the various differences with the exception of that loudness being ordinary speech and emotional speech or singing this remark holds good whether we believe that the various qualities of the voice originated in speaking under the excitement of strong feelings and that these qualities have subsequently been transferred to vocal music or whether we believe as i maintain that the habit of uttering musical sounds was first developed as a means of courtship in the early progenitors of man and thus became associated with the strongest emotions of which they were capable namely ardent love rivalry and triumph that animals utter musical notes is familiar to every one as we may daily hear in the singing of birds it is a more remarkable fact that an ape one of the gibbons produces an exact octave of musical sounds ascending and descending the scale by half tones so that this monkey alone of brute mammals may be said to sing from this fact and from the analogy of other animals i have been led to infer that the progenitors of man probably uttered musical tones before they acquired the power of articulate speech and that consequently when the voice is used under any strong emotion it tends to assume through the principle of association a musical character we can plainly perceive with some of the lower animals that the males employ their voices to please the females and that they themselves take pleasure in their own vocal utterances but why particular sounds are uttered and why these give pleasure cannot at present be explained that the pitch of the voice bears some relation to certain states of feeling is tolerably clear a person gently complaining of ill-treatment or slightly suffering almost always speaks in a high-pitched voice dogs when a little impatient often make a high piping note through their noses which at once strike us as plaintive but how difficult it is to know whether the sound is essentially plaintive or only appears so in this particular case from our having learnt by experience what it means ringer states that the monkeys cebus azaro which he kept in paraguay expressed astonishment by a half piping half snarling noise anger or impatience by repeating the sound who who in a deeper grunting voice and fright or pain by shrill screams on the other hand with mankind deep groans and high piercing screams equally express an agony of pain laughter may be either high or low so that with adult men as haller long ago remarked the sound partakes of the character of the vowels as pronounced in german o and a whilst the children and women it has more character of e and i and these latter vowel sounds naturally have as helmholtz has shown a higher pitch than the former yet both tones of laughter equally express enjoyment or amusement in considering the mode in which vocal utterances express emotion we are naturally led to inquire into the cause of what is called expression in music upon this point mr litchfield who has long attended to the subject of music has been so kind as to give me the following remarks Quote, the question what is the essence of musical expression involves a number of obscure points 
which so far as i am aware are as yet unresolved enigmas up to a certain point however any law which is found to hold as to the expression of the emotions by simple sounds must apply to the more developed mode of expression in song which may be taken as the primary type of all music a great part of the emotional effect of a song depends on the character of the action by which the sounds are produced in songs for instance which express a great vehemence of passion the effect often chiefly depends on the forcible utterance of some one or two characteristic passages which demand great exertion of vocal force and it will be frequently noticed that a song of this character fails of its proper effect when sung by a voice of sufficient power and range to give the characteristic passages without much exertion this is no doubt the secret of the loss of effect so often produced by the transposition of a song from one key to another the effect is thus seen to depend not merely on the actual sounds but also in part on the nature of the action which produces the sounds indeed it is obvious that whenever we feel the expression of a song to be due to its quickness or slowness of movement to smoothness of flow loudness of utterance and so on we are in fact interpreting the muscular actions which produce sound in the same way in which we interpret muscular action generally but this leaves unexplained the more subtle and more specific effect which we call the musical expression of the song the delight given by its melody or even by the separate sounds which make up the melody this is an effect indefinable in language one which so far as i am aware no one has been able to analyze and which the ingenious speculation of mr herbert spencer as to the origin of music leaves quite unexplained for it is certain that a melodic effect of a series of sounds does not depend in the least on their loudness or softness or on their absolute pitch a tune is always the same tune whether it is sung loudly or softly by a child or a man whether it is played on a flute or on a trombone the purely musical effect of any sound depends on its place in what is technically called a scale the same sound producing absolutely different effects on the ear according as it is heard in connection with one or another series of sounds it is on this relative association of the sounds that all the essentially characteristic effects which are summed up in the phrase musical expression depend but why certain associations of sounds have such and such effects is a problem which yet remains to be solved these effects must indeed in some way or other be connected with the well-known arithmetical relations between the rates of vibration of the sounds which form the musical scale and it is possible but this is merely a suggestion that the greater or less mechanical facility with which the vibrating apparatus of the human larynx passes from one state of vibration to another may have been a primary cause of the greater or lesser pleasure produced by various sequences of sounds but leaving aside these complex questions and confining ourselves to the simpler sounds we can at least see some reasons for the association of certain kinds of sounds with certain states of mind a scream for instance uttered by a young animal or by one of the members of a community as a call for assistance will naturally be loud prolonged and high so as to penetrate to a distance for hemholtz has shown that owing to the shape of the internal cavity of the human ear and its consequent power of resonance high notes produce a particularly strong impression when male animals utter sounds in order to please the females they would naturally employ those which are sweet to the ears of the species and it appears that the same sounds are often pleasing to widely different animals owing to the similarity of their nervous systems as we ourselves perceive in the singing of birds and even in the chirping of certain tree frogs giving us pleasure on the other hand sounds produced in order to strike terror into an enemy would naturally be harsh or displeasing whether the principle of antithesis has come into play with sounds as might perhaps have been expected is doubtful 
the interrupted laughing or tittering sounds made by man and by various kinds of monkeys when pleased are as different as possible from the prolonged screams of these animals when distressed the deep grunt of satisfaction uttered by a pig when pleased with its food is widely different from its harsh scream of pain or terror but with the dog as lately remarked the bark of anger and that of joy are sounds which by no means stand in opposition to each other and so it is in some other cases there is another obscure point namely whether the sounds which are produced under various states of the mind determine the shape of the mouth or whether its shape is not determined by independent causes and the sound thus modified when young infants cry they open their mouths widely and this no doubt is necessary for pouring forth a full volume of sound but the mouth then assumes from a quite distinct cause an almost quadrilateral shape depending as will hereafter be explained on the firm closing of the eyelids and consequent drawing up of the upper lip how far this square shape of the mouth modifies the wailing or crying sound i am not prepared to say but we know from the researches of hemholtz and others that the form of the cavity of the mouth and lips determines the nature and pitch of the vowel sounds which are produced it will also be shown in a future chapter that under the feeling of contempt or disgust there is a tendency from intelligible causes to blow out of the mouth or nostrils and this produces sounds like poo or pish when any one is startled or suddenly astonished there is an instantaneous tendency likewise from an intelligible cause namely to be ready for prolonged exertion to open the mouth widely so as to draw a deep and rapid inspiration when the next full expiration follows the mouth is slightly closed and the lips from causes hereafter to be discussed are somewhat protruded and this form of the mouth if the voice be at all exerted produces according to hemholtz the sound of the vowel o oh. certainly a deep sound of the prolonged o oh, may be heard from a whole crowd of people immediately after witnessing any astonishing spectacle if together with surprise pain be felt there is a tendency to contract all the muscles of the body including those of the face and the lips will then be drawn back and this will perhaps account for the sound becoming higher and assuming the character of ah or ach as fear causes all the muscles of the body to tremble the voice naturally becomes tremulous and at the same time husky from the dryness of the mouth owing to the salivary glands failing to act why the laughter of man and the tittering of monkeys should be a rapidly reiterated sound cannot be explained during the utterance of these sounds the mouth is transversely elongated by the corners being drawn backwards and upwards and of this fact an explanation will be attempted in a future chapter but the whole subject of the differences of the sounds produced under different states of mind is so obscure that i have succeeded in throwing hardly any light on it and the remarks which i have made have but little significance all the sounds hitherto noticed depend on the respiratory organs but sounds produced by wholly different means are likewise expressive rabbits stamp loudly on the ground as a signal to their comrades and if a man knows how to do so properly he may on a quiet evening hear the rabbits answering him all around these animals as well as some others also stamp on the ground when made angry porcupines rattle their quills and vibrate their tails when angered and one behaved in this manner when a live snake was placed in its compartment the quills on the tail are very different from those on the body they are short hollow thin like a goose quill with their ends traversely truncated so that they are open they are supported on long thin elastic footstalks now when the tail is rapidly shaken these hollow quills strike against each other and produce as i heard in the presence of mr bartlett a peculiar continuous sound we can i think understand why porcupines have been provided 
through the modification of their protective spines with this special sound producing instrument they are nocturnal animals and if they scented or heard a prowling beast of prey it would be a great advantage to them in the dark to give warning to their enemy what they were and that they were furnished with dangerous spines they would thus escape being attacked they are as i may add so fully conscious of the power of their weapons that when they are enraged they will charge backwards with their spines erected yet still inclined backwards many birds during their courtship produce diversified sounds by means of specially adapted feathers storks when excited make a loud clattering noise with their beaks some snakes produce a grating or rattling noise many insects stridulate by rubbing together specifically modified parts of their hard integuments this stridulation generally serves as a sexual charm or call but it is likewise used to express different emotions every one who has attended to bees knows that their humming changes when they are angry and this serves as a warning that there is danger of being stung i have made these few remarks because some writers have laid so much stress on the vocal and respiratory organs as having been specially adapted for expression that it was advisable to show that sounds otherwise produced serve equally well for the same purpose erection of the dermal appendages hardly any expressive movement is so general as the involuntary erection of the hairs feathers or other dermal appendages for it is common throughout three of the great vertebrate classes these appendages are erected under the excitement of anger or terror more especially when these emotions are combined or quickly succeed each other the action serves to make the animal appear larger and more frightful to its enemies or rivals and is generally accompanied by various voluntary movements adapted for the same purpose and by the utterance of savage sounds mr bartlett who has had such wide experience with animals of all kinds does not doubt that this is the case but it is a different question whether the power of erection was primarily acquired for this special purpose i will first give a considerable body of facts showing how general this action is with mammals birds and reptiles retaining what i have to say in regard to man for a future chapter mr sutton the intelligent keeper in the zoological gardens carefully observed for me the chimpanzee and orang and he states that when they are suddenly frightened as by a thunderstorm or when they are made angry as by being teased their hair becomes erect i saw a chimpanzee who was alarmed at the sight of a black coal heaver and the hair rose all over his body he made little starts forward as if to attack the man without any real intention of doing so but with the hope as the keeper remarked of frightening him the gorilla when enraged is described by mr ford as having his crest of hair quote, erect and projecting forward his nostrils dilated and his under lip thrown down at the same time uttering his characteristic yell designed it would seem to terrify his antagonists End quote. i saw the hair on the anibis baboon when angered bristling along the back from the neck to the loins but not on the rump or other parts of the body i took a stuffed snake into the monkey house and the hair on several of the species instantly became erect especially on their tails as i particularly noted with the Cereopithecus nictitans brehm states that the midas oedipus belonging to the american division when excited erects its mane in order as he adds to make itself as frightful as possible with the carnivora the erection of the hair seems to be almost universal often accompanied by threatening movements the uncovering of the teeth and the utterance of savage growls in the herpestes i have seen the hair on end over nearly the whole body including the tail and the dorsal crest is erected in a conspicuous manner by the hyena and the protellus the enraged lion erects his mane the bristling of the hair along the neck and back of the dog and over the whole body of the cat especially on the tail is familiar to everyone 
with the cat it apparently occurs only under fear with the dog under anger and fear but not as far as i have observed under abject fear as when the dog is going to be flogged by a severe gamekeeper if however the dog shows fight as sometimes happens up goes his hair i have often noticed that the hair of a dog is particularly liable to rise if he is half angry and half afraid as on beholding some object only indistinctly seen in the dusk i have been assured by a veterinary surgeon that he has often seen the hair erected on horses and cattle on which he had operated and was again going to operate when i showed the stuffed snake to the peccary the hair rose in a wonderful manner along its back and so it does with the boar when enraged an elk which gored a man to death in the united states is described as first brandishing his antlers squealing with rage and stamping on the ground quote, at length his hair was seen to rise and stand on end end quote and then he plunged forward to the attack the hair likewise becomes erect on goats and as i hear from mr blythe on some indian antelopes i have seen it erected on the hairy anteater and on the agouti one of the rodents a female bat which reared her young under confinement when any one looked into the cage quote, erected the fur on her back and bit viciously at intruding fingers end quote birds belonging to all the chief orders ruffle their feathers when angry or frightened every one must have seen two cocks even quite young birds preparing to fight with erected neck hackles nor can these feathers when erected serve as a means of defence for cock fighters have found by experience that it is advantageous to trim them the male ruff machetes pugnax likewise erects its collar of feathers when fighting when a dog approaches a common hen with her chickens she spreads out her wings raises her tail ruffles all her feathers and looking as ferocious as possible dashes at the intruder the tail is not always held in exactly the same position it is sometimes so much erected that the central feathers as in the accompanying drawing almost touch the back swans when angered likewise raise their wings and tail and erect their feathers they open their beaks and make by paddling little rapid starts forwards against any one who approaches the water's edge too closely tropic birds when disturbed on their nests are said not to fly away but quote, merely to stick out their feathers and scream end quote. the barn owl when approached quote, instantly swells out its plumage extends its wings and tail hisses and clacks its mandibles with force and rapidity end quote. so do other kinds of owls hawks as i am informed by mr jenner weir likewise ruffle their feathers and spread out their wings and tail under similar circumstances some kinds of parrots erect their feathers and i have seen this action in the cassowary when angered at the sight of an anteater young cuckoos in the nest raise their feathers open their mouths widely and make themselves as frightful as possible small birds also as i hear from mr weir such as various finches buntings and warblers when angry ruffle all their feathers or only those round the neck or they spread out their wings and tail feathers with the plumage in this state they rush at each other with open beaks and threatening gestures mr weir concludes from his large experience that the erection of the feathers is caused much more by anger than by fear he gives as an instance a hybrid goldfinch of a most irascible disposition which when approached too closely by a servant instantly assumes the appearance of a ball of ruffled feathers he believes that birds when frightened as a general rule closely adpress all their feathers and their consequently diminished size is often astonishing as soon as they recover from their fear or surprise the first thing which they do is shake out their feathers the best instances of this adpression of the feathers and apparent shrinking of the body from fear which mr weir has noticed has been in the quail and grass parakeet 
the habit is intelligible in these birds from their being accustomed when in danger either to squat on the ground or to sit motionless on a branch so as to escape detection though with birds anger may be the chief and commonest cause of the erection of the feathers it is probable that young cuckoos when looked at in the nest and a hen with her chickens when approached by a dog feel at least some terror mr tegetsmeyer informs me that with gamecocks the erection of the feathers on the head has long been recognized in the cockpit as a sign of cowardice the males of some lizards when fighting together during their courtship expand their throat pouches or frills and erect their dorsal crests but dr gunther does not believe that they can erect their separate spines or scales Section 8 of The Expression of Emotions in Man and Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The Expression of Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin. Chapter 4 Means of Expression in Animals. Part 2. We thus see how generally throughout the two higher vertebrate classes, and with some reptiles, the dermal appendages are erected under the influence of anger and fear. The movement is affected, as we know from Collicher's interesting discovery, by the contraction of minute, unstriped, involuntary muscles, often called erectores pili, which are attached to the capsules of the separate hairs, feathers, etc. By the contraction of these muscles, the hairs can be instantly erected, as we see in a dog, being at the same time drawn a little out of their sockets. They are afterwards quickly depressed. The vast number of these minute muscles over the whole body of a hairy quadruped is astonishing. The erection of the hair is, however, aided in some cases, as with that on the head of a man, by the striped and voluntary muscles of the underlying paniculus carnosus. It is by the action of these latter muscles that the hedgehog erects its spines. It appears also from the researches of Leydig and others that striped fibers extend to the panaculus of some of the larger hairs, such as the vibrissae of certain quadrupeds. The erectores pili contract not only under the above emotions, but from the application of cold to the surface. I remember that my mules and dogs brought from a lower and warmer country, after spending a night on the bleak cordillera, had the hairs all over their bodies as erect as under the greatest terror. We see the same action in our own goose skin during the chill before a fever fit. Mr. Lister has also found that tickling a neighboring part of the skin causes the erection and protrusion of the hairs. From these facts it is manifest that the erection of the dermal appendages is a reflex action, independent of the will, and this action must be looked at when occurring under the influence of anger or fear, not as a power acquired for the sake of some advantage, but as an incidental result, at least to a large extent, of the sensorium being affected. The result, in as far as it is incidental, may be compared with the profuse sweating from an agony of pain or terror. Nevertheless, it is remarkable how slight an excitement often suffices to cause the hair to become erect, as when two dogs pretend to fight together in play. We have also seen a large number of animals belonging to widely distinct classes that the erection of the hair or feathers is almost always accompanied by various voluntary movements, by threatening gestures, opening the mouth, uncovering the teeth, spreading out of the wings and tail by birds, and by the utterance of harsh sounds. And the purpose of these voluntary movements is unmistakable. 
therefore it seems hardly credible that the coordinated erection of the dermal appendages by which the animal is made to appear larger and more terrible to its enemies or rivals should be altogether an incidental or purposeless result of the disturbance of the sensorium this seems almost as incredible as that the erection by the hedgehog of its spines or of the quills by the porcupine or of the ornamental plumes by many birds during their courtship should all be purposeless actions we here encounter a great difficulty how can the contraction of the unstriped and involuntary erectories pili have been coordinated with that of various voluntary muscles for the same purpose if we could believe that the erectors primordially had been voluntary muscles and had since lost their stripes and become involuntary the case would be comparatively simple i am not however aware that there is any evidence in favour of this view although the reversed transition would not have presented any great difficulty as the voluntary muscles are in an unstriped condition in the embryos of the higher animals and in the larvae of some crustaceans moreover in the deeper layers of the skin of adult birds the muscular network is according to Leydig, in a transitional condition the fibres exhibiting only indications of traverse striation another explanation seems possible we may admit that originally the erectoris pili were slightly acted on in a direct manner under the influence of rage and terror by the disturbance of the nervous system as is undoubtedly the case with our so-called goose skin before a fever fit animals have been repeatedly excited by rage and terror during many generations and consequently the direct effects of the disturbed nervous system on the dermal appendages will almost certainly have been increased through habit and through the tendency of nerve force to pass readily along accustomed channels we shall find this view of the force of habit strikingly confirmed in a future chapter where it will be shown that the hair of the insane is affected in an extraordinary manner owing to their repeated accesses of fury and terror as soon as with animals the power of erection had thus been strengthened or increased they must often have seen the hairs or feathers erected in rival and enraged males and the bulk of their bodies thus increased in this case it appears possible that they might have wished to make themselves appear larger and more terrible to their enemies by voluntarily assuming a threatening attitude and uttering harsh cries such attitudes and utterances after a time becoming through habit instinctive in this manner actions performed by the contraction of voluntary muscles might have been combined for the same special purpose with those effected by involuntary muscles it is even possible that animals when excited and dimly conscious of some change in the state of their hair might act on it by repeated exertions of their attention and will for we have reason to believe that the will is able to influence in an obscure manner the action of some unstriped or involuntary muscles as in the period of the peristaltic movements of the intestines and in the contraction of the bladder nor must we overlook the part which variation and natural selection may have played for the males which succeeded in making themselves appear the most terrible to their rivals or to their other enemies if not of overwhelming power will on an average have left more offspring to inherit their characteristic qualities whatever these may be and however first acquired than have other males the inflation of the body and other means of exciting fear in an enemy certain amphibians and reptiles which either have no spines to erect or no muscles by which they can be erected enlarge themselves when alarmed or angry by inhaling air this is well known to be the case with toads and frogs the latter animal is made in aesop's fable of the ox and the frog to blow itself up from vanity and envy until it burst this action must have been observed during the most ancient times as according to mr hensley wedgwood the word toad expresses in all the languages of europe the habit of swelling 
it has been observed with some of the exotic species in the zoological gardens and dr gunther believes that it is general throughout the group judging from analogy the primary purpose probably was to make the body appear as large and frightful as possible to an enemy but another and perhaps more important secondary advantage is thus gained when frogs are seized by snakes which are their chief enemies they enlarge themselves wonderfully so that if the snake be of small size as dr gunther informs me it cannot swallow the frog which thus escapes being devoured chameleons and some other lizards inflate themselves when angry thus a species inhabiting oregon the tapia de glassi is slow in its movements and does not bite but has a ferocious aspect when irritated it springs in a most threatening manner at anything pointed at it at the same time opening its mouth wide and hissing audibly after which it inflates its body and shows other marks of anger several kinds of snakes likewise inflate themselves when irritated the puff adder clotho aritans is remarkable in this respect but i believe after carefully watching these animals that they do not act thus for the sake of increasing their apparent bulk but simply for inhaling a large supply of air so as to produce their surprisingly loud harsh and prolonged hissing sound the cobras de capello when irritated enlarge themselves a little and hiss moderately but at the same time they lift their heads aloft and dilate by means of their elongated anterior ribs the skin on each side of the neck into a large flat disc the so-called hood with their widely opened mouths they then assume a terrific aspect the benefit thus derived ought to be considerable in order to compensate for the somewhat lessened rapidity though this is still great with which when dilated they can strike at their enemies or prey on the same principle that a broad thin piece of wood cannot be moved through the air so quickly as a small round stick an innocuous snake the trevidonatus macrophthalamus an inhabitant of india likewise dilates its neck when irritated and consequently is often mistaken for its compatriot the deadly cobra this resemblance perhaps serves as some protection to the trepidonatus another innocuous species the dasypeltis of south africa blows itself out distends its neck hisses and darts at the intruder many other snakes hiss under similar circumstances they also rapidly vibrate their protruded tongues and this may aid in increasing their terrific appearance snakes possess other means of producing sounds besides hissing many years ago i observed in south america that a venomous trigonocephalus when disturbed rapidly vibrated the end of its tail which striking against the dry grass and twigs produced a rattling noise that could be distinctly heard at the distance of six feet the deadly and fierce echis caranata of india produces a curious prolonged almost hissing sound in a very different manner namely by rubbing the sides of the folds of its body against each other whilst the head remains in almost the same position the scales on the sides and not on other parts of the body are strongly keeled with the keels toothed like a saw and as the coiled up animal rubs its sides together these grate against each other lastly we have the well-known case of the rattlesnake he who has merely shaken the rattle of a dead snake can form no just idea of the sound produced by the living animal Professor Schaller states that it is indistinguishable from that made by the male of the large cicada and homopterous insect which inhabits the same district. In the zoological gardens, when the rattlesnakes and puff adders were greatly excited at the same time, I was much struck at the similarity of the sound produced by them, and although that made by the rattlesnake is louder and shriller than the hissing of the puff adder, yet when standing at some yard's distance I could scarcely distinguish the two. For whatever purpose the sound is produced by the one species, I can hardly doubt that it serves for the same purpose in the other species and i conclude from the threatening gestures made at the time by many snakes that their hissing the rattling of the rattlesnake and of the tail of the trigonocephalus 
the grading of the scales of the etches and the dilation of the hood of the cobra all subserve the same end namely to make them appear terrible to their enemies it seems at first a probable conclusion that venomous snakes such as the foregoing from being already so well defended by their poison fangs would never be attacked by any enemy and consequently would have no need to excite additional terror but this is far from being the case for they are largely preyed on in all quarters of the world by many animals it is well known that pigs are employed in the united states to clear districts infested with rattlesnakes which they do most effectually in england the hedgehog attacks and devours the viper in india as i hear from dr jordan several kinds of hawks and at least one mammal the herpestes kill cobras and other venomous species and so it is in south africa Therefore, it is by no means improbable that any sounds or signs by which the venomous species could instantly make themselves recognized as dangerous would be of more service to them than to the innocuous species which would not be able, if attacked, to inflict any real injury. Having said thus much about snakes, I am tempted to add a few remarks on the means by which the rattle of the rattlesnake was probably developed various animals including some lizards either curl or vibrate their tails when excited this is the case with many kinds of snakes in the zoological gardens an innocuous species the coronella sae vibrates its tail so rapidly that it becomes almost invisible the trigonocephalus before alluded to has the same habit and the extremity of its tail is a little enlarged or ends in a bead in the lachesis which is so closely allied to the rattlesnake that it was placed by linnaeus in the same genus the tail ends in a single large lancet-shaped point or scale with some snakes the skin as professor schaller remarks quote, is more imperfectly detached from the region about the tail than at any other parts of the body end quote now if we suppose that the end of the tail of some ancient american species was enlarged and was covered by a single large scale this could hardly have been cast off at the successive molts in this case it would have been permanently retained and at each period of growth as the snake grew larger a new scale larger than the last would have been formed above it and would likewise have been retained the foundation for the development of a rattle would thus have been laid and it would have been habitually used if the species like so many others vibrated its tail whenever it was irritated that the rattle has since been specially developed to serve as an efficient sound producing instrument there can hardly be a doubt for even the vertebra included within the extremity of the tail have been altered in shape and cohere but there is no greater improbability in various structures such as the rattle of the rattlesnake the lateral scales of the etches the neck with the included ribs of the cobra and the whole body of the puff adder having been modified for the sake of warning and frightening away their enemies than in a bird namely the wonderful secretary hawk gypo Gerenus, having had its whole frame modified for the sake of killing snakes with impunity it is highly probable judging from what we have before seen that this bird would ruffle its feathers whenever it attacked a snake and it is certain that the herpestes when it eagerly rushes to attack a snake erects the hair all over its body and especially that on its tail we have also seen that some porcupines when angered or alarmed at the sight of a snake rapidly vibrate their tails thus producing a peculiar sound by the striking together of the hollow quills so that here both the attackers and the attacked endeavor to make themselves as dreadful as possible to each other and both possess for this purpose specialized means which oddly enough are nearly the same in some of these cases finally we can see that if on the one hand those individual snakes which were best able to frighten their enemies escaped best from being devoured and if on the other hand those individuals of the attacking enemy survived in larger numbers which were the best fitted for the dangerous task of killing and devouring venomous snakes then in the one case as in the other 
beneficial variations supposing the characters in question to vary would commonly have been preserved through the survival of the fittest the drawing back and pressure of the ears to the head the ears through their movements are highly expressive in many animals but in some such as man the higher apes and many ruminants they fail in this respect a slight difference in position serves to express in the plainest manner a different state of mind as we may daily see in the dog but we are here concerned only with the ears being drawn closely backward and pressed to the head a savage frame of mind is thus shown but only in the case of those animals which fight with their teeth and the care with which they take to prevent their ears being seized by their antagonists accounts for this position consequently through habit and association whenever they feel slightly savage or pretend in their play to be savage their ears are drawn back that this is the true explanation may be inferred from the relation which exists in very many animals between their manner of fighting and the retraction of their ears all the carnivora fight with their canine teeth and all as far as i have observed draw their ears back when feeling savage this may be continually seen with dogs when fighting in earnest and with puppies fighting in play the movement is different from the falling down and slight drawing back of the ears when a dog feels pleased and is caressed by his master the retraction of the ears may likewise be seen in kittens fighting together in their play and in full-grown cats when really savage as before illustrated in figure nine although their ears are thus to a large extent protected yet they often get much torn in old male cats during their mutual battles the same movement is very striking in tigers leopards etc whilst growling over their food in menageries the lynx has remarkably long ears and their retraction when one of these animals is approached in its cage is very conspicuous and is eminently expressive of its savage disposition even one of the eared seals the ataria pusilla which has very small ears draws them backwards when it makes a savage rush at the legs of its keeper when horses fight together they use their incisors for biting and their forelegs for striking much more than they do their hind legs for kicking backwards this has been observed when stallions have broken loose and have fought together and may likewise be inferred from the kind of wounds which they inflict on each other every one recognizes the vicious appearance which the drawing back of the ears gives to the horse this movement is very different from that of listening to a sound behind if an ill-tempered horse in the stall is inclined to kick backwards his ears are retracted from habit though he has no intention or power to bite but when the horse throws up both hind legs in play as when entering an open field or when just touched by the whip he does not generally depress his ears for he does not then feel vicious guanacos fight savagely with their teeth and they must do so frequently for i found the hides of several which i shot in patagonia deeply scored so do camels and both these animals when savage draw their ears closely backwards guanacos as i have noticed when not intending to bite but merely to spit their offensive saliva from a distance at an intruder retract their ears even the hippopotamus when threatening with its widely open enormous mouth a comrade draws back its small ears just like a horse now what a contrast is presented between the foregoing animals and cattle sheep or goats which never use their teeth in fighting and never draw back their ears when enraged although sheep and goats appear such placid animals the males often join in furious contests as deer form a closely related family and as i do not know that they ever fought with their teeth i was much surprised at the account given by major ross king of the moose deer in canada he says when quote, two males chance to meet laying back their ears and gnashing their teeth together they rush at each other with appalling fury End quote but mr bartlett informs me that some species of deer fight savagely with their teeth so that the drawing back of the ears by the moose accords with our rule 
several kinds of kangaroos kept in the zoological gardens fight by scratching with their forefeet and by kicking with their hind legs but they never bite each other and the keepers have never seen them draw back their ears when angered rabbits fight chiefly by kicking and scratching but they likewise bite each other and i have known one to bite off half the tail of its antagonist at the commencement of their battles they lay back their ears but afterwards as they bound over and kick each other they keep their ears erect or move them much about mr bartlett watched a wild boar quarrelling rather savagely with his sow and both had their mouths opened and their ears drawn backwards but this does not appear to be a common action with domestic pigs when quarrelling boars fight together by striking upwards with their tusks and Mr. Bartlett doubts whether they then draw back their ears. Elephants, which in like manner fight with their tusks, do not retract their ears, but on the contrary erect them when rushing at each other or at an enemy. The rhinoceroses in the zoological gardens fight with their nasal horns, and have never been seen to attempt biting each other except in play, and the keepers are convinced that they do not draw back their ears, like horses and dogs, when feeling savage. The following statement, therefore, by Sir S. Baker, is inexplicable, namely that a rhinoceros which he shot in North Africa, quote, had no ears, they had been bitten off close to the head by another of the same species while fighting, and this mutilation is by no means uncommon. End quote. Lastly, with respect to monkeys, some kinds which have movable ears and which fight with their teeth, for instance the Seriopithecus ruber, draw back their ears when irritated, just like dogs, and they then have a very spiteful appearance. Other kinds, as the Inuus Echodatus, apparently do not thus act. Again, other kinds, and this is a great anomaly in comparison with most other animals, retract their ears, show their teeth, and jabber when they are pleased by being caressed. I observed this in two or three species of Macassus and in the Sinopithecus niger. This expression, owing to our familiarity with dogs, would never be recognized as one of joy or pleasure by those unacquainted with monkeys. Erection of the Ears This movement requires hardly any notice. All animals which have the power of freely moving their ears when they are startled or when they closely observe an object direct their ears to the point towards which they are looking in order to hear any sound from this quarter. At the same time, they generally raise their heads, as all their organs of sense are there situated, and some of the smaller animals rise on their hind legs. Even those kinds which squat on the ground or instantly flee away to avoid danger generally act momentarily in this manner in order to ascertain the source and nature of the danger. The head being raised, with erected ears and eyes directed Section 9 of the Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin. Chapter 5 Special Expressions of Animals, Part 1 the dog i have already described the appearance of a dog approaching another dog with hostile intentions namely with erected ears eyes intently directed forwards hair on the neck and back bristling gait remarkably stiff with the tail upright and rigid so familiar is this appearance to us that an angry man is sometimes said to quote, have his back up unquote. Of the above points, the stiff gait and upright tail alone require further discussion. Sir C. Bell remarks that when a tiger or wolf is struck by its keeper and is suddenly roused to ferocity, every muscle is in tension, and the limbs are in an attitude of strained exertion, prepared to spring. 
This tension of the muscles and consequent stiff gait may be accounted for on the principle of associated habit, for anger has continually led to fierce struggles, and consequently to all the muscles of the body having been violently exerted. There is also reason to suspect that the muscular system requires some short preparation or some degree of innervation before being brought into strong action. My own sensations lead me to this inference, but I cannot discover that it is a conclusion admitted by physiologists. Sir J. Paget, however, informs me that when muscles are suddenly contracted with the greatest force without any preparation, they are liable to be ruptured, as when a man slips unexpectedly, but that this rarely occurs when an action, however violent, is deliberately performed. With respect to the upright position of the tail, it seems to depend, but whether this is really the case I know not, on the elevator muscles being more powerful than the depressors, so that when all the muscles of the hinder part of the body are in a state of tension, the tail is raised. A dog in cheerful spirits and trotting before his master with high elastic steps generally carries his tail aloft, though it is not held nearly so stiffly as when he is angered. A horse, when first turned out into an open field, may be seen to trot along with elastic strides, the head and tail being held high aloft. Even cows, when they frisk about from pleasure, throw up their tails in a ridiculous fashion. So it is with various animals in the zoological gardens. The position of the tail, however, in certain cases, is determined by special circumstances. Thus, as soon as a horse breaks into a gallop, at full speed, he always lowers his tail, so that as little resistance as possible may be offered to the air. When a dog is on the point of springing on his antagonist, he utters a savage growl. The ears are pressed closely backwards, and the upper lip is retracted out of the way of his teeth, especially of his canines. These movements may be observed with dogs and puppies in their play. But if a dog gets really savage in his play, his expression immediately changes. This, however, is simply due to the lips and ears being drawn back with much greater energy. If a dog only snarls at another, the lip is generally retracted on one side alone, namely towards his enemy. The movements of a dog whilst exhibiting affection towards his master were described in our second chapter. These consist in the head and whole body being lowered and thrown into flexuous movements, with the tail extended and wagged from side to side. The ears fall down and are drawn somewhat backwards which causes the eyelids to be elongated and alters the whole appearance of the face. The lips hang loosely, and the hair remains smooth. All these movements or gestures are explicable, as I believe, from their standing in complete antithesis to those naturally assumed by a savage dog under a directly opposite state of mind. When a man merely speaks to, or just notices, his dog, we see the last vestige of these movements in a slight wag of the tail without any other movement of the body, and without even the ears being lowered. Dogs always exhibit their affection by desiring to rub against their masters, and to be rubbed or patted by them. Gratiole explains the above gestures of affection in the following manner, and the reader can judge whether the explanation appears satisfactory. Speaking of animals in general, including the dog, he says, C'est toujours la partie la plus sensible de leur corps qui recherche les caresses ou les dents. Lorsque toute la longueur des flancs et du corps est sensible, l'animal se et rampe sous les caresses, et ses ondulations se propageant les long des muscles analogues des segments jusqu'aux extremis de la colonne vertebrale. Le que se ploie et s'agite. Further on, he adds that dogs, when feeling affectionate, lower their ears in order to exclude all sounds, so that their whole attention may be concentrated on the caresses of their master. Dogs have another and striking way of exhibiting their affection, namely by licking the hands or faces of their masters. They sometimes lick other dogs, and then it is always their chops. I have also seen dogs licking cats with whom they were friends. This habit probably originated in the females carefully licking their puppies, 
the dearest object of their love, for the sake of cleansing them. They also often give their puppies, after a short absence, a few cursory licks, apparently from affection. Thus the habit will have become associated with the emotion of love, however it may afterwards be aroused. It is now so firmly inherited or innate that it is transmitted equally to both sexes. A female terrier of mine lately had her puppies destroyed, and though at all times a very affectionate creature, I was much struck with the manner in which she then tried to satisfy her instinctive maternal love by expending it on me, and her desire to lick my hands rose to an insatiable passion. The same principle probably explains why dogs, when feeling affectionate, like rubbing against their masters or being rubbed or patted by them, for, from the nursing of their puppies, contact with a beloved object has become firmly associated in their minds with the emotion of love. The feeling of affection of a dog towards his master is combined with a strong sense of submission, which is akin to fear. Hence dogs not only lower their bodies and crouch a little as they approach their masters, but sometimes throw themselves on the ground with their bellies upwards. This is a movement as completely opposite as is possible to any show of resistance. I formerly possessed a large dog who was not at all afraid to fight with other dogs, but a wolf-like shepherd dog in the neighborhood, though not ferocious and not so powerful as my dog, had a strange influence over him. When they met on the road, my dog used to run to meet him, with his tail partly tucked in between his legs and hair not erected, and then he would throw himself on the ground, belly upwards. By this action he seemed to say more plainly than by words, Behold, I am your slave. A pleasurable and excited state of mind associated with affection is exhibited by some dogs in a very peculiar manner, namely by grinning. This was noticed long ago by Somerville, who says, And with a courtly grin the fawning bounds salutes thee cowering. His wide opening nose upward he curls, and his large, slow back eyes melt in soft blandishments and humble joy. The Chase, Book One Sir W. Scott's famous Scotch greyhound, Maida, had this habit, and it is common with terriers. I have also seen it in a spitz and in a sheepdog. Mr. Riviere, who has particularly attended to this expression, informs me that it is rarely displayed in a perfect manner, but is quite common in a lesser degree. The upper lip during the act of grinning is retracted, as in snarling, so that the canines are exposed and the ears are drawn backwards, but the general appearance of the animal clearly shows that anger is not felt. Sir C. Bell remarks, quote, Dogs, in their expression of fondness, have a slight aversion of the lips, and grin and sniff amidst their gambols, in a way that resembles laughter. Unquote. Some persons speak of the grin as a smile, but if it had been really a smile, we should see a similar, though more pronounced, movement of the lips and ears when the dogs utter their bark of joy. But this is not the case, although a bark of joy often follows a grin. On the other hand, dogs, when playing with their comrades or masters, almost always pretend to bite each other and they then retract, though not energetically, their lips and ears. Hence I suspect that there is a tendency in some dogs, whenever they feel lively pleasure, combined with affection, to act through habit in association on the same muscles, as in playfully biting each other or their master's hands. I have described in the second chapter the gait and appearance of a dog when cheerful, and the marked antithesis presented by the same animal when dejected and disappointed, with his head, ears, body, tail, and chops drooping, and eyes dull. Under the expectation of any great pleasure, dogs bound and jump about in an extravagant manner, and bark for joy. The tendency to bark under this state of mind is inherited, or runs in the breed. Greyhounds rarely bark. Whilst the spitz dog barks so incessantly on starting for a walk with his master that he becomes a nuisance. An agony of pain is expressed by dogs in nearly the same way as by many other animals, 
namely by howling, writhing, and contortions of the whole body. Attention is shown by the head being raised, with the ears erected, and the eyes intently directed toward the object or quarter under observation. If it be a sound and the source is not known, the head is often turned obliquely from side to side in a most significant manner, apparently in order to judge with more exactness from what point the sound proceeds. But I have seen a dog greatly surprised at a new noise, turning his head to one side through habit, though he clearly perceived the source of the noise. Dogs, as formerly remarked, when their attention is in any way aroused, whilst watching some object or attending to some sound, often lift up one paw, and keep it doubled up, as if to make a slow and stealthy approach. A dog under extreme terror will throw himself down, howl, and void his excretions, but the hair, I believe, does not become erect unless some anger is felt. I have seen a dog much terrified at a band of musicians who were playing loudly outside the house, with every muscle of his body trembling, with his heart palpitating so quickly that the beats could hardly be counted, and panting for breath with widely open mouth, in the same manner as a terrified man does. Yet this dog had not exerted himself. He had only wandered slowly and restlessly about the room, and the day was cold. Even a very slight degree of fear is invariably shown by the tail being tucked in between the legs. This tucking in of the tail is accompanied by the ears being drawn backwards, but they are not pressed closely to the head as in snarling and they are not lowered as when a dog is pleased or affectionate. When two young dogs chase each other in play, the one that runs away always keeps his tail tucked inwards. So it is when a dog, in the highest spirits, careers like a mad creature round and round his master in circles or in figures of eight. He then acts as if another dog were chasing him. This curious kind of play, which must be familiar to everyone who has attended to dogs, is particularly apt to be excited after the animal has been a little startled or frightened, as by his master suddenly jumping out on him in the dusk. In this case, as well as when two young dogs are chasing each other in play, it appears as if the one that runs away was afraid of the other catching him by the tail. But as far as I can find out, Dogs very rarely catch each other in this manner. I asked a gentleman, who had kept foxhounds all his life, and be applied to other experienced sportsmen, whether they had ever seen hounds thus seize a fox. But they never had. It appears that when a dog is chased, or when in danger of being struck behind, or of anything falling on him, in all these cases he wishes to withdraw as quickly as possible his whole hindquarters, and that from some sympathy or connection between the muscles, the tail is then drawn closely inwards. A similarly connected movement between the hindquarters and the tail may be observed in the hyena. Mr. Bartlett informs me that when two of these animals fight together, they are mutually conscious of the wonderful power of each other's jaws, and are extremely cautious. They well know that if one of their legs were seized, the bone would instantly be crushed into atoms. Hence they approach each other kneeling, with their legs turned as much as possible inwards, and with their whole bodies bowed so as not to present any salient point, the tail at the same time being closely tucked in between the legs. In this attitude they approach each other sideways, or even partly backwards. So again with deer, Several of the species, when savage and fighting, tuck in their tails. When one horse in a field tries to bite the hindquarters of another in play, or when a rough boy strikes a donkey from behind, the hindquarters and the tail are drawn in, though it does not appear as if this were done merely to save the tail from being injured. We have also seen the reverse of these movements, for when an animal trots with high elastic steps, the tail is almost always carried aloft. As I have said, when a dog is chased and runs away, he keeps his ears directed backwards, but still open, and this is clearly done for the sake of hearing the footsteps of his pursuer. 
From habit, the ears are often held in the same position, and the tail tucked in, when the danger is obviously in front. I have repeatedly noticed, with a timid terrier of mine, that when she is afraid of some object in front, the nature of which she perfectly knows and does not need to reconnoiter, yet she will for a long time hold her ears and tail in this position, looking the image of discomfort. Discomfort, without any fear, is similarly expressed. Thus, one day I went out of doors, just at the time when this same dog knew that her dinner would be brought. I did not call her, but she wished much to accompany me, and at the same time she wished much for her dinner, and there she stood, first looking one way and then the other, with her tail tucked in and ears drawn back, presenting an unmistakable appearance of perplexed discomfort. Almost all the expressive movements now described, with the exception of the grinning from joy, are innate or instinctive, for they are common to all the individuals, young and old, of all the breeds. Most of them are likewise common to the aboriginal parents of the dog, namely the wolf and jackal, and some of them to other species of the same group. Tamed wolves and jackals, when caressed by their masters, jump about for joy, wag their tails, lower their ears, lick their master's hands, crouch down, and even throw themselves on the ground belly upwards. I have seen a rather fox-like African jackal from the Gaboon depress its ears when caressed. Wolves and jackals, when frightened, certainly tuck in their tails, and a tame jackal has been described as careering round his master in circles and figures of eight, like a dog, with his tail between his legs. It has been stated that foxes, however tame, never display any of the above expressive movements, but this is not strictly accurate. Many years ago I observed in the zoological gardens, and recorded the fact at the time, that a very tame English fox, when caressed by the keeper, wagged its tail, depressed its ears, and then threw itself on the ground belly upwards. The black fox of North America likewise depressed its ears in a slight degree. But I believe that foxes never lick the hands of their masters, and I have been assured that when frightened they never tuck in their tails. If the explanation which I have given of the expression of affection in dogs be admitted, then it would appear that animals which have never been domesticated, namely wolves, jackals, and even foxes, have nevertheless acquired, through the principle of antithesis, certain expressive gestures. For it is not probable that these animals, confined in cages, should have learnt them by imitating dogs. Cats I have already described the actions of a cat when feeling savage and not terrified. She assumes a crouching attitude and occasionally protrudes her forefeet with the claws exerted ready for striking. The tail is extended, being curled or lashed from side to side. The hair is not erected, at least it was not so in the few cases observed by me. The ears are drawn closely backwards and the teeth are shown. Low, savage growls are uttered. We can understand why the attitude assumed by a cat when preparing to fight with another cat, or in any way greatly irritated, is so widely different from that of a dog approaching another dog with hostile intentions. For the cat uses her forefeet for striking, and this renders a crouching position convenient or necessary. She is also much more accustomed than a dog to lie concealed and suddenly spring on her prey. No cause can be assigned with certainty for the tail being lashed or curled from side to side. This habit is common to many other animals, for instance to the puma when prepared to spring, but it is not common to dogs or to foxes, as I infer from Mr. St. John's account of a fox lying in wait and seizing a hare. We have already seen that some kinds of lizards and various snakes, when excited, rapidly vibrate the tips of their tails. It would appear as if, under strong excitement, there existed an uncontrollable desire for movement of some kind, owing to nerve force being freely liberated from the excited sensorium, and that as the tail is left free, 
and as its movement does not disturb the general position of the body, it is curled or lashed about. All the movements of a cat, when feeling affectionate, are in complete antithesis to those just described. She now stands upright, with slightly arched back, tail perpendicularly raised, and ears erected, and she rubs her cheeks and flanks against her master or mistress. The desire to rub something is so strong in cats under this state of mind that they may often be seen rubbing themselves against the legs of chairs or tables or against doorposts. This manner of expressing affection probably originated through association, as in the case of dogs, from the mother nursing and fondling her young, and perhaps from the young themselves loving each other and playing together. Another and very different gesture expressive of pleasure, has already been described, namely the curious manner in which young and even old cats, when pleased, alternately protrude their forefeet with separated toes, as if pushing against and sucking their mother's teats. This habit is so far analogous to that of rubbing against something that both apparently are derived from actions performed during the nursing period. Why cats should show affection by rubbing so much more than do dogs, though the latter delight in contact with their masters, and why cats only occasionally lick the hands of their friends, whilst dogs always do so, I cannot say. Cats cleanse themselves by licking their own coats more regularly than do dogs. On the other hand, their tongues seem less well fitted for the work than the longer and more flexible tongues of dogs. Cats, when terrified, stand at full height, and arch their backs in a well-known and ridiculous fashion. They spit, hiss, or growl. The hair over the whole body, and especially on the tail, becomes erect. In the instances observed by me, the basal part of the tail was held upright, the terminal part being thrown on one side. But sometimes the tail is only a little raised, and is bent almost from the base to one side. The ears are drawn back, and the teeth exposed. When two kittens are playing together, the one often thus tries to frighten the other. From what we have seen in former chapters, all the above points of expression are intelligible, except the extreme arching of the back. I am inclined to believe that, in the same manner as many birds, whilst they ruffle their feathers, spread out their wings and tail, to make themselves look as big as possible, so cats stand upright at their full height, arch their backs, often raise the basal part of the tail, and erect their hair for the same purpose. The lynx, when attacked, is said to arch its back, and is thus figured by Brehm. But the keepers in the zoological gardens have never seen any tendency to this action in the larger feline animals, such as tigers, lions, etc., and these have little cause to be afraid of any other animal. Cats use their voice as much as a means of expression, and they utter, under various emotions and desires, at least six or seven different sounds. The purr of satisfaction, which is made during both inspiration and expiration, is one of the most curious. The puma, cheetah, and ocelot likewise purr, but the tiger, when pleased, quote, emits a peculiar short snuffle, accompanied by the closure of the eyelids, unquote. It is said that the lion, jaguar, and leopard do not purr. Horses Horses, when savage, draw their ears closely back, protrude their heads, and partially uncover their incisor teeth, ready for biting. When inclined to kick behind, they generally, through habit, draw back their ears, and their eyes are turned backwards in a peculiar manner. When pleased, as when some coveted food is brought to them in the stable, they raise and draw in their heads, prick their ears, and look intently towards their friend, often whinny. Impatience is expressed by pawing the ground. The actions of a horse when much startled are highly expressive. One day my horse was much frightened at a drilling machine covered by a tarpaulin and lying on an open field. He raised his head so high that his neck became almost perpendicular, and this he did from habit for the machine lay on a slope below, and could not have been seen with more distinctness through the raising of the head, nor, if any sound had proceeded from it, could the sound have been more distinctly heard. 
His eyes and ears were directed intently forwards, and I could feel through the saddle the palpitations of his heart. With red, dilated nostrils he snorted violently, and whirling round, would have dashed off at full speed had I not prevented him. The distension of the nostrils is not for the sake of scenting the source of danger, for when a horse smells carefully at any object and is not alarmed, he does not dilate his nostrils. Owing to the presence of a valve in the throat, a horse when panting does not breathe through his open mouth, but through his nostrils, and these consequently have become endowed with great powers of expansion. This expansion of the nostrils as well as the snorting and the palpitations of the heart are actions which have become firmly associated during a long series of generations with the emotion of terror, for terror has habitually led the horse Section 10 of The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin Chapter 5 Special Expressions of Animals Continued Part 2 Ruminants Cattle and sheep are remarkable from displaying in so slight a degree their emotions or sensations, excepting that of extreme pain. A bull, when enraged, exhibits his rage only by the manner in which he holds his lowered head, with distended nostrils, and by bellowing. He also often paws the ground, but this pawing seems quite different from that of an impatient horse, for when the soil is loose he throws up clouds of dust. I believe that bulls act in this manner when irritated by flies, for the sake of driving them away. The wilder breeds of sheep and the chamois, when startled, stamp on the ground, and whistle through their noses, and this serves as a danger signal to their comrades. The musk ox of the Arctic regions, when encountered, likewise stamps on the ground. How this stamping action arose I cannot conjecture for from inquiries which I have made it does not appear that any of these animals fight with their forelegs. Some species of deer, when savage, display far more expression than do cattle, sheep, or goats, for, as has already been stated, they draw back their ears, grind their teeth, erect their hair, squeal, stamp on the ground, and brandish their horns. One day in the zoological gardens, the Formosan deer, Cervus sudaxis, approached me in a curious attitude, with his muzzle raised high up, so that the horns were pressed back on his neck, the head being held rather obliquely. From the expression of his eye I felt sure that he was savage. He approached slowly, and as soon as he came close to the iron bars, he did not lower his head to butt at me, but suddenly bent it inwards, and struck his horns with great force against the railings. Mr. Bartlett informs me that some other species of deer place themselves in the similar attitude when enraged. Monkeys The various species and genera of monkeys express their feelings in many different ways, and this fact is interesting, as in some degree bearing on the question whether the so-called races of man should be ranked as distinct species or varieties, for as we shall see in the following chapters, the different races of man express their emotions and sensations with remarkable uniformity throughout the world. Some of the expressive actions of monkeys are interesting in another way, namely from being closely analogous to those of man. As I have had no opportunity of observing any one species of the group under all circumstances, my miscellaneous remarks will be best arranged under different states of the mind. Pleasure, joy, affection. It is not possible to distinguish in monkeys, at least without more experience than I have had, the expression of pleasure or joy from that of affection. Young chimpanzees make a kind of barking noise when pleased by the return of any one to whom they are attached. When this noise, which the keepers call a laugh, is uttered, the lips are protruded, but so they are under various other emotions. Nevertheless, I could perceive that when they were pleased, 
the form of the lips differed a little from that assumed when they were angered. If a young chimpanzee be tickled, and the armpits are particularly sensitive to tickling, as in the case of our children, a more decided chuckling or laughing sound is uttered, though the laughter is sometimes noiseless. The corners of the mouth are then drawn backwards, and this sometimes causes the lower eyelids to be slightly wrinkled. But this wrinkling, which is so characteristic of our own laughter, is more plainly seen in some other monkeys. The teeth in the upper jaw of the chimpanzee are not exposed when they utter their laughing noise, in which respect they differ from us. But their eyes sparkle and grow brighter, as Mr. W. L. Martin, who has particularly attended to their expression, states. Young orangs, when tickled, likewise grin and make a chuckling sound, and Mr. Martin says that their eyes grow brighter. As soon as their laughter ceases, an expression may be detected passing over their faces, which, as Mr. Wallace remarked to me, may be called a smile. I have also noticed something of the same kind with the chimpanzee. Dr. Duchenne, and I cannot quote a better authority, informs me that he kept a very tame monkey in his house for a year, and when he gave it during mealtime some choice delicacy, he observed that the corners of its mouth were slightly raised, thus an expression of satisfaction, partaking of the nature of an incipient smile, and resembling that often seen on the face of man, could be plainly perceived in this animal. The Cebus Azari, when rejoiced at again seeing a beloved person, utters a peculiar twittering, kitcherden, sound. It also expresses agreeable sensations, by drawing back the corners of its mouth, without producing any sound. Renger calls this movement laughter, but it would be more appropriately called a smile. The form of the mouth is different when either pain or terror is expressed, and high shrieks are uttered. Another species of Cebus, in the zoological gardens, C. hypolusis, when pleased, makes a reiterated shrill note, and likewise draws back the corners of its mouth, apparently through the contraction of the same muscles as with us. So does the Barbary ape, Inuus echodatus, to an extraordinary degree, and I observed in this monkey that the skin of the lower eyelids then became much wrinkled. At the same time it rapidly moved its lower jaw or lips in a spasmodic manner, the teeth being exposed. But the noise produced was hardly more distinct than that which we sometimes call silent laughter. Two of the keepers affirmed that this slight sound was the animal's laughter, and when I expressed some doubt on this head, being at the time quite inexperienced, they made it attack or rather threaten a hated Entellus monkey living in the same compartment. Instantly the whole expression of the face of the Innu was changed. The mouth was opened much more widely, the canine teeth were more fully exposed, and a hoarse barking noise was uttered. The Anubis baboon, Cynocephalus anubis, was first insulted and put into a furious rage, as was easily done by his keeper, who then made friends with him and shook hands. As the reconciliation was effected, the baboon rapidly moved up and down his jaws and lips, and looked pleased. When we laugh heartily, a similar movement or quiver may be observed, more or less distinctly in our jaws, but with man the muscles of the chest are more particularly acted on, whilst with this baboon, and with some other monkeys, it is the muscles of the jaws and lips which are spasmodically affected. I have already had occasion to remark on the curious manner in which two or three species of Alacacus and the Sinopithecus niger draw back their ears and utter a slight jabbering noise when they are pleased by being caressed. With the Sinopithecus, the corners of the mouth are at the same time drawn backwards and upwards, so that the teeth are exposed. Hence this expression would never be recognized by a stranger as one of pleasure. The crest of long hairs on the forehead is depressed, and apparently the whole skin of the head drawn backwards. The eyebrows are thus raised a little, and the eyes assume a staring appearance. The lower eyelids also become slightly wrinkled, but this wrinkling is not conspicuous, owing to the permanent transverse furrows on the face. Painful Emotions and Sensations With monkeys, the expression of slight pain, or of any painful emotion, such as grief, vexation, jealousy, etc., is not easily distinguished from that of moderate anger, and these states of mind readily and quickly pass into each other. Grief, however, with some species is certainly exhibited by weeping. 
a woman who sold a monkey to the zoological society believed to have come from borneo macacus morris or m inornatus of gray said that it often cried and mr bartlett as well as the keeper mr sutton have repeatedly seen it when grieved or even when much pitied weeping so copiously that the tears rolled down its cheeks there is however something strange about this case for two specimens subsequently kept in the gardens and believed to be the same species have never been seen to weep though they were carefully observed by the keeper and myself when much distressed and loudly screaming renger states that the eyes of the cebus azari fill with tears but not sufficiently to overflow when it is prevented getting some much desired object or is much frightened humboldt also asserts that the eyes of the calithrix sayurius instantly fill with tears when it is seized with fear but when this pretty little monkey in the zoological gardens was teased so as to cry out loudly this did not occur i do not however wish to throw the least doubt on the accuracy of humboldt's statement the appearance of dejection in young orangs and chimpanzees when out of health is as plain and almost as pathetic as in the case of our children this state of mind and body is shown by their listless movements fallen countenances dull eyes and changed complexion anger this emotion is often exhibited by many kinds of monkeys and is expressed as mr martin remarks in many different ways Quote, some species when irritated pout the lips gaze with a fixed and savage glare on their foe and make repeated short starts as if about to spring forward uttering at the same time inward guttural sounds many display their anger by suddenly advancing making abrupt starts at the same time opening the mouth and pursing up the lips so as to conceal the teeth while the eyes are daringly fixed on the enemy as if in savage defiance some again and principally the long-tailed monkeys or gunons display their teeth and accompany their malicious grins with a sharp abrupt reiterated cry unquote. mr sutton confirms the statement that some species uncover their teeth when enraged whilst others conceal them by the protrusion of their lips and some kinds draw back their ears the cynopithecus niger lately referred to acts in this manner at the same time depressing the crest of hair on its forehead and showing its teeth so that the movements of the features from anger are nearly the same as those from pleasure and the two expressions can be distinguished only by those familiar with the animal baboons often show their passion and threaten their enemies in a very odd manner namely by opening their mouths widely as in the act of yawning mr bartlett has often seen two baboons when first placed in the same compartment sitting opposite to each other and thus alternately opening their mouths and this action seems frequently to end in a real yawn mr bartlett believes that both animals wish to show to each other that they are provided with a formidable set of teeth as is undoubtedly the case as i could hardly credit the reality of this yawning gesture mr bartlett insulted an old baboon and put him into a violent passion and he almost immediately thus acted some species of macacus and Cereopithecus behave in the same manner baboons likewise show their anger as was observed by brehen with those which he kept alive in abyssinia in another manner namely by striking the ground with one hand quote, like an angry man striking the table with his fist unquote. i have seen this movement with the baboons in the zoological gardens but sometimes the action seems rather to represent the searching for a stone or other object in their beds of straw mr sutton has often observed the face of the macacus rhesus when much enraged growing red as he was mentioning this to me another monkey attacked a rhesus and i saw its face redden as plainly as that of a man in a violent passion in the course of a few minutes after the battle the face of this monkey recovered its natural tint at the same time that the face reddened the naked posterior part of the body which is always red seemed to grow still redder but i cannot positively assert that this was the case when the mandrill is in any way excited the brilliantly colored naked parts of the skin are said to become still more vividly colored 
With several species of baboons, the ridge of the forehead projects much over the eyes and is studded with a few long hairs, representing our eyebrows. These animals are always looking about them, and in order to look upwards they raise their eyebrows. They have thus, as it would appear, acquired the habit of frequently moving their eyebrows. However this may be, many kinds of monkeys, especially the baboons, when angered or in any way excited, rapidly and incessantly move their eyebrows up and down, as well as the hairy skin of their foreheads. As we associate, in the case of man, the raising and lowering of the eyebrows with definite states of the mind, the almost incessant movement of the eyebrows by monkeys gives them a senseless expression. I once observed a man who had a trick of continually raising his eyebrows without any corresponding emotion, and this gave to him a foolish appearance. So it is with some persons who keep the corners of their mouths a little drawn backwards and upwards, as if by an incipient smile, though at the time they are not amused or pleased. A young orang, made jealous by her keeper attending to another monkey, slightly uncovered her teeth, and uttering a peevish noise like tish shist turned her back on him. Both orangs and chimpanzees, when a little more angered, protrude their lips greatly and make a harsh barking noise. A young female chimpanzee, in a violent passion, presented a curious resemblance to a child in the same state. She screamed loudly, with widely open mouth, the lips being retracted so that the teeth were fully exposed. She threw her arms wildly about, sometimes clasping them over her head. She rolled on the ground, sometimes on her back, sometimes on her belly, and bit everything within reach. A young gibbon, Hylobatis syndactylus, in a passion has been described as behaving in almost exactly the same manner. The lips of young orangs and chimpanzees are protruded, sometimes to a wonderful degree under various circumstances. They act thus not only when slightly angered, sulky, or disappointed, but when alarmed at anything, in one instance at the sight of a turtle, and likewise when pleased but neither the degree of protrusion nor the shape of the mouth is exactly the same, as I believe, in all cases, and the sounds which are then uttered are different. The accompanying drawing represents a chimpanzee made sulky by an orange having been offered him and then taken away. A similar protrusion or pouting of the lips, though to a much slighter degree, may be seen in sulky children. Many years ago, in the zoological gardens, I placed a looking-glass on the floor before two young orangs, who, as far as it was known, had never before seen one. At first they gazed at their own images with the most steady surprise, and then changed their point of view. They then approached close and protruded their lips toward the image as if to kiss it, in exactly the same manner as they had previously done towards each other, when first placed a few days before in the same room. They next made all sorts of grimaces, and put themselves in various attitudes before the mirror. They pressed and rubbed the surface. They placed their hands at different distances behind it, looked behind it, and finally seemed almost frightened, started a little, became cross, and refused to look any longer. When we try to perform some little action which is difficult and requires precision, for instance to thread a needle, we generally close our lips firmly for the sake, I presume, of not disturbing our movements by breathing, and I noticed the same action in a young orang. The poor little creature was sick, and was amusing itself by trying to kill the flies on the window panes with its knuckles. This was difficult, as the flies buzzed about, and at each attempt the lips were firmly compressed, and at the same time slightly protruded. Although the countenances, and more especially the gestures of orangs and chimpanzees, are in some respects highly expressive, I doubt whether on the whole they are so expressive as those of some other kinds of monkeys. This may be attributed in part to their ears being immovable, and in part to the nakedness of their eyebrows, of which the movements are thus rendered less conspicuous. When, however, they raise their eyebrows, their foreheads become, as with us, transversely wrinkled. In comparison with man, their faces are inexpressive, chiefly owing to their not frowning under any emotion of the mind, 
that is, as far as I have been able to observe, and I carefully attended to this point. Frowning, which is one of the most important of all the expressions in man, is due to the contraction of the corrugators by which the eyebrows are lowered and brought together, so that vertical furrows are formed on the forehead. Both the orang and chimpanzee are said to possess this muscle, but it seems rarely brought into action, at least in a conspicuous manner. I made my hands into a sort of cage, and placing some tempting fruit within, allowed both a young orang and chimpanzee to try their utmost to get it out. But although they grew rather cross, they showed not a trace of a frown, nor was there any frown when they were enraged. Twice I took two chimpanzees from their rather dark room suddenly into bright sunshine, which would certainly have caused us to frown. They blinked and winked their eyes, but only once did I see a very slight frown. On another occasion I tickled the nose of a chimpanzee with a straw, and as it crumpled up its face, slight vertical furrows appeared between the eyebrows. I have never seen a frown on the forehead of the orang. The gorilla, when enraged, is described as erecting its crest of hair, throwing down its under lip, dilating its nostrils, and uttering terrific yells. Messrs. Savage and Wyman state that the scalp can be freely moved backwards and forwards, and that when the animal is excited it is strongly contracted. But I presume that they mean by this latter expression that the scalp is lowered, for they likewise speak of the young chimpanzee, when crying out, as having the eyebrows strongly contracted. The great power of movement in the scalp of the gorilla, of many baboons and other monkeys, deserves notice in relation to the power possessed by some few men, either through reversion or persistence, of voluntarily moving their scalps. Astonishment, Terror A living freshwater turtle was placed at my request in the same compartment in the zoological gardens with many monkeys, and they showed unbounded astonishment, as well as some fear. This was displayed by their remaining motionless, staring intently with widely opened eyes, their eyebrows being often moved up and down. Their faces seemed somewhat lengthened. They occasionally raised themselves on their hind legs to get a better view. They often retreated a few feet, and then turning their heads over one shoulder, again stared intently. It was curious to observe how much less afraid they were of the turtle than of a living snake, which I had formerly placed in their compartment for in the course of a few minutes some of the monkeys ventured to approach and touch the turtle. On the other hand, some of the larger baboons were greatly terrified, and grinned as if on the point of screaming out. When I showed a little dressed-up doll to the Sinopithecus niger, it stood motionless, stared intently with widely opened eyes, and advanced its ears a little forwards. But when the turtle was placed in its compartment, this monkey also moved its lips, in an odd, rapid, jabbering manner, which the keeper declared was meant to conciliate or please the turtle. I was never able clearly to perceive that the eyebrows of the astonished monkeys were kept permanently raised, though they were frequently moved up and down. Attention, which precedes astonishment, is expressed by man by a slight raising of the eyebrows, and Dr. Duchenne informs me that when he gave to the monkey formerly mentioned some quite new article of food, it elevated its eyebrows a little, thus assuming an appearance of close attention. It then took the food in its fingers, and, with lowered or rectilinear eyebrows, scratched, smelt, and examined it, an expression of reflection being thus exhibited. Sometimes it would throw back its head a little, and again, with sudden raised eyebrows, re-examine and finally taste the food. In no case did any monkey keep its mouth open when it was astonished. Mr. Sutton observed for me a young orang and chimpanzee during a considerable length of time, and however much they were astonished, or whilst listening intently to some strange sound, they did not keep their mouths open. This fact is surprising, as with mankind hardly any expression is more general than a widely open mouth under the sense of astonishment. As far as I have been able to observe, monkeys breathe more freely through their nostrils than men do and this may account for their not opening their mouths when they are astonished, 
for as we shall see in a future chapter, man apparently acts in this manner when startled, at first for the sake of quickly drawing in a full inspiration, and afterwards for the sake of breathing as quietly as possible. Terror is expressed by many kinds of monkeys by the utterance of shrill screams, the lips being drawn back so that the teeth are exposed. The hair becomes erect, especially when some anger is likewise felt. Mr. Sutton has distinctly seen the face of the Macacus rhesus grow pale from fear. Monkeys also tremble from fear, and sometimes they void their excretions. I have seen one which, when caught, almost fainted from an excess of terror. Sufficient facts have now been given with respect to the expressions of various animals. It is impossible to agree with Sir C. Bell when he says that, quote, the faces of animals seem chiefly capable of expressing rage and fear, unquote. and again when he says that all their expressions, quote, may be referred, more or less plainly, to their acts of volition or necessary instincts, unquote. He who will look at a dog preparing to attack another dog or a man, and at the same animal when caressing his master, or will watch the countenance of a monkey when insulted and when fondled by his keeper, will be forced to admit that the movements of their features and their gestures are almost as expressive as those of man. Although no explanation can be given of some of the expressions in the lower animals, the greater number are explicable in a Section 11 of The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are on the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jairus Amar The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin Chapter 6 Special Expressions of Man Suffering and Weeping Part 1 The Screaming and Weeping of Infants Forms of Features Age at which Weeping Commences The Effects of Habitual Restraint on Weeping Sobbing Cause of the Contraction of the Muscles Round the Eyes During Screaming Cause of the secretion of tears. In this and the following chapters, the expressions exhibited by man under various states of the mind will be described and explained, as far as lies in my power. My observations will be arranged according to the order which I have found the most convenient, and this will generally lead to opposite emotions and sensations succeeding each other. Suffering of the body and mind. Weeping. I have already described in sufficient detail, in the third chapter, the signs of extreme pain, as shown by screams or groans, with the writhing of the whole body and the teeth clenched or ground together. These signs are often accompanied or followed by profuse sweating, pallor, trembling, other prostration, or faintness. No suffering is greater than that from extreme fear or horror, but here a distinct emotion comes into play, and will be elsewhere considered. Prolonged suffering, especially of the mind, passes into low spirits, grief, dejection, and despair, and these states will be the subject of the following chapter. Here, I shall almost confine myself to weeping or crying, more especially in children. Infants, when suffering even slight pain, moderate hunger or discomfort, other violent and prolonged screams. Whilst thus screaming, their eyes are firmly closed, so that the skin round them is wrinkled, and the forehead contracted into a frown. The mouth is widely opened with the lips retracted 
in a peculiar manner, which causes it to assume a squarish form, the gums or teeth being more or less exposed. The breath is inhaled almost spasmodically. It is easy to observe infants whilst screaming, but I have found photographs made by the instantaneous process the best means for observation, as allowing more deliberation. I have collected twelve, most of them made purposely for me, and they all exhibit the same general characteristics. I have, therefore, had six of them reproduced by the heliotype process. The firm closing of the eyelids and consequent compression of the eyeball, and this is a most important element in various expressions, serves to protect the eyes from becoming too much gorged with blood, as will presently be explained in detail. With respect to the order in which the several muscles contract in firmly compressing the eyes, I am indebted to Dr. Langstaff of Southampton for some observations, which I have since repeated. The best plan for observing the order is to make a person first raise his eyebrows, and this produces transverse wrinkles across the forehead, and then very gradually to contract all the muscles round the elves with as much force as possible. The reader who is unacquainted with the anatomy of the face ought to refer to page 24, and look at the woodcuts 1 to 3. The corrugators of the brow, corrugator supercilii, seem to be the first muscles to contract, and these draw the eyebrows downwards and inwards toward the base of the nose, causing vertical furrows, that is a frown, to appear between the eyebrows. At the same time, they cause the disappearance of the transverse wrinkles across the forehead. The orbicular muscles contract almost simultaneously with the corrugators and produce wrinkles all around the eyes. They appear, however, to be enabled to contract with greater force, as soon as the contraction of the corrugators has given them some support. Lastly, the pyramidal muscles of the nose contract, and these draw the eyebrows and the skin of the forehead still lower down, producing short transverse wrinkles across the base of the nose. For the sake of brevity, these muscles will generally be spoken of as the orbiculars, or as those surrounding the eyes. When these muscles are strongly contracted, those running to the upper lip likewise contract and raise the upper lip. This might have been expected from the manner in which at least one of them, the malaris, is connected with the orbiculars. Anyone who will gradually contract the muscles round his eyes will feel, as he increases the force, that his upper lip and the wings of his nose, which are partly acted on by one of the same muscles, are almost always a little drawn up. If he keeps his mouth firmly shut whilst contracting the muscles round his eyes, and then suddenly relaxes his lips, he will feel that the pressure on his eyes immediately increases. So again, when a person on a bright glaring day wishes to look at a distant object, but is compelled partially to close his eyelids, the upper lip may almost always be observed to be somewhat raised. The mouths of some short-sighted persons, who are forced habitually to reduce the aperture of their eyes, where from the same reason a grinning expression. The raising of the upper lip draws upwards the flesh of the upper parts of the cheeks, and produces a strongly marked fold on each cheek, the nasolabial fold, which runs from near the wings of the nostrils to the corners of the mouth and below them. This fold or furrow may be seen in all the photographs and is very characteristic of the expression of a crying child, though a nearly similar fold is produced in the act of laughing or smiling. 
as the upper lip is much drawn off during the act of screaming, in the manner just explained, the depressor muscles of the angles of the mouth, CK in woodcuts 1 and 2, are strongly contracted in order to keep the mouth widely open, so that a full volume of sound may be poured forth. The actions of these opposed muscles, above and below, tends to give to the mouth an oblong, almost squarish outline, as may be seen in the accompanying photographs. An excellent observer, in describing a baby crying whilst being fed, says, quote, It made its mouth like a square, and to let the porridge run out at all four corners. End quote. I believe, but we shall return to this point in a future chapter, that the depressor muscles of the angles of the mouth are less under the separate control of the will than the adjoining muscles, so that if a young child is only doubtfully inclined to cry, this muscle is generally the first to contract, and is the last to cease contracting. When older children commence crying, the muscles which run to the upper lip are often the first to contract, and this may perhaps be due to older children not having so strong a tendency to scream loudly, and consequently to keep their mouths widely open, so that the above-named depressor muscles are not brought into such strong action. With one of my own infants, from his eighth day and for some time afterwards, I often observed that the first sign of a screaming fit, when it could be observed coming on gradually, was a little frown, owing to the contraction of the corrugators of the brows, the capillaries of the naked head and face becoming at the same time reddened with blood. As soon as the screaming fit actually began, all the muscles round the eyes were strongly contracted and the mouth widely opened in the manlier above described, so that at this early period the features assumed the same form as a more advanced age. Dr. Pydrit lays great stress on the contraction of certain muscles which draw down the nose and narrow the nostrils, as eminently characteristic of a crying expression. The depressors anguli oris as we have just seen, are usually contracted at the same time, and they indirectly tend, according to Dr. Duchenne, to act in the same manner on the nose. With children having bad colds, a similar pinched appearance of the nose may be noticed, which is at least partly due, as remarked to me by Dr. Langstaff, to their constant snuffling and the consequent pressure of the atmosphere on the two sides. The purpose of this contraction of the nostrils by children having bad colds, or whilst crying, seems to be to cheek the downward flow of the mucus and tears, and to prevent these fluids spreading over the upper lip. After a prolonged and severe screaming fit, the scalp, face, and eyes are reddened, owing to the return of the blood from the head having been impeded by the violent expiratory efforts. But the redness of the stimulated eyes is chiefly due to the copious effusion of tears. The various muscles of the face, which have been strongly contracted, still twitch a little, and the upper lip is slightly drawn up or averted, with the corners of the mouth still a little drawn downwards. I have myself felt, and have observed in other grown-up persons, that when tears are restrained with difficulty, as in reading a pathetic story, it is almost impossible to prevent the various muscles with which young children are brought into strong action during their screaming fits, from slightly twitching or trembling. Infants whilst young do not shed tears or weep, as is well known to nurses and medical men. 
This circumstance is not exclusively due to the lacrimal glands being as yet incapable of secreting tears. I first noticed this fact from having accidentally brushed with the cuff of my coat the open eye of one of my infants, when seventy-seven days old, causing his eye to water freely, and though the child screamed violently, the other eye remained dry, or was only slightly suffused with tears. A similar slight effusion occurred ten days previously in both eyes during a screaming fit. The tears did not run over the eyelids and roll down the cheeks of this child, whilst screaming badly, when 122 days old. This first happened 17 days later, at the age of 139 days. A few other children had been observed for me, and the period of free weeping appears to be very variable. In one case, the eyes became slightly suffused at the age of only 20 days, in another at 62 days. With two other children, the tears did not run down the face at the ages of 84 and 110 days. But in a third child, they did run down at the age of 104 days. In one instance, as I was positively assured, tears ran down at the unusually early age of 42 days. It would appear as if the lacrimal glands required some practice in the individual before they are easily excited into action, in somewhat the same manner as various inherited consensual movements and tastes require some exercise before they are fixed and perfected. This is all the more likely with a habit like weeping, which must have been acquired since the period when man branched off from the common progenitor of the genus Homo and of the non-weeping anthropomorphous apes. The fact of tears not being shed at a very early age from pain or any mental emotion is remarkable, as, later in life, no expression is more general or more strongly marked than weeping. When the habit has once been acquired by an infant, it expresses in the clearest manner suffering of all kinds, both bodily pain and mental distress, even though accompanied by other emotions, such as fear or rage. The character of the crying, however, changes at a very early age as I noticed in my own infants, the passionate cry differing from that of grief. A lady informs me that her child, nine months old, when in a passion, screams loudly, but does not weep. Tears, however, are shed when she is punished by her chair being turned with its back to the table. This difference may perhaps be attributed to weeping being restrained, as we shall immediately see, at a more advanced age, under most circumstances excepting grief, and to the influence of such restraint being transmitted to an earlier period of life than that at which it was first practiced. With adults, especially of the male sex, weeping soon ceases to be caused by, or to express, bodily pain. This may be accounted for by its being thought weak and unmanly by men, both of civilized and barbarous races, to exhibit bodily pain by any outward sign. With this exception, savages weep copiously from very slight causes, of which fact Sir J. Lubbock has collected instances. A New Zealand chief, quote, cried like a child because the sailor spoilt his favorite cloak by powdering it with flour, end quote. I saw in Tierra del Fuego a native who had lately lost a brother and who had alternately cried with hysterical violence and laughed heartily at anything which amused him. 
with the civilized nations of Europe, there is also much difference in the frequency of weeping. Englishmen rarely cry, except under the pressure of the acutest grief, whereas in some parts of the continent the men shed tears much more readily and freely. The insane notoriously give way to all their emotions with little or no restraint, and I am informed by Dr. J. Crichton Brown that nothing is more characteristic of simple melancholia, even in the male sex, than a tendency to weep on the slightest occasions, or from no cause. They also weep disproportionately on the occurrence of any real cause of grief. The length of time during which some patients weep is astonishing, as well as the amount of tears which they shed. One melancholic girl wept for a whole day, and afterwards confessed to Dr. Brown that it was because she remembered that she had once shaved off her eyebrows to promote their growth. Many patients in the asylum sit for a long time, rocking themselves backwards and forwards, quote, and if spoken to, they stop their movements, purse up their eyes, depress the corners of the mouth, and burst out crying, End quote. In some of these cases, being spoken to or kindly greeted appears to suggest some fanciful and sorrowful notion, but in other cases, an effort of any kind excites weeping, independently of any sorrowful idea. Patients suffering from acute mania likewise have paroxysms of violent crying or blubbering in the midst of their incoherent ravings. We must not, however, lay too much stress on the copious shedding of tears by the insane as being due to the lack of all restraint. For certain brain diseases, as hemiplegia, brain wasting, and senile decay, have a special tendency to induce weeping. Weeping is common in the insane, even after a complete state of fatuity has been reached, and the power of speech lost. Persons born idiotic likewise weep, but it is said that this is not the case with Cretans. Weeping seems to be the primary and natural expression, as we see in children, of suffering of any kind, whether bodily pain short of extreme agony or mental distress. But the foregoing facts and common experience show us that a frequently repeated effort to restrain weeping in association with certain states of the mind does much in checking the habit. On the other hand, it appears that the power of weeping can be increased through habit. Thus the Reverend R. Taylor, who long resided in New Zealand, asserts that the women can voluntarily shed tears in abundance. They meet for this purpose to mourn for the dead, and they take pride in crying, quote, in the most affecting manner, end quote. A single effort of repression brought to bear on the lacrimal glands does little, and indeed seems often to lead to an opposite result. An old and experienced physician told me that he had always found that the only means to check the occasional bitter weeping of ladies who consulted him, and who themselves wished to desist, was earnestly to beg them not to try, and to assure them that nothing would relieve them so much as prolonged and copious crying. The screaming of infants consists of prolonged expirations, with short and rapid, almost spasmodic inspirations, followed at a somewhat more advanced age by sobbing. According to Gradiole, the glottis is chiefly affected during the act of sobbing. This sound is heard Quote, at the moment when the inspiration conquers the resistance of the glottis, and the air rushes into the chest. End quote. But the whole act of respiration is likewise spasmodic and violent. 
the shoulders are at the same time generally raised, as by this movement respiration is rendered easier. With one of my infants, when seventy-seven days old, the inspirations were so rapid and strong that they approached in character to sobbing. When one hundred and thirty-eight days old, I first noticed distinct sobbing, which subsequently followed every bad crying fit. The respiratory movements are partly voluntary and partly involuntary, and I apprehend that sobbing is at least in part due to children having some power to command after early infancy their vocal organs and to stop their screams. But from having less power over their respiratory muscles, these continue for a time to act in an involuntary or spasmodic manner, as having been brought into violent action. Sobbing seems to be peculiar to the human species, for the keepers in the zoological gardens assure me that they have never heard a sob from any kind of monkey, though monkeys often scream loudly whilst being chased and caught and then pant for a long time. We thus see that there is a close analogy between sobbing and the free shedding of tears, for with children, sobbing does not commence during early infancy, but afterwards comes on rather suddenly and then follows every bad crying fit, until the habit is checked with advancing years. On the cause of the contraction of the muscles round the eyes during screaming. We have seen that infants and young children, whilst screaming, invariably close their eyes firmly by the contraction of the surrounding muscles so that the skin becomes wrinkled all around. With older children, and even with adults, whenever there is violent and unrestrained crying, a tendency to the contraction of these same muscles may be observed, though this is often checked in order not to interfere with vision. Sir C. Bell explains this action in the following manner, quote, During every violent act of expiration, whether in hearty laughter, weeping, coughing, or sneezing, the eyeball is firmly compressed by the fibers of the orbicularis, and this is a provision for supporting and defending the vascular system of the interior of the eye from a retrograde impulse communicated to the blood in the veins at the same time. When we contract the chest and expel the air, there is a retardation of the blood in the veins of the neck and head, and in the more powerful acts of expulsion, the blood not only distends the vessels, but is even regurgitated into the minute branches. Were the eye not properly compressed at that time, and a resistance given to the shock, irreparable injury might be inflicted on the delicate textures of the interior of the eye. End quote. He further adds, quote, If we separate the eyelids of a child to examine the eye, while it cries and struggles with passion, by taking off the natural support to the vacular system of the eye, and means of guarding it against the rush of blood then occurring, the conjunctiva becomes suddenly filled with blood, and the eyelids averted. End quote. Not only are the muscles round the eye strongly contracted, as Sir C. Bell states, and as I have often observed, during screaming, loud laughter, coughing and sneezing, but during several other analogous actions. A man contracts these muscles when he violently blows his nose. I asked one of my boys to shout as loudly as he possibly could, and as soon as he began, he firmly contracted his orbicular muscles. I observed this repeatedly, and on asking him why he had every time so firmly closed his eyes, I found that he was quite unaware of the fact. He had acted instinctively or unconsciously. It is not necessary, in order to lead to the contraction of these muscles, 
that the air should actually be expelled from the chest. It suffices that the muscles of the chest and abdomen should contract with great force, whilst by the closure of the glottis no air escapes. In violent vomiting or retching, the diaphragm is made to descend by the chest being filled with air. It is then held in this position by the closure of the glottis, quote, as well as by the contraction of its own fibers. End quote. The abdominal muscles now contract strongly upon the stomach, its proper muscles likewise contracting, and the contents are thus ejected. During each effort of vomiting, quote, the head becomes greatly congested, so that the features are red and swollen, and the large veins of the face and temples visibly dilated. End quote. At the same time, as I know from observation, the muscles round the eyes are strongly contracted. This is likewise the case when the abdominal muscles act downwards with unusual force in expelling the contents of the intestinal canal. The greatest exertion of the muscles of the body, if those of the chest are not brought into action in expelling or compressing the air within the lungs, does not lead to the contraction of the muscles round the eyes. I have observed my sons using great force in gymnastic exercises, as in repeatedly raising their suspended bodies by their arms alone, and in lifting heavy weights from the ground, but there was hardly any trace of contraction in the muscles round the eyes. As the contraction of these muscles for the protection of the eyes during violent expiration is indirectly as we shall hereafter see, a fundamental element in several of our most important expressions. I was extremely anxious to ascertain how far Sir C. Bell's view could be substantiated. Professor Donders, of Utrecht, well known as one of the highest authorities in Europe on vision and on the structure of the eye, has most kindly undertaken for me this investigation with the aid of the many ingenious mechanisms of modern science, and has published the results. He shows that during violent expiration the external, the intraocular, and the retroocular vessels of the eye are all affected in two ways, namely by the increased pressure of the blood in the arteries, and by the return of the blood in the veins being impeded. It is, therefore, certain that both the arteries and the veins of the eye are more or less distended during violent expiration. The evidence in detail may be found in Professor Donder's valuable memoir. We see the effects on the veins of the head, in their prominence, and in the purple color of the face of a man who coughs violently from being half-choked. I may mention, on the same authority, that the whole eye certainly advances a little during each violent expiration. This is due to the dilatation of the retroocular vessels, and might have been expected from the intimate connection of the eye and the brain, the brain being known to rise and fall with each respiration when the portion of the skull has been removed and as may be seen along the unclosed sutures of infants' heads. This also, I presume, is the reason that the eyes of a strangled man appear as if they are starting from their sockets. With respect to the protection of the eye during violent expiratory efforts by the pressure of the eyelids, Professor Donders concludes from his various observations that this action certainly limits or entirely removes the dilatation of the vessels. At such times, he adds, we not unfrequently see the hand involuntarily laid upon the eyelids, as if the better to support and defend the eyeball. Nevertheless, much evidence cannot at present be advanced to prove that the eye actually suffers injury 
from the want of support during violent expiration, but there is some. It is, quote, a fact that forcible expiratory effort in violent coughing or vomiting, and especially in sneezing, sometimes give rise to ruptures of the little external vessels, end quote, of the eye. With respect to the internal vessels, Dr. Gunning has lately recorded a case of exothalamus in consequence of whooping cough, which in his opinion depended on the rupture of the deeper vessels, and another analogous case has been recorded. But a mere sense of discomfort would probably suffice to lead to the associated habit of protecting the eyeball by the contraction of the surrounding muscles. Even the expectation or chance of injury would probably be sufficient, in the same manner as an object moving too near the eye induces involuntary winking of the eyelids. We may, therefore, safely conclude from Sir C. Bell's observations, and more especially from the more careful investigations by Professor Donders, that the firm closure of the eyelids during the screaming of children is an action full of meaning and of real service. We have already seen that the contraction of the orbicular muscles leads to the drawing up of the upper lip, and consequently, if the mouth is kept widely open, to the drawing down of the corners by the contraction of the depressor muscles. The formation of the nasolabial fold on the cheeks likewise follows from the drawing up of the upper lip. Thus all the chief expressive movements of the face during crying apparently result from the contraction of the muscles round the eyes. We shall also find that the shedding of tears depends on, or at least stands in some connection with, the contraction of these same muscles. In some of the foregoing cases, especially in those of sneezing and coughing, it is possible that the contraction of the orbicular muscles may serve in addition to protect the eyes from too severe a jar or vibration. I think so, because dogs and cats, in crunching hard bones, always close their eyelids, and at least sometimes in sneezing, though dogs do not do so whilst barking loudly. Mr. Sutton carefully observed for me a young orangutan and chimpanzee, and he found that both always closed their eyes in sneezing and coughing, but not whilst screaming violently. I give a small pinch of snuff to a monkey of the American division, namely a cebus, and it closed its eyelids whilst sneezing, but not on a subsequent occasion whilst uttering loud cries. Section 12 of The Expression of the Emotions in Men and Animals This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Expression of the Emotions in Men and Animals by Charles Darwin Chapter 6 Special Expressions of Man Suffering and Weeping Part 2 Cause of the Secretion of Tears It is an important fact which must be considered in any theory of the secretion of tears from the mind being affected, that whenever the muscles round the eyes are strongly and involuntarily contracted in order to compress the blood vessels, and thus to protect the eyes, tears are secreted, often in sufficient abundance to roll down the cheeks. This occurs under the most opposite emotions, and under no emotion at all. The sole exception, and this is only a partial one, to the existence of a relation between the involuntary and strong contraction of these muscles 
and the secretion of tears is that of young infants who, whilst screaming violently with their eyelids firmly closed, do not commonly weep until they have attained the age of from two to three or four months. Their eyes, however, become suffused with tears at a much earlier age. It would appear, as already remarked, that the lacrimal glands do not, from the want of practice or some other cause, come to full functional activity at a very early period of life. With children at a somewhat later age, crying out or wailing from any distress is so regularly accompanied by the shedding of tears that weeping and crying are synonymous terms. Under the opposite emotion of great joy or amusement, as long as laughter is moderate, there is hardly any contraction of the muscles round the eyes, so that there is no frowning. But when peals of loud laughter are uttered, with the rapid and violent spasmodic expirations, tears stream down the face. I have more than once noticed the face of a person, after a paroxysm of violent laughter, and I could see that the orbicular muscles and those running to the upper lip were still partially contracted, which together with the tear-stained cheeks gave to the upper half of the face an expression not to be distinguished from that of a child still blubbering from grief. The fact of tears streaming down the face during violent laughter is common to all the races of mankind, as we shall see in a future chapter. In violent coughing, especially when a person is half-choked, the face becomes purple, the veins distended, the orbicular muscles strongly contracted, and tears run down the cheeks. Even after a fit of ordinary coughing, almost everyone has to wipe his eyes. In violent vomiting or retching, as I have myself experienced and seen in others, the orbicular muscles are strongly contracted, and tears sometimes flow freely down the cheeks. It has been suggested to me that this may be due to irritating matter being injected into the nostrils and causing by reflex action the secretion of tears. Accordingly, I asked one of my informants, a surgeon, to attend to the effects of retching when nothing was thrown up from the stomach, and, by an odd coincidence, he himself suffered the next morning from an attack of retching, and three days subsequently observed a lady under a similar attack and he is certain that in neither case an atom of matter was ejected from the stomach, yet the orbicular muscles were strongly contracted, and tears freely secreted. I can also speak positively to the energetic contraction of these same muscles round the eyes, and to the coincident free secretion of tears. When the abdominal muscles act with unusual force, in a downward direction on the intestinal canal. Yawning commences with a deep inspiration, followed by a long and forcible expiration, and at the same time almost all the muscles of the body are strongly contracted, including those round the eyes. During this act tears are often secreted, and I have seen them even rolling down the cheeks. I have frequently observed that when persons scratch some point which itches intolerably, they forcibly close their eyelids, but they do not, as I believe, first draw a deep breath and then expel it with force, and I have never noticed that the eyes then become filled with tears, but I am not prepared to assert that this does not occur. The forcible closure of the eyelids is, perhaps, merely a part of that general action by which almost all the muscles of the body are at the same time 
rendered rigid. It is quite different from the gentle closure of the eyes which often accompanies, as Gradiole remarks, the smelling a delicious odor, or the tasting a delicious morsel, and which probably originates in the desire to shut out any disturbing impressions through the eyes. Professor Donders writes to me to the following effect, Quote, I have observed some cases of a very curious affection when, after a slight rub, a tushaman. For example, from the friction of a coat, which caused neither a wound nor a contusion, spasms of the orbicular muscles occurred, with a very profuse flow of tears, lasting about one hour. Subsequently, Sometimes after an interval of several weeks, violent spasms of the same muscles reoccurred, accompanied by the secretion of tears, together with primary or secondary redness of the eye. End quote. Mr. Bowman informs me that he has occasionally observed closely analogous cases, and that, in some of these, there was no redness or inflammation of the eyes. I was anxious to ascertain whether there existed in any of the lower animals a similar relation between the contraction of the orbicular muscles during violent expiration and the secretion of tears. But there are very few animals which contract these muscles in a prolonged manner, or which shed tears. The Macacus maurus, which formerly wept so copiously in the zoological gardens, would have been a fine case for observation, but the two monkeys now there, and which are believed to belong to the same species, do not weep. Nevertheless, they were carefully observed by Mr. Bartlett and myself, whilst screaming loudly, and they seemed to contract these muscles but they moved about their cages so rapidly that it was difficult to observe with certainty. No other monkey, as far as I have been able to ascertain, contracts its orbicular muscles whilst screaming. The Indian elephant is known sometimes to weep. Sir E. Tennant, in describing these which he saw captured and bound in Ceylon, says, some Quote, lay motionless on the ground, with no other indication of suffering than the tears which suffused their eyes and flowed incessantly. End quote. Speaking of another elephant, he says, quote, When overpowered and made fast, his grief was most affecting. His violence sank to other prostration. And he lay on the ground, uttering choking cries, with tears trickling down his cheeks. End quote. In the zoological gardens, the keeper of the Indian elephants positively asserts that he has several times seen tears rolling down the face of the old female, when distressed by the removal of the young one. Hence I was extremely anxious to ascertain as an extension of the relation between the contraction of the orbicular muscles and the shedding of tears in man, whether elephants, when screaming or trumpeting loudly, contract these muscles. At Mr. Bartlett's desire, the keeper ordered the old and the young elephant to trumpet, and we repeatedly saw in both animals that, just as the trumpeting began, the orbicular muscles especially in the lower ones, were distinctly contracted. On a subsequent occasion, the keeper made the old elephant trumpet much more loudly, and invariably both the upper and lower orbicular muscles were strongly contracted, and now in an equal degree. It is a singular fact that the African elephants, which, however, is so different from the Indian species that it is placed by some naturalists 
in a distinct subgenus, when made on two occasions to trumpet loudly, exhibited no trace of the contraction of the orbicular muscles. From the several foregoing cases with respect to man, there can, I think, be no doubt that the contraction of the muscles round the eyes, during violent expiration or when the expanded chest is forcibly compressed, is, in some manner, intimately connected with the secretion of tears. This holds good under widely different emotions, and independently of any emotion. It is not, of course, meant that tears cannot be secreted without the contractions of these muscles, for it is notorious that they are often freely shed with the eyelids not closed, and with the brows unwrinkled. The contraction must be both involuntary and prolonged, as during a choking fit, or energetic, as during a sneeze. The mere involuntary winking of the eyelids, though often repeated, does not bring tears into the eyes, nor does the voluntary and prolonged contraction of the several surrounding muscles suffice. As the lacrimal glands of children are easily excited, I persuaded my own and several other children of different ages to contract these muscles repeatedly with their utmost force, and to continue doing so as long as they possibly could, but this produced hardly any effect. There was sometimes a little moisture in the eyes, but not more than apparently could be accounted for by the squeezing out of the already secreted tears within the glands. The nature of the relation between the involuntary and energetic contraction of the muscles round the eyes and the secretion of tears cannot be positively ascertained, but a probable view may be suggested. The primary function of the secretion of tears, together with some mucus, is to lubricate the surface of the eye, and the secondary one, as some believe, is to keep the nostrils damp, so that the inhaled air may be moist, and likewise to favor the power of smelling. But another, and at least equally important function of tears, is to wash out particles of dust or other minute objects which may get into the eyes. That this is of great importance is clear from the cases in which the cornea has been rendered opaque through inflammation, caused by particles of dust not being removed, in consequence of the eye and eyelid becoming immovable. The secretion of tears from the irritation of any foreign body in the eye is a reflex action. That is, the body irritates a peripheral nerve which sends an impression to certain sensory nerve cells. These transmit an influence to other cells, and these again to the lacrimal glands. The influence transmitted to these glands causes, as there is good reason to believe, the relaxation of the muscular coats of the smaller arteries. This allows more blood to permeate the glandular tissue, and this induces a free secretion of tears. When the small arteries of the face, including those of the retina, are relaxed under very different circumstances, namely, during an intense blush, the lacrimal glands are sometimes affected in a like manner, for the eyes become suffused with tears. It is difficult to conjecture how many reflex actions have originated, but, in relation to the present case of the affection of the lacrimal glands through irritation of the surface of the eye, it may be worth remarking that, as soon as some primordial form became semi-terrestrial in its habits, and was liable to get particles of dust into its eyes, if these were not washed out, they would cause much irritation 
and on the principle of the radiation of nerve force to adjoining nerve cells, the lacrimal glands would be stimulated to secretion. As this would often recur, and as nerve force readily passes along accustomed channels, a slight irritation would ultimately suffice to cause a free secretion of tears. As soon as by this, or by some other means, a reflex action of this nature had been established and rendered easy, other stimulants applied to the surface of the eye, such as a cold wind, slow inflammatory action, or a blow on the eyelids, would cause a copious secretion of tears, as we know to be the case. The glands are also excited into action through the irritation of adjoining parts. Thus, when the nostrils are irritated by pungent vapors, though the eyelids may be kept firmly closed, tears are copiously secreted, and this likewise follows from a blow on the nose, for instance from a boxing glove. A stinging switch on the face produces, as I have seen, the same effect. In these latter cases, the secretion of tears is an incidental result, and of no direct service. As all these parts of the face, including the lacrimal glands, are supplied with branches of the same nerve, namely the fifth, it is in some degree intelligible that the effects of the excitement of any one branch should spread to the nerve cells or roots of the other branches. The internal parts of the eye likewise act, under certain conditions, in the reflex manner on the lacrimal glands. The following statements have been kindly communicated to me by Mr. Bowman, but the subject is a very intricate one, as all the parts of the eye are so intimately related together and are so sensitive to various stimulants. A strong light acting on the retina, when in a normal condition, has very little tendency to cause lacrimation. But with unhealthy children having small, old standing ulcers on the cornea, the retina becomes excessively sensitive to light, and exposure even to common daylight causes forcible and sustained closure of the eyelids and a profuse flow of tears. When persons who ought to begin the use of convex glasses habitually strain the waning power of accommodation, an undue secretion of tears very often follows, and the retina is liable to become unduly sensitive to light. In general, Morbid affections of the surface of the eye and of the ciliary structures concerned and the accommodative act are prone to be accompanied with excessive secretion of tears. Hardness of the eyeball, not rising to inflammation, but implying a want of balance between the fluids poured out and again taken up by the intraocular vessels is not usually attended with any lacrimation. When the balance is on the other side, and the eye becomes too soft, there is a great tendency to lacrimation. Finally, there are numerous morbid states and structural alterations of the eyes, and even terrible inflammations, which may be attended with little or no secretion of tears. It also deserves notice, as indirectly bearing on our subject, that the eye and adjoining parts are subject to an extraordinary number of reflex and associated movements, sensations, and actions, besides those relating to the lacrimal glands. When a bright light strikes the retina of one eye alone, the iris contracts, but the iris of the other eye moves after a measurable interval of time. The iris likewise moves in accommodation to near or distant vision, 
and when the two eyes are made to converge. Everyone knows how irresistibly the eyebrows are drawn down under an intensely bright light. The eyelids also involuntarily wink when an object is moved near the eyes, or a sound is suddenly heard. A well-known case of a bright light causing some person to sneeze is even more curious. The nerve force here radiates from certain nerve cells in connection with the retina to the sensory nerve cells of the nose, causing it to tickle, and from these to the cells which command the various respiratory muscles, the orbiculars included, which expel the air in so peculiar a manner that it rushes through the nostrils alone. To return to our point, why are tears secreted during a screaming fit or other violent expiratory efforts? As a slight blow on the eyelids causes a copious secretion of tears, it is at least possible that this spasmodic contraction of the eyelids by strongly pressing on the eyeball should in a similar manner cause some secretion. This seems possible, although the voluntary contraction of the same muscles does not produce any such effect. We know that a man cannot voluntarily sneeze or cough with nearly the same force as he does automatically, and so it is with the contraction of the orbicular muscles. Sir C. Bell experimented on them and found that, by suddenly and forcibly closing the eyelids in the dark, sparks of light are seen, like those caused by tapping the eyelids with the fingers. Quote, but in sneezing the compression is both more rapid and more forcible, and the sparks are more brilliant. End quote. That these sparks are due to the contractions of the eyelids is clear because if they, quote, are held open during the act of sneezing, no sensation of light will be experienced, End quote. In the peculiar cases referred to by Professor Donders and Mr. Bowman, we have seen that some weeks after the eye has been very slightly injured, spasmodic contractions of the eyelids ensue and these are accompanied by a profuse flow of tears. In the act of yawning, the tears are apparently due solely to the spasmodic contraction of the muscles round the eyes. Notwithstanding these latter cases, it seems hardly credible that the pressure of the eyelids on the surface of the eye, although affected spasmodically and therefore with much greater force than can be done voluntarily, should be sufficient to cause by reflex action the secretion of tears in the many cases in which this occurs during violent expiratory efforts. Another cause may come conjointly into play. We have seen that the internal parts of the eye, under certain conditions, act in a reflex manner on the lacrimal glands. We know that during violent expiratory efforts, the pressure of the arterial blood within the vessels of the eye is increased, and that the return of the venous blood is impeded. It seems, therefore, not improbable that the distension of the ocular vessels, thus induced, might act by reflection on the lacrimal glands. The effects due to the spasmodic pressure of the eyelids on the surface of the eye being thus increased. In considering how far this view is probable, we should bear in mind that the eyes of infants have been acted on in this double manner during numberless generations, whenever they have screamed, and on the principle of nerve force readily passing along accustomed channels. Even a moderate compression of the eyeballs and a moderate distension of the ocular vessels would ultimately come, through habit, to act on the glands. We have an analogous case in the orbicular muscles 
being almost always contracted in some slight degree, even during a gentle crying fit, when there can be no distension of the vessels and no uncomfortable sensation excited within the eyes. Moreover, when complex actions or movements have long been performed in strict association together, and these are from any cause at first voluntarily and afterwards habitually checked, then if the proper exciting conditions occur, any part of the action or movement which is least under the control of the will will often be still involuntarily performed. The secretion by a gland is remarkably free from the influence of the will. Therefore, when with the advancing age of the individual, or with the advancing culture of the race, the habit of crying out or screaming is restrained, and there is consequently no distension of the blood vessels of the eye, it may nevertheless well happen that tears should still be secreted. We may see, as lately remarked, the muscles round the eyes of a person who reads a pathetic story, twitching or trembling in so slight a degree as hardly to be detected. In this case, there has been no screaming and no distension of the blood vessels. Yet through habit, certain nerve cells send a small amount of nerve force to the cells commanding the muscles round the eyes, and they likewise send some to the cells commanding the lacrimal glands, for the eyes often become at the same time just moistened with tears. If the twitching of the muscles round the eyes and the secretion of tears had been completely prevented, Nevertheless, it is almost certain that there would have been some tendency to transmit nerve force in these same directions, and as the lacrimal glands are remarkably free from the control of the will, they would be eminently liable still to act, thus betraying, though there were no other outward signs, the pathetic thoughts which were passing through the person's mind. As a further illustration of the view here advanced, I may remark that, during an earlier period of life, when habits of all kinds are readily established, our infants, when pleased, have been accustomed to other loud peals of laughter, during which the vessels of their eyes are distended, as often and as continuously as they have yielded when distressed to screaming fits then it is probable that in after life tears would have been as copiously and as regularly secreted under the one state of mind as under the other. Gentle laughter or a smile or even a pleasing thought would have sufficed to cause a moderate secretion of tears. There does indeed exist an evident tendency in this direction, as will be seen in a future chapter when we treat of the tender feelings. With the Sandwich Islanders, according to Freycinet, tears are actually recognized as a sign of happiness, but we should require better evidence on this head than that of a passing voyager. So again, if our infants, during many generations, and each of them during several years, had almost daily suffered from prolonged choking fits, during which the vessels of the eyes are distended and tears copiously secreted, then it is probable, such is the force of associated habit, that during after life the mere thought of a choke, without any distress of mind, would have sufficed to bring tears into our eyes. To sum up this chapter, Weeping is probably the result of some such chain of events as follows. Children, when wanting food or suffering in any way, cry out loudly, like the young of most other animals, partly as a call to their parents for aid, and partly from any great exertion serving relief. Prolonged screaming inevitably 
leads to the gorging of the blood vessels of the eye, and this will have led, at first consciously and at last habitually, to the contraction of the muscles round the eye in order to protect them. At the same time, the spasmodic pressure on the surface of the eye, and the distension of the vessels within the eye, without necessarily entailing any conscious sensation, will have affected, through reflex action, the lacrimal glands. Finally, through the three principles of nerve force readily passing along accustomed channels, of association, which is so widely extended in its power, and of certain actions being more under the control of the will than others, it has come to pass that suffering readily causes the secretion of tears, without being necessarily accompanied by any other action. Although in accordance with this view, we must look at weeping as an incidental result, as purposeless as the secretion of tears from a blow outside the eye, or as a sneeze from the retina being affected by a bright light. Yet this does not present any difficulty in our understanding how the secretion of tears serves as a relief to suffering. And by as much as the weeping is more violent or hysterical, by so much will the relief be greater. On the same principle that the writhing of the whole body, the grinding of the teeth, and the uttering of piercing shrieks, all give relief under an agony of pain. Section 13 of The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin. Chapter 7 low spirits, anxiety, grief, dejection, despair. Part 1 After the mind has suffered from an acute paroxysm of grief, and the cause still continues, we fall into a state of low spirits, or we may be utterly cast down and dejected. Prolonged bodily pain if not amounting to an agony, generally leads to the same state of mind. If we expect to suffer, we are anxious. If we have no hope of relief, we despair. Persons suffering from excessive grief often seek relief by violent and almost frantic movements, as described in a former chapter. But when their suffering is somewhat mitigated, yet prolonged, they no longer wish for action, but remain motionless and passive, or may occasionally rock themselves to and fro. The circulation becomes languid, the face pale, the muscles flaccid, the eyelids droop, the head hangs on the contracted chest, the lips, cheeks, and lower jaw all sink downwards from their own weight. Hence, all the features are lengthened, and the face of the person who hears bad news is said to fall. A party of natives in Tierra del Fuego endeavor to explain to us that their friend, the captain of a sealing vessel, was out of spirits by pulling down their cheeks with both hands, so as to make their faces as long as possible. Mr. Bunnett informs me that the Australian aborigines, when out of spirits, have a chop-fallen appearance. After prolonged suffering, the eyes become dull and lack expression, and are often slightly suffused with tears. The eyebrows, not rarely, are rendered oblique, which is due to their inner ends being raised. This produces peculiarly 
form wrinkles on the forehead which are very different from those of a simple frown though in some cases a frown alone may be present the corners of the mouth are drawn downwards which is so universally recognized as a sign of being out of spirits that it is almost proverbial the breathing becomes slow and feeble and is often interrupted by deep sighs as graciolet remarks whenever our attention is being concentrated on any subject we forget to breathe and then relieve ourselves by a deep inspiration but the sighs of a sorrowful person owing to his slow respiration and languid circulation are eminently characteristic as the grief of a person in this state occasionally recurs and increases into a paroxysm spasms affect the respiratory muscles and he feels as if something the so-called globus hystericus was rising in his throat these spasmodic movements are clearly allied to the sobbing of children and are remnants of those severe spasms which occur when a person is said to choke from excessive grief o obliquity of the eyebrows two points alone in the above description require further elucidation and these are very curious ones namely the raising of the inner ends of the eyebrows and the drawing down of the corners of the mouth with respect to the eyebrows they may occasionally be seen to assume an oblique position in persons suffering from deep dejection or anxiety for instance i have observed this movement in a mother while speaking about her sick son and it is sometimes excited by quite trifling or momentary causes of real or pretended distress the eyebrows assume this position owing to the contraction of certain muscles namely the orbiculars corrugators and pyramidals of the nose which together tend to lower and contract the eyebrows being partially cheeked by the more powerful action of the central fascia of the frontal muscle these latter fascia by their contraction raise the inner ends alone of the eyebrows and as the corrugators at the same time draw the eyebrows together their inner ends become puckered into a fold or a lump this fold is a highly characteristic point in the appearance of the eyebrows when rendered oblique as the eyebrows are at the same time somewhat roughened owing to the hairs being made to project dr j crichton brown has also often noticed in melancholic patients who keep their eyebrows persistently oblique a peculiar acute arching of the upper eyelid a trace of this may be observed by comparing the right and left eyelids of the young man in the photograph for he was not able to act equally on both eyebrows this is also shown by the unequal furrows on the two sides of his forehead the acute arching of the eyelids depends i believe on the inner and alone of the eyebrows being raised for when the whole eyebrow is elevated and arched the upper eyelid follows in a slight degree the same movement but the most conspicuous result of the opposed contraction of the above-named muscles is exhibited by the peculiar furrows formed on the forehead these muscles when thus in conjoint yet opposed action may be called for the sake of brevity the grief muscles when a person elevates his eyebrows by the contraction of the whole frontal muscle transverse wrinkles extend across the whole breadth of the forehead but in the present case the middle fascia alone are contracted consequently transverse furrows are formed across the middle part alone of the forehead 
the skin over the exterior parts of both eyebrows is at the same time drawn downwards and smooth by the contraction of the outer portions of the orbicular muscles the eyebrows are likewise brought together through the simultaneous contraction of the corrugators and this latter action generates vertical furrows separating the exterior and lower part of the skin of the forehead from the central and raised part the union of these vertical furrows with the central and transverse furrows produces a mark on the forehead which has been compared to a horseshoe but the furrows more strictly form three sides of a quadrangle they are often conspicuous on the foreheads of adult or nearly adult persons when their eyebrows are made oblique but with young children owing to their skin not easily wrinkling they are rarely seen or mere traces of them can be detected these peculiar furrows are best represented on the forehead of a young lady who has the power in an unusual degree of voluntarily acting on the requisite muscles as she was absorbed in the attempt whilst being photographed her expression was not at all one of grief i have therefore given the forehead alone on the same plate copied from dr duchene's work represents on a reduced scale the face in its natural state of a young man who was a good actor he is shown simulating grief but the two eyebrows as before remarked are not equally acted on that the expression is true may be inferred from the fact that out of fifteen persons to whom the original photograph was shown without any clue to what was intended being given them fourteen immediately answered despairing sorrow suffering endurance melancholy and so forth the history of figure five is rather curious i saw the photograph in a shop window and took it to mr Rijlander for the sake of finding out by whom it had been made remarking to him how pathetic the expression was he answered i made it and it was likely to be pathetic for the boy in a few minutes burst out crying he then showed me a photograph of the same boy in a placid state which i have had reproduced a trace of obliquity in the eyebrows may be detected but this figure as well as figure seven is given to show the depression of the corners of the mouth to which subject i shall presently refer few persons without some practice can voluntarily act on their grief muscles but after repeated trials a considerable number succeed whilst others never can the degree of obliquity in the eyebrows whether assumed voluntarily or unconsciously differs much in different persons with some who apparently have unusually strong pyramidal muscles the contraction of the central fascia of the frontal muscle although it may be energetic as shown by the quadrangular furrows on the forehead does not raise the inner ends of the eyebrows but only prevents their being so much lowered as they otherwise would have been as far as i have been able to observe the grief muscles are brought into action much more frequently by children and women than by men they are rarely acted on at least with grown-up persons from bodily pain but almost exclusively from mental distress two persons who after some practice succeeded in acting on their grief muscles found by looking at a mirror that when they made their eyebrows oblique they unintentionally at the same time depressed the corners of their mouths and this is often the case when the expression is naturally assumed the power to bring grief muscles freely into play appears to be hereditary like almost every other human faculty a lady belonging to a family famous for having produced an extraordinary number of great actors and actresses 
and who can herself give this expression with singular precision told dr crichton brown that all her family had possessed the power in a remarkable degree the same hereditary tendency is said to have extended as i likewise hear from dr brown to the last descendant of the family which gave rise to sir walter scott's novel of red gauntlet but the hero is described as contracting his forehead into a horseshoe mark from any strong emotion i have also seen a young woman whose forehead seemed almost habitually thus contracted independently of any emotion being at the time felt the greek muscles are not very frequently brought into play and as the action is often momentary it easily escapes observation although the expression when observed is universally and instantly recognized as that of grief or anxiety yet not one person out of a thousand who had never studied the subject is able to say precisely what change passes over the sufferer's face hence probably it is that this expression is not even alluded to as far as i have noticed in any work of fiction with the exception of the red gauntlet and of one other novel and the authoress of the latter as i am informed belongs to the famous family of actors just alluded to so that her attention may have been specially called to the subject the ancient greek sculptors were familiar with the expression as shown in the statues of the laocoon and aretino but as duchesne remarks they carried the transverse furrows across the whole breadth of the forehead and thus committed a great anatomical mistake this is likewise the case in some modern statues it is however more probable that these wonderfully accurate observers intentionally sacrificed truth for the sake of beauty than that they made a mistake for rectangular furrows on the forehead would not have had a grand appearance on the marble the expression in its fully developed condition is as far as i can discover not often represented in pictures by the old masters no doubt owing to the same cause but a lady who is perfectly familiar with this expression informs me that in fra angelica's descent from the cross in florence it is clearly exhibited in one of the figures on the right hand and i could add a few other instances dr crichton brown at my request closely attended to this expression in the numerous insane patients under his care in the west biting asylum and he is familiar with duchesne's photographs of the action of the greek muscles he informs me that they may constantly be seen in energetic action in cases of melancholia and especially of hypochondria and that the persistent lines or furrows due to their habitual contraction are characteristic of the physiognomy of the insane belonging to these two classes dr brown carefully observed for me during a considerable period three cases of hypochondria in which the grief muscles were persistently contracted in one of these a widow aged fifty-one fancied that she had lost all her viscera and that her whole body was empty she wore an expression of great distress and beat her semi-closed hands rhythmically together for hours the grief muscles were permanently contracted and the upper eyelids arched this condition lasted for months she then recovered and her countenance resumed its natural expression a second case presented nearly the same peculiarities with the addition that the corners of the mouth were depressed mr patrick nicholl has also kindly observed for me several cases in the sussex lunatic asylum and has communicated to me full details with respect to three of them but they need not here be given from his observations on melancholic patients mr nicholl concludes that the inner ends of the eyebrows are almost always 
more or less raised with the wrinkles on the forehead more or less plainly marked in the case of one young woman these wrinkles were observed to be in constant slight play or movement in some cases the corners of the mouth are depressed but often only in a slight degree some amount of difference in the expression of the several melancholic patients could almost always be observed the eyelids generally droop and the skin near the outer corners and beneath them is wrinkled the nasolabial fold which runs from the wings of the nostrils to the corners of the mouth and which is so conspicuous in blubbering children is often plainly marked in these patients although with the insane the grief muscles often act persistently yet in ordinary cases they are sometimes brought unconsciously into momentary action by ludicrously slight causes a gentleman rewarded a young lady by an absurdly small present she pretended to be offended and as she upbraided him her eyebrows became extremely oblique with the forehead properly wrinkled another young lady and a youth both in the highest spirits were eagerly talking to each talking together with extraordinary rapidity and i noticed that as often as the young lady was beaten and could not get out her words fast enough her eyebrows went obliquely upwards and rectangular furrows were formed on her forehead she thus each time hoisted a flag of distress and this she did half a dozen times in the course of a few minutes i made no remark on the subject but on a subsequent occasion i asked her to act on her grief muscles another girl who was present and who could do so voluntarily showing her what was intended she tried repeatedly but utterly failed yet so slight a cause of distress as not being able to talk quickly enough sufficed to bring these muscles over and over again into energetic action the expression of grief due to the contraction of the grief muscles is by no means confined to europeans but appears to be common to all the races of mankind i have at least received trustworthy accounts in regard to hindus dangars one of the aboriginal hill tribes of india and therefore belonging to a quite distinct race from the hindus malays negroes and australians with respect to the latter two observers answer my query in the affirmative but enter into no details mr taplin however appends to my descriptive remarks the words this is exact with respect to negroes the lady who told me of fra angelica's picture saw a negro towing a boat on the nile and as he encountered an obstruction she observed his grief muscles in strong action with the middle of the forehead well wrinkled mr gage watched a malay man in malacca with the corners of his mouth much depressed the eyebrows oblique with deep short grooves on the forehead this expression lasted for a very short time and mr gage remarks it was a strange one very much like a person about to cry at some great loss in india mr h erskine found that the natives were familiar with this expression and mr j scott of the botanic gardens calcutta has obligingly sent me a full description of two cases he observed during some time himself unseen a very young dangar woman from Nagpur, the wife of one of the gardeners nursing her baby who was at the point of death and he distinctly saw the eyebrows raised at the inner corners the eyelids drooping the forehead wrinkled in the middle the mouth slightly open with the corners much depressed he then came from behind a screen of plants and spoke to the poor woman who started first into a bitter flood of tears and besought him to cure her baby the second case was that of a hindustani man who from illness and poverty was compelled to sell his favorite 
goat after receiving the money he repeatedly looked at the money in his hand and then at the goat as if doubting whether he would not return it he went to the goat which was tied up ready to be led away and the animal reared up and licked his hands his eyes then wavered from side to side his mouth was partially closed with the corners very decidedly depressed at last the poor man seemed to make up his mind that he must part it with his goat and then as mr scott saw the eyebrows became slightly oblique with the characteristic puckering or swelling at the inner ends but the wrinkles on the forehead were not present the man stood thus for a minute then heaving a deep sigh burst into tears raised up his two hands blessed the goat section fourteen of the expression of the emotions in man and animals this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt Perard. the expression of the emotions in man and animals by charles darwin chapter seven low spirits anxiety grief Ejection, despair, part two. On the cause of the obliquity of the eyebrows under suffering. During several years, no expression seemed to me so utterly perplexing as this which we are here considering. Why should grief or anxiety cause the central fascia alone in the frontal muscle, together with those round the eyes, to contract? here we seem to have a complex movement for the sole purpose of expressing grief and yet it is a comparatively rare expression and often overlooked i believe the explanation is not so difficult as it at first appears dr duchene gives a photograph of the young man before referred to who when looking upwards at a strongly illuminated surface involuntary contracted his grief muscles in an exaggerated manner i had entirely forgotten this photograph when on a very bright day with the sun behind me i met whilst on horseback a girl whose eyebrows as she looked up at me became extremely oblique with the proper furrows on her forehead i have observed the same movement under similar circumstances on several subsequent occasions on my return home i made three of my children without giving them any clue to my object look as long and as attentively as they could at the summit of a tall tree standing against an extremely bright sky with all three the orbicular corrugator and pyramidal muscles were energetically contracted through reflex action from the excitement of the retina so that their eyes might be protected from the bright light but they tried their utmost to look upwards and now a curious struggle with spasmodic twitchings could be observed between the whole or only the central portion of the frontal muscle and the several muscles which served to lower the eyebrows and close the eyelids the involuntary contraction of the pyramidal caused the basal part of their noses to be transversely and deeply wrinkled in one of the three children the whole eyebrows were momentarily raised and lowered by the alternate contraction of the whole frontal muscle and of the muscles surrounding the eyes so that the whole breadth of the forehead was alternately wrinkled and smoothed in the other two children the forehead became wrinkled in the middle part alone rectangular furrows being thus produced and the eyebrows were rendered oblique with their inner extremities puckered and swollen in the one child in a slight degree in the other in a strongly marked manner this difference in the obliquity of the eyebrows 
apparently depended on a difference in their general mobility and in the strength of the pyramidal muscles in both these cases the eyebrows and forehead were acted on under the influence of a strong light in precisely the same manner in every characteristic detail as under the influence of grief or anxiety duchenne states that the pyramidal muscle of the nose is less under the control of the will than are the other muscles round the eyes he remarks that the young man who could so well act on his grief muscles as well as on most of his other facial muscles could not contract the pyramidals this power however no doubt differs in different persons the pyramidal muscle serves to draw down the skin of the forehead between the eyebrows together with their inner extremities the central fascia of the frontal are the antagonists of the pyramidal and if the action of the latter is to be specially checked these central fascia must be contracted so that with persons having powerful pyramidal muscles if there is under the influence of a bright light an unconscious desire to prevent the lowering of the eyebrows the central fascia of the frontal muscle must be brought into play and their contraction if sufficiently strong to overmaster the pyramidals together with the contraction of the corrugator and orbicular muscles will act in the manner just described on the eyebrows and forehead when children scream or cry out they contract as we know the orbicular corrugator and pyramidal muscles primarily for the sake of compressing their eyes and thus protecting them from being gorged with blood and secondarily through habit i therefore expected to find with children that when they endeavoured either to prevent a crying fit from coming on or to stop crying they would cheat the contraction of the above-named muscles in the same manner as when looking upwards at a bright light and consequently that the central fascia of the frontal muscle would often be brought into play accordingly i began myself to observe children at such times and asked others including some medical men to do the same it is necessary to observe carefully as the peculiar opposed action of these muscles is not nearly so plain in children owing to their foreheads not easily wrinkling as in adults but i soon found that the grief muscles were very frequently brought into distinct action on these occasions it would be superfluous to give all the cases which have been observed and i will specify only a few a little girl a year and a half old was teased by some other children and before bursting into tears her eyebrows became decidedly oblique with an older girl the same obliquity was observed with the inner ends of the eyebrows plainly puckered and at the same time the corners of the mouth were drawn downwards as soon as she burst into tears the features all changed and this peculiar expression vanished again after a little boy had been vaccinated which made him scream and cry violently the surgeon gave him an orange brought for the purpose and this pleased the child much as he stopped crying all the characteristic movements were observed including the formation of rectangular wrinkles in the middle of the forehead lastly i met on the road a little girl three or four years old who had been frightened by a dog and when i asked her what was the matter she stopped whimpering and her eyebrows instantly became oblique to an extraordinary degree here then as i cannot doubt we have the key to the problem why the central fascia of the frontal muscle and the muscles round the eyes contract in opposition to each other under the influence of grief whether their contraction be prolonged as with the melancholic insane or momentary from some trifling cause of distress we have all of us as infants repeatedly contracted our our orbicular corrugator and pyramidal muscles 
in order to protect our eyes whilst screaming our progenitors before us have done the same during many generations and though with advancing years we easily prevent when feeling distressed the utterance of screams we cannot from long habit always prevent a slight contraction of the above-named muscles nor indeed do we observe their contraction in ourselves or attempt to stop it if slight but the pyramidal muscles seem to be less under the command of the will than the other related muscles and if they be well developed their contraction can be checked only by the antagonistic contraction of the central fascia of the frontal muscle the result which necessarily follows if these fascia contract energetically is the oblique drawing up of the eyebrows the puckering of their inner ends and the formation of rectangular furrows on the middle of the forehead as children and women cry much more freely than men and as grown-up persons of both sexes rarely weep except from mental distress we can understand why the grief muscles are more frequently seen in action as i believe to be the case with children and women than with men and with adults of both sexes from mental distress alone in some of the cases before recorded as in that of the poor danger woman and of the hindustan man the action of the grief muscles was quickly followed by bitter weeping in all cases of distress whether great or small our brains tend through long habit to send an order to certain muscles to contract as if we were still infants on the point of screaming out but this order we by the wondrous power of the will and through habit are able partially to counteract although this is effected unconsciously as far as the means of counteraction are concerned on the depression of the corners of the mouth this action is effected by the depressors angulate oris the fibres of this muscle diverge downwards with the upper convergent ends attached round the angles of the mouth and to the lower lip a little way within the angles some of the fibres appear to be antagonistic to the great zygomatic muscle and others to the several muscles running to the outer part of the upper lip the contraction of this muscle draws downwards and outwards the corners of the mouth including the outer part of the upper lip and even in a slight degree the wings of the nostrils when the mouth is closed and this muscle acts the commissure or line of junction of the two lips forms a curved line with the concavity downwards and the lips themselves are generally somewhat protruded especially the lower one the mouth in this state is well represented in the two photographs by mr rachelander the upper boy had just stopped crying after receiving a slap on the face from another boy and the right moment was seized for photographing him the expression of low spirits grief or dejection due to the contraction of this muscle has been noticed by every one who has written on the subject to say that a person is down in the mouth is synonymous with saying that he is out of spirits the depression of the corners may often be seen as already stated on the authority of dr crichton brown and mr nicholl with the melancholic insane and was well exhibited in some photographs sent to me by the former gentleman of patients with a strong tendency to suicide it has been observed with men belonging to various races namely with hindus the dark hill tribes of india malays and as the rev mr hagenauer informs me with the aborigines of australia when infants scream they firmly contract the muscles round their eyes and this draws up the upper lip and as they have to keep their mouths widely open the depressor muscles running to the corners are likewise brought into strong action this generally but not invariably 
causes a slight angular bend in the lower lip on both sides near the corners of the mouth the result of the upper and lower lip being thus acted on is that the mouth assumes a squarish outline the contraction of the depressor muscle is best seen in infants who are not screaming violently and especially just before they begin or when they cease to scream their little faces then acquire an extremely piteous expression as i continually observed with my own infants between the ages of about six weeks and two or three months sometimes when they are struggling against a crying fit the outline of the mouth is curved in so exaggerated a manner as to be like a horseshoe and the expression of misery then becomes a ludicrous caricature the explanation of the contraction of this muscle under the influence of low spirits or dejection apparently follows from the same general principles as in the case of the obliquity of the eyebrows dr duchene informs me that he concludes from his observations now prolonged during many years that this is one of the facial muscles which is least under the control of the will this fact may indeed be inferred from what has just been stated with respect to infants when doubtfully beginning to cry or endeavouring to stop crying for they then generally command all this fact may indeed be inferred from what has just been stated with respect to infants when doubtfully beginning to cry or endeavouring to stop crying for they then generally command all the other facial muscles more effectually than they do the depressors of the corners of the mouth two excellent observers who had no theory on the subject one of them a surgeon carefully watched for me some older children and women as with some opposed struggling they very gradually approached the point of bursting out into tears and both observers felt sure that the depressors began to act before any of the other muscles now as the depressors have been repeatedly brought into strong action during infancy and many generations nerve force will tend to flow on the principle of long associated habit to these muscles as well as to various other facial muscles whenever in after life even a slight feeling of distress is experienced but as the depressors are somewhat less under the control of the will than most of the other muscles we might expect that they would often slightly contract whilst the others remain passive it is remarkable how small a depression of, of the corners of the mouth gives to the countenance an expression of low spirits or dejection so that an extremely slight contraction of these muscles would be sufficient to betray this state of mind i may here mention a trifling observation as it will serve to sum up our present subject an old lady with a comfortable but absorbed expression sat nearly opposite to me in a railway carriage whilst i was looking at her i saw that her depressor angrily oris became very slightly yet decidedly contracted but as her countenance remained as placid as ever i reflected how meaningless was this contraction and how easily one might be deceived the thought had hardly occurred to me when i saw that her eyes suddenly became suffused with tears almost to overflowing and her whole countenance fell there could now be no doubt that some painful recollection perhaps that of a long-lost child was passing through her mind as soon as her sensorium was thus affected certain nerve cells from long habit instantly transmitted an order to all the respiratory muscles and to those round the mouth to prepare for a fit of crying but the order was countermanded by the will or rather by a later acquired habit and all the muscles were obedient excepting in a slight degree the depressoris angulus oris the mouth was not even opened the respiration was not hurried and no muscle was affected except those which 
draw down the corners of the mouth as soon as the mouth of this lady began involuntarily and unconsciously on her part to assume the proper form for a crying fit we may feel almost sure that some nerve influence would have been transmitted through the long accustomed channels to the various respiratory muscles as well as to those round the eyes and to the vasomotor centre which governs the supply of blood sent to the lacrimal glands of this latter fact we have indeed clear evidence in her eyes becoming slightly suffused with tears and we can understand this as the lacrimal glands are less under the control of the will than the facial muscles no doubt there existed at the same time some tendency in the muscles round the eyes at contract as if for the sake of protecting them from being gorged with blood but this contraction was completely overmastered and her brow remained unruffled had the pyramidal corrugator and orbicular muscles been as little obedient to the will as they are in many persons they would have been slightly acted on and then the central fascia of the frontal muscle would have contracted in antagonism and her eyebrows would have become oblique with rectangular furrows on her forehead her countenance would then have expressed still more plainly than it did a state of dejection or rather one of grief through steps such as these we can understand how it is that as soon as some melancholy thought passes through the brain there occurs a just perceptible drawing down at the corners of the mouth or a slight raising up of the inner ends of the eyebrows or both movements combined and immediately afterwards a slight suffusion of tears a thrill of nerve force is transmitted along several habitual channels and produces an effect on any point where the will has not acquired through long habit much power of interference the above actions may be considered as rudimental vestiges of the screaming fits which are so frequent and prolonged during infancy in this case as well as in many others the links are indeed wonderful which connect cause and effect in giving rise to various expressions on the human continents and they explain to us the meaning of certain movements which we involuntarily Section 15 of the Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Trong in Houston, Texas. The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin. Chapter 8 Joy, High Spirits, Love, tender feelings devotion part one laughter primarily the expression of joy ludicrous ideas movement of the features during laughter nature of the sound produced the secretions of tears during loud laughter gradations from loud laughter to gentle smiling high spirits the expression of love tender feelings devotion joy when intense leads to various purposeless movements to dancing about clapping the hands stamping and to loud laughter laughter seems primarily to be the expression of mere joy or happiness we clearly see this in children at play who are almost incessantly laughing with young persons past childhood when they are in high spirits there is always much meaningless laughter. The laughter of the gods is described by Homer as the exuberance of their celestial joy after their daily banquet. A man smiles, and smiling, as we shall see, graduates into laughter. At meeting an old friend in the street, 
as he does at any trifling pleasure, such as smelling a sweet perfume. Laura Brickman, from her blindness and deafness, could not have acquired any expression through imitation. Yet, when a letter from a beloved friend was communicated to her by gesture language, she laughed and clapped her hands, and the color mounted to her cheeks. On other occasions, she has been seen to stamp for joy. Idiots and imbecile persons likewise afford good evidence that laughter or smiling primarily expresses mere happiness or joy. Dr. Critton Brown, to whom, as on so many other occasions, I am indebted for the results of his wide experience, informs me that with idiots, laughter is the most prevalent and frequent of all the emotional expressions. Many idiots are morose, passionate, restless, in a painful state of mind, or utterly stolid, and these never laugh. Others frequently laugh in a quite senseless manner. Thus, an idiot boy, incapable of speech, complained to Dr. Brown by the aid of signs that another boy in the asylum had given him a black eye, and this was accompanied by explosions of laughter and with his face covered with the broadest smiles. There is another class of idiots who are persistently joyous and benign and who are constantly laughing or smiling. Their countenances often exhibit a stereotyped smile. Their joyousness is increased, and they grin, chuckle, or giggle whenever food is placed before them, or when they are caressed, are shown bright colors, or hear music. Some of them laugh more than usual when they walk about, or attempt any muscular exertion. The joyousness of most of these idiots cannot possibly be associated as Dr. Brown remarks, with any distinct ideas. They simply feel pleasure and express it by laughter or smiles. With imbeciles rather higher in the scale, personal vanity seems to be the commonest cause of laughter, and next to this, pleasure arising from the approbation of their conduct. With grown-up persons, laughter is excited by causes considerably different from those which suffice during childhood, but this remark hardly applies to smiling. Laughter in this respect is analogous with weeping, which with adults is almost confined to mental distress, while with children it is excited by bodily pain or any suffering, as well as by fear or rage. Many curious discussions have been written on the causes of laughter with grown-up persons. The subject is extremely complex. Something incongruous or unaccountable, exciting surprise and some sense of superiority in the laughter, who must be in a happy frame of mind, seems to be the commonest cause. The circumstances must not be of a momentous nature. No poor man would laugh or smile on suddenly hearing that a large fortune had been bequeathed to him. If the mind is strongly excited by pleasurable feelings, and any little unexpected event or thought occurs, then, as Mr. Herbert Spencer remarks, a large amount of nervous energy, instead of being allowed to expend itself in producing an equivalent amount of the new thoughts and emotion, which were nascent, is suddenly checked in its flow. The excess must discharge itself in some other direction, and there result an efflux through the motor nerves to various classes of the muscles, producing the half-convulsive actions we term laughter. An observation bearing on this point was made by a correspondent during the recent siege of Paris, namely, that the German soldiers after strong excitement from exposure to extreme danger, were particularly apt to burst out into loud laughter at the smallest joke. So again, when young children are just beginning to cry, an unexpected event will sometimes suddenly turn their crying into laughter, 
which apparently serves equally well to expand the superflux nervous energy. The imagination is sometimes said to be tickled by a ludicrous idea, and this so-called tickling of the mind is curiously analogous with that of the body. Everyone knows how immoderate children laugh and how their whole bodies are convulsed when they are tickled. The anthropoid apes, as we have seen, likewise utter a reiterated sound corresponding with our laughter when they are tickled, especially under the armpits. I touch with a bit of paper the sole of the foot of one of my infants when only seven days old, and it was suddenly jerked away and the toes curled about as in an older child. Such movements, as well as laughter from being tickled, are manifestly reflex actions, and this is likewise shown by the minute unstriped muscles, which serve to erect the separate hairs on the body, contracting near a tickled surface. Yet, laughter from ludicrous idea, though involuntary, cannot be called a strictly reflex action. In this case, and in that of laughter from being tickled, the mind must be in a pleasurable condition. A young child, if tickled by a strange man, would scream from fear. The touch must be light, and an idea or event to be ludicrous must not be of grave import. The parts of the body which are most easily tickled are those which are not commonly touched, such as the armpits, or between the toes, or parts such as the soles of the feet which are habitually touched by a broad surface, but the surface on which we sit offers a marked exception to this rule. According to Gratiolet, certain nerves are much more sensitive to tickling than others. From the fact that a child can hardly tickle itself, or in a much less degree than when tickled by another person, it seems that the precise point to be touched must not be known. So with the mind, something unexpected, a novel or incongruous idea, which breaks through an habitual train of thought, appears to be a strong element in the ludicrous. The sound of laughter is produced by a deep inspiration, followed by short, interrupted, spasmodic contractions of the chest, and especially the diaphragm. Hence, we hear of laughter holding both his sides. From the shaking of the body, the head nods to and fro, the lower jaw often quivers up and down, as is likewise the case with some species of baboons, when they are much pleased. The tendency in the zygomatic muscles to contract under pleasurable emotions is shown by a curious fact communicated to me by Dr. Brown with respect to patients suffering from general paralysis of the insane. In this malady, there is almost invariably optimism, delusions as to wealth, rank, grandeur, insane joyousness, benevolence, and profusion, while its very earliest physical symptom is trembling at the corners of the mouth and at the outer corners of the eyes. This is a well-recognized fact. Constant tremulous agitation of the inferior palpebral and great zygomatic muscles is pathonomic of the earlier stages of general paralysis. The countenance has a pleased and benevolent expression. As the disease advances, other muscles become involved, but until complete fatuity is reached, the prevailing expression is that of feeble benevolence. As in laughing and broadly smiling, the cheeks and upper lip are much raised, the nose appears to be shortened, and the skin on the bridge becomes finely wrinkled in transverse lines with other oblique longitudinal lines on the sides. The upper front teeth are commonly exposed. A well-marked nasolabial fold is formed, which runs from the wing of each nostril to the corner of the mouth and this fold is often double in old persons. A bright and sparkling eye is as characteristic of a pleased or amused state of mind, as is the retraction of the corners of the mouth and upper lip 
with the wrinkles thus produced even the eyes of microcephalous idiots who are so degraded that they never learn to speak brighten slightly when they are pleased under extreme laughter the eyes are too much suffused with tears to sparkle but the moisture squeezed out of the glands during moderate laughter or smiling may aid in giving them lustre though this must be of altogether subordinate importance as they become dull from grief though they are then often moist their brightness seems to be chiefly due to their tenseness owing to the contraction of the orbicular muscles and to the pressure of the raised cheeks but according to dr pederick who has discussed this point more fully than any other writer the tenseness may be largely attributed to the eyeballs becoming filled with blood and other fluids from the acceleration of the circulation consequent on the excitement of pleasure he remarks on the contrast in the appearance of the eyes of a hectic patient with a rapid circulation and of a man suffering from cholera with almost all the fluids of his body drained from him any cause which lowers the circulation deadens the eye i remember seeing a man utterly prostrated by prolonged and severe exertion during a very hot day and a bystander compared his eyes to those of a boiled codfish to return to the sounds produced during laughter we can see in a vague manner how the utterance of sounds of some kind would naturally become associated with a pleasurable state of mind for throughout a large part of the animal kingdom vocal or instrumental sounds are employed either as a call or as a charm by one sex for the other they are also employed as the means for a joyful meeting between the parents and their offspring and between the attached members of the same social community but why the sounds which man utters when he is pleased have the peculiar reiterated character of laughter we do not know nevertheless we can see that they would naturally be as different as possible from the screams or cries of distress and as in the production of the later the expirations are prolonged and continuous with the inspirations short and interrupted so it might perhaps have been expected with the sounds uttered from joy that the expirations would have been short and broken with the inspirations prolonged and this is the case it is an equally obscure point why the corners of the mouth are retracted and the upper lip raised during ordinary laughter the mouth must not be open to its utmost extent for when this occurs during a paroxysm of excessive laughter hardly any sound is emitted or it changes its tone and seems to come from deep down in the throat the respiratory muscles and even those of the limbs are at the same time thrown into rapid vibratory movements the lower jaw often partakes of this movement and this would tend to prevent the mouth from being widely opened but as a full volume of sound has to be poured forth the orifice of the mouth must be large and it is perhaps to gain this end that the corners are retracted and the upper lip raised although we can hardly account for the shape of the mouth during laughter which leads to wrinkles being formed beneath the eyes nor for the peculiar reiterated sound of laughter nor for the quivering of the jaws nevertheless we may infer that all these effects are due to some common cause for they are all characteristics and expressive of a pleased state of mind in various kinds of monkeys a graduated series can be followed from violent to moderate laughter to a broad smile to a gentle smile and to the expression of mere cheerfulness during excessive laughter the whole body is often thrown backward and shakes or is almost convulsed the respiration is much disturbed the head and face become gorged with blood with the veins distended and the orbicular muscles are spasmodically contracted in order to protect the eyes tears are freely shed hence as formerly remarked 
it is scarcely possible to point out any difference between the tear-stained face of a person after a paroxysm of excessive laughter and after a bitter crying fit it is probably due to the close similarity of the spasmodic movements caused by these widely different emotions that hysteric patients alternately cry and laugh with violence and that young children sometimes pass suddenly from the one to the other state mr swingho informs me that he has often seen the chinese when suffering from deep grief burst out into hysterical fits of laughter i was anxious to know whether tears are freely shed during excessive laughter by most of the races of men and i hear from my correspondence that this is the case one instance was observed with the hindus and they themselves said that it often occurred so it is with the chinese the women of the wild tribe of malays in malacca peninsula sometimes shed tears when they laugh heartily though this seldom occurs with the diaks of borneo it must frequently be the case at least with the women for i hear from the raja sea brook that it is a common expression with them to say we nearly make tears from laughter the aborigines of australia express their emotions freely and they are described by my correspondents as jumping about and clapping their hands for joy and as often roaring with laughter no less than four observers have seen their eyes freely watering on such occasions and in one instance the tears rolled down their cheeks mr bulmer a missionary in a remote part of victoria remarks that they have a keen sense of the ridiculous they are excellent mimics and when one of them is able to imitate the peculiarities of some absent member of the tribe it is very common to hear all in the camp convulsed with laughter with europeans hardly anything excites laughter so easily as mimicry and it is rather curious to find the same fact with the savages of australia who constitute one of the most distinct races in the world in southern africa with the two tribes of kaffirs especially with the women their eyes often fill with tears during laughter gaika the brother of the chief sandili answered my query on this bead with the words yes that is their common practice sir andrew smith has seen the painted face of a hottentot woman all furred with tears after a fit of laughter in northern africa with the abyssinians tears are secreted under the same circumstances lastly in north america the same fact has been observed in a remarkably savage and isolated tribe but chiefly with the women in another tribe it was observed only on a single occasion excessive laughter as before remarked graduate into moderate laughter in this later case the muscles round the eyes are much less contracted and there is little or no frowning between a gentle laugh and a broad smile there is hardly any difference excepting that in smiling no reiterated sound is uttered though a single rather strong expiration or slight noise a rudiment of a laugh may often be heard at the commencement of a smile on a moderately smiling countenance the contraction of the upper orbicular muscles can still just be traced by a slight lowering of the eyebrows the contraction of the lower orbicular and palpebral muscles is much plainer and is shown by the wrinkling of the lower eyelids and of the skin beneath them together with a slight drawing up of the upper lip from the broadest smile we pass by the finest steps into the gentlest one in this later case the features are moved in a much less degree and much more slowly and the mouth is kept closed the curvature of the nasolabial furrow is also slightly different in the two cases we thus see that no abrupt line of demarcation can be drawn between the movement of the features during the most violent laughter and a very faint smile a smile therefore may be said to be the first stage in the development of a laugh but a different and more probable view may be suggested namely that the habit of uttering 
low, reiterated sounds from a sense of pleasure first led to the retraction of the corners of the mouth and of the upper lip and to the contraction of the orbicular muscles and that now through association and long continued habit the same muscles are brought into slight play whenever any cause excites in us a feeling which if stronger would have led to laughter and the result is a smile whether we look at laughter as the full development of a smile or as is more probable at the gentle smile as the last trace of a habit firmly fixed during many generations of laughing whenever we are joyful we can follow in our infants the gradual passage of the one into the other it is well known to those who have the charge of young infants that it is difficult to feel sure when certain movements about their mouths are really expressive that is when they really smile hence i carefully watched my own infants one of them at the age of forty-five days and being at the time in a happy frame of mind smiled that is the corners of the mouth were retracted and simultaneously the eyes became decidedly bright i observed the same thing on the following day but on the third day the child was not quite well and there was no trace of a smile and this renders it probable that the previous smiles were real eight days subsequently and during the next succeeding week it was remarkable how his eyes brightened whenever he smiled and his nose became at the same time transversely wrinkled this was now accompanied by a little bleating noise which perhaps represented a laugh at the age of a hundred and thirteen days these little noises which were always made during expiration assume a slightly different character and were more broken and interrupted as in sobbing and this was certainly incipient laughter the change in tone seemed to me at the time to be connected with the greater lateral extension of the mouth as the smiles became broader in a second infant the first real smile was observed at about the same age viz forty-five days and in a third at a somewhat earlier age the second infant when sixty-five days old smiled much more broadly and plainly than did the one first mentioned at the same age and even at this early age uttered noises very like laughter in this gradual acquirement by infants of the habit of laughing we have a case in some degree analogous to that of weeping as practice is requisite with the ordinary movements of the body such as walking so it seems to be with laughing and weeping the art of screamings on the other hand from being of service to infants has become finely developed Section 16 of the Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Trong in Houston, Texas. The Expression of the Emotion in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin. Chapter 8. Joy high spirits love tender feelings devotion part two high spirits cheerfulness a man in high spirits though he may not actually smile commonly exhibits some tendency to the retraction of the corners of his mouth from the excitement of pleasure the circulation becomes more rapid the eyes are bright and the color of the face rises the brain being stimulated by the increased flow of blood reacts on the mental powers lively ideas pass still more rapidly through the mind and the affections are warmed i heard a child a little under four years old when asked what was meant by being in good spirits answer it is laughing talking and kissing it would be difficult to give a truer or more practical definition a man in this state holds his body erect his head upright and his eyes open there is no drooping of the features 
and no contraction of the eyebrows on the contrary the frontal muscle as moreau observes tends to contract slightly and this smooths the brow removes every trace of a frown arches the eyebrows a little and raises the eyelids hence the latin phrase exporigare frontem to unwrinkle the brow means to be cheerful or merry the whole expression of a man in good spirits is exactly the opposite of that of one suffering from sorrow according to sir c bell in all the exhilarating emotions the eyebrows eyelids the nostrils and the angles of the mouth are raised in the depressing passions it is the reverse under the influence of the later the brow is heavy the eyelids cheeks mouth and whole head droop the eyes are dull and the countenance pallid and the respiration slow in joy the face expands in grief it lengthens whether the principle of antithesis has here come into play in producing these opposite expressions in aid of the direct causes which have been specified and which are sufficiently plain i will not pretend to say with all the races of man the expression of good spirit appears to be the same and is easily recognized my informants from various parts of the old and new worlds answer in the affirmative to my queries on this head and they give some particulars with respect to hindus malays and new zealanders the brightness of the eyes of the australians has struck four observers and the same fact has been noticed with the hindus new zealanders and the diaz of borneo savages sometimes express their satisfaction not only by smiling but by gestures derived from the pleasure of eating thus mr wedgwood quotes patherick that the negroes on the upper nile began a general rubbing of their bellies when he displayed his beads and lightheart says that the australians smack and clap their mouths at the sight of his horses and bullocks and more especially of his kangaroo dogs the greenlanders when they affirm anything with pleasure suck down air with a certain sound and this may be an imitation of the act of swallowing savoury food laughter is suppressed by the firm contraction of the orbicular muscles of the mouth which prevents the great zygomatic and other muscles from drawing the lips backwards and upwards the lower lip is also sometimes held by the teeth and this gives a roguish expression to the face as was observed with the blind and deaf laura brickman the great zygomatic muscle is sometimes variable in its course and i have seen a young woman in whom the depressores anguli ores were brought into strong action in suppressing a smile but this by no means gave to her countenance a melancholy expression owing to the brightness of her eyes laughter is frequently employed in a forced manner to conceal or mask some other state of mind even anger we often see persons laughing in order to conceal their shame or shyness when a person purses up his mouth as if to prevent the possibility of a smile though there is nothing to excite one or nothing to prevent its free indulgence an affected solemn or pedantic expression is given but of such hybrid expressions nothing more need here be said in the case of derision a real or pretended smile or laugh is often blended with the expression proper to contempt and this may pass into angry contempt or scorn in such cases the meaning of the laugh or smile is to show the offending person that he excites only amusement love tender feelings although the emotion of love for instance that of a mother for her infant is one of the strongest of which the mind is capable it can hardly be said to have any proper or peculiar means of expression and this is intelligible as it has not habitually led to any special line of action no doubt as affection is pleasurable sensation it generally causes a gentle smile and some brightening of the eyes 
a strong desire to touch the beloved person is commonly felt and love is expressed by this means more plainly than by any other hence we long to clasp in our arms those whom we tenderly love we probably owe this desire to inherited habit in association with the nursing and tending of our children and with the mutual caresses of lovers with the lower animals we see the same principle of pleasure derived from contact in association with love dogs and cats manifestly take pleasure in rubbing against their master and mistresses and in being rubbed or patted by them many kinds of monkeys as i am assured by the keepers in the zoological gardens delight in fondling and being fondled by each other and by persons to whom they are attached mr barlett has described to me the behavior of two chimpanzees rather older animals than those generally imported into this country when they were first brought together they sat opposite touching each other with their much protruded lips and the one put his hand on the shoulder of the other they then mutually folded each other in their arms afterwards they stood up each with one arm on the shoulder of the other lifted up their heads opened their mouths and yelled with delight we europeans are so accustomed to kissing as a mark of affection that it might be thought to be innate in mankind but this is not the case steele was mistaken when he said nature was its author and it began with the first courtship jemmy button a fugian told me that this practice was unknown in his land it is equally unknown with the new zealanders tahitians papuans australians samals of africa and the eskimo but it is so far innate or natural that it apparently depends on pleasure from close contact with a beloved person and it is replaced with various parts of the world by the rubbing of noses as with the new zealanders and the laplanders by the rubbing or patting of the arms breasts or stomachs or by one man striking his own face with the hands or feet of another perhaps a practice of blowing as a mark of affection on various parts of the body may depend on the same principle the feelings which are called tender are difficult to analyze they seem to be compounded of affection joy and especially of sympathy these feelings are in themselves of a pleasurable nature excepting when pity is too deep or horror is aroused as in hearing of a tortured man or animal they are remarkable under our present point of view from so readily exciting the secretions of tears many a father and son have wept on meeting after a long separation especially if the meeting has been unexpected no doubt extreme joy by itself tends to act on the lacrimal glands but on such occasions as the foregoing vague thoughts of the grief which would have been felt had the father and son never met will probably have passed through their minds and the grief naturally leads to the secretions of tears thus on the return of ulysses telemachus rose and clung weeping around his father's breast there the pent grief reigned over them yearning thus thus piteously they wailed in sore unrest and on their weepings had gone down the day but that at last telemachus found words to say worsley's translation of the odyssey book sixteen so again when penelope at last recognized her husband then from her eyelids the quick tears did start and she ran to him from her place and threw her arms about his neck and a warm dew of kisses poured upon him and thus spake book twenty three the vivid recollection of our former home or of a long past happy days readily causes the eyes to be suffused with tears but here again the thought naturally occurs that these days will never return in such cases we may be said to sympathize with ourselves in our present in comparison with our former state 
sympathy with the distresses of others even with the imaginary distresses of a heroine in a pathetic story for whom we feel no affection readily excites tears so does sympathy with the happiness of others as with that of a lover at last successful after many hard trials in a well-told tale sympathy appears to constitute a separate or distinct emotion and it is especially apt to excite the lacrimal glands this holds good whether we give or receive sympathy every one must have noticed how readily children burst out crying if we pity them for some small hurt with the melancholic insane as dr critton brown informs me a kind word will often plunge them into unrestrained weeping as soon as we express our pity for the grief of a friend tears often come into our own eyes the feeling of sympathy is commonly explained by assuming that when we see or hear of suffering in another the idea of suffering is called up so vividly in our own minds that we ourselves suffer but this explanation is hardly sufficient for it does not account for the intimate alliance between sympathy and affection we undoubtedly sympathize far more deeply with a beloved than with an indifferent person and the sympathy of the one gives us far more relief than that of the other yet assuredly we can sympathize with those for whom we feel no affection why suffering when actually experienced by ourselves excites weeping has been discussed in a former chapter with respect to joy its natural and universal expression is laughter and with all the races of man loud laughter leads to the secretions of tears more freely than does any other cause excepting distress the suffusion of the eyes with tears which undoubtedly occurs under great joy though there is no laughter can as it seems to me be explained through habit and association on the same principles as the effusions of tears from grief although there is no screaming nevertheless it is not a little remarkable that sympathy with the distresses of others should excite tears more freely than our own distress and this certainly is the case many a man from whose eyes no suffering of his own could wring a tear has shed tears at the sufferings of a beloved friend it is still more remarkable that sympathy with the happiness or good fortune of those whom we tenderly love should lead to the same result while a similar happiness felt by ourselves would leave our eyes dry we should however bear in mind that the long-continued habit of restraint which is so powerful in checking the free flow of tears from bodily pain has not been brought into play in preventing a moderate effusion of tears in sympathy with the sufferings or happiness of others music has a wonderful power as i have elsewhere attempted to show of recalling in a vague and indefinite manner those strong emotions which were felt during long past ages when as is probable our early progenitors courted each other by the aid of vocal tones and as several of our strongest emotions grief great joy love and sympathy lead to the free secretions of tears it is not surprising that music should be apt to cause our eyes to become suffused with tears especially when we are already softened by any of the tenderer feelings music often produces another peculiar effect we know that every strong sensation emotion or excitement extreme pain rage terror joy or the passion of love all have a special tendency to cause the muscles to tremble and a thrill and slight shiver which runs down the backbone and limbs of many persons when they are powerfully affected by music seems to bear the same relation to the above trembling of the body as a slight suffusion of tears from the power of music does to weeping from any strong and real emotion devotion as devotion is 
in some degree related to affection, though mainly consisting of reverence, often combined with fear, the expression of this state of mind may here be briefly noticed. With some sects, both past and present, religion and love have been strangely combined, and it has been even maintained, lamentable as the fact may be, that the holy kiss of love differs but little from that which a man bestows on a woman, or a woman on a man. Devotion is chiefly expressed by the face being directed towards the heavens, with the eyeballs upturned. Sir Seabell remarks that, at the approach of sleep, or of a fainting fit, or of death, the pupils are drawn upwards and inwards. And he believes that when we are wrapped in devotional feelings and outward impressions are unheeded, the eyes are raised by an action neither taught nor acquired, and that this is due to the same cause as in the above cases. That the eyes are upturned during sleep is, as I hear from Professor Donders, certain. With babies, while sucking their mother's breast, this movement of the eyeballs often gives to them an observed appearance of ecstatic delight, and here it may be clearly perceived that a struggle is going on against the position naturally assumed during sleep. But Sir Seabell's explanation of the fact, which rests on the assumption that certain muscles are more under the control of the will than the others, is, as I hear from Professor Donders, incorrect. As the eyes are often turned up in prayer, without the mind being so much absorbed in thought as to approach to the unconsciousness of sleep, the movement is probably a conventional one, the result of the common belief that heaven, the source of divine power to which we pray, is seated above us. A humbling kneeling posture with the hands upturned and palms joined appears to us from long habit, a gesture so appropriate to devotion that it might be thought to be innate, but I have not met with any evidence to this effect with the various extra-European races of mankind. During the classical period of Roman history, it does not appear, as I hear from an excellent classic, that the hands were thus joined during prayer. Mr. Rensley Wedgwood has apparently given the true explanation, though this implies that the attitude is one of slavish subjection. When the suppliant kneels and holds up his hands with the palms joined, he represents a captive who proves the completeness of his submission by offering up his hands to be bound by the victor. It is the pictorial representation of a Latin dare manus to signify submission. Hence, it is not probable that either the uplifting of the eyes or the joining of the open hands under the influence of devotional feelings are innate or truly expressive actions. And this could hardly have been expected, for it is very doubtful whether feelings such as we should now rank as devotional, affected the hearts of men, while they remain during past ages in an uncivilized condition. Section 17 of the Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Graymore. The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin. Chapter 9. Reflection, Meditation, Ill-Temper, Sulkiness, determination the actor frowning reflection with an effort or with the perception of something difficult or disagreeable abstracted meditation ill temper moroseness obstinacy sulkiness and pouting decision or determination the firm closure of the mouth 
the corrugators by their contraction lower the eyebrows and bring them together producing vertical furrows on the forehead that is a frown sir c bell who erroneously thought that the corrugator was peculiar to man ranks it as the most remarkable muscle of the human face it knits the eyebrows with an energetic effort which unaccountably but irresistibly conveys the idea of mind or as he elsewhere says when the eyebrows are knit energy of mind is apparent and there is the mingling of thought and emotion with the savage and brutal rage of the mere animal there is much truth in these remarks but hardly the whole truth dr duchesne has called the corrugator the muscle of reflection but this name without some limitation cannot be considered as quite correct a man may be absorbed in the deepest thought and his brow will remain smooth until he encounters some obstacle in his train of reasoning or is interrupted by some disturbance and then a frown passes like a shadow over his brow a half-starved man may think intently how to obtain food but he probably will not frown unless he encounters either in thought or action some difficulty or finds the food when obtained nauseous i have noticed that almost every one instantly frowns if he perceives a strange or bad taste in what he is eating i asked several persons without explaining my object to listen intently to a very gentle tapping sound the nature and source of which they all perfectly knew and not one frowned but a man who joined us and who could not conceive what we were all doing in profound silence when asked to listen frowned much though not in an ill temper and said he could not in the least understand what we all wanted dr peter eat who has published remarks to the same effect adds that stammerers generally frown in speaking and that a man in doing even so trifling a thing as pulling on a boot frowns if he finds it too tight some persons are such habitual frowners that the mere effort of speaking almost always causes their brows to contract men of all races frown when they are in any way perplexed in thought as i infer from the answers which i have received to my queries but i framed them badly confounding absorbed meditation with perplexed reflection nevertheless it is clear that the australians malays hindus and kaffirs of south africa frown when they are puzzled dobertsoffer remarks that the guaranis of south america on like occasions knit their brows from these considerations we may conclude that frowning is not the expression of simple reflection however profound or of attention however close but of something difficult or displeasing encountered in a train of thought or in action deep reflection can however seldom be long carried on without some difficulty so that it will generally be accompanied by a frown hence it is that frowning commonly gives to the countenance as sir c bell remarks an aspect of intellectual energy but in order that this effect may be produced the eyes must be clear and steady or they may be cast downwards as often occurs in deep thought the countenance must not be otherwise disturbed as in the case of an ill-tempered or peevish man or of one who shows the effects of prolonged suffering with dulled eyes and drooping jaw or who perceives a bad taste in his food or who finds it difficult to perform some trifling act such as threading a needle in these cases a frown may often be seen but it will be accompanied by some other expression which will entirely prevent the countenance having an appearance of intellectual energy or of profound thought we may now inquire how it is that a frown should express the perception of something difficult or disagreeable either in thought or action in the same way as naturalists find it advisable to trace the embryological development of an organ in order fully to understand its structure so with the movements of expression it is advisable to follow as nearly as possible the same plan the earliest and almost sole expression seen during the first days of infancy and then often exhibited is that displayed during the act of screaming and screaming is excited both at first and for some afterwards 
by every distressing or displeasing sensation and emotion, by hunger, pain, anger, jealousy, fear, etc. At such times the muscles round the eyes are strongly contracted, and this, as I believe, explains to a large extent the act of frowning during the remainder of our lives. I repeatedly observed my own infants, from under the age of one week to that of two or three months, and found that when a screaming fit came on gradually, the first sign was the contraction of the corrugators, which produced a slight frown, quickly followed by the contraction of the other muscles round the eyes. When an infant is uncomfortable or unwell, little frowns, as I record in my notes, may be seen incessantly passing like shadows over its face. These being generally, but not always, followed sooner or later by a crying fit. For instance, I watched for some time a baby, between seven and eight weeks old, sucking some milk which was cold and therefore displeasing to him, and a steady little frown was maintained all the time. This was never developed into an actual crying fit, though occasionally every stage of close approach could be observed. As the habit of contracting the brows has been followed by infants during innumerable generations, at the commencement of every crying or screaming fit, it has been firmly associated with the incipient sense of something distressing or disagreeable. Hence, under similar circumstances, it would be apt to be continued during maturity, although never then developed into a crying fit. Screaming or weeping begins to be voluntarily restrained at an early period of life, whereas frowning is hardly ever restrained at any age. It is perhaps worth notice that with children much given to weeping, anything which perplexes their minds, and which would cause most other children merely to frown, readily makes them weep. So with certain classes of the insane, any effort of mind, however slight, which with an habitual frowner would cause a slight frown, leads to their weeping in an unrestrained manner. It is not more surprising that the habit of contracting the brows at the first perception of something distressing, although gained during infancy, should be retained during the rest of our lives, than that many other associated habits acquired at an early age should be permanently retained both by man and the lower animals. For instance, full-grown cats, when feeling warm and comfortable, often retain the habit of alternately protruding their forefeet with extended toes, which habit they practiced for a definite purpose whilst suckling their mothers. Another and distinct cause has probably strengthened the habit of frowning whenever the mind is intent on any subject and encounters some difficulty. Vision is the most important of all senses, and during primeval times the closest attention must have been incessantly directed towards distant objects for the sake of obtaining prey and avoiding danger. I remember being struck whilst travelling in parts of South America, which were dangerous from the presence of Indians, how incessantly, yet as it appeared unconsciously, the half-wild gauchos closely scanned the whole horizon. Now when any one with no covering on his head, as must have been aboriginally the case with mankind, strives to the utmost to distinguish in broad daylight, and especially if the sky is bright, a distant object, he almost invariably contracts his brows to prevent the entrance of too much light, the lower eyelids, cheeks, and upper lip being at the same time raised, so as to lessen the orifice of the eyes. I have purposely asked several persons, young and old, to look, under the above circumstances, at distant objects, making them believe that I only wished to test the power of their vision, and they all behaved in the manner just described. Some of them also put their open, flat hands over their eyes to keep out the excess of light. Gratiolet, after making some remarks to nearly the same effect, says, Ce sont là des attitudes de vision difficile. He concludes that the muscles round the eyes contract partly for the sake of excluding too much light, which appears to me the more important end, and partly to prevent all rays striking the retina, except those which come directly from the object that is scrutinized. Mr. Bowman, whom I consulted on this point, thinks that the contraction of the surrounding muscles may, 
in addition, partly sustain the consensual movements of the two eyes, by giving a firmer support while the globes are brought to binocular vision by their own proper muscles. As the effort of viewing with care under a bright light a distant object is both difficult and irksome, and as this effort has been habitually accompanied during numberless generations by the contraction of the eyebrows, the habit of frowning will thus have been much strengthened. Although it was originally practiced during infancy from quite an independent cause, namely as the first step in the protection of the eyes during screaming, there is indeed much analogy, as far as the state of mind is concerned, between intently scrutinizing a distant object and following out an obscure train of thought, or performing some little and troublesome mechanical work. The belief that the habit of contracting the brows is continued when there is no need whatever to exclude too much light, receives support from the cases formerly alluded to, in which the eyebrows or eyelids are acted on under certain circumstances in a useless manner, from having been similarly used under analogous circumstances for a serviceable purpose. For instance, we voluntarily close our eyes when we do not wish to see any object, and we are apt to close them when we reject a proposition, as if we could not or would not see it, or when we think about something horrible. We raise our eyebrows when we wish to see quickly all around us, and we often do the same when we earnestly desire to remember something, acting as if we endeavored to see it. Abstraction Meditation When a person is lost in thought with his mind absent, or, as is sometimes said, when he is in a brown study, he does not frown, but his eyes appear vacant. The lower eyelids are generally raised and wrinkled in the same manner as when a short-sighted person tries to distinguish a distant object, and the upper orbicular muscles are at the same time slightly contracted. The wrinkling of the lower eyelids under these circumstances has been observed with some savages, as by Mr. Dyson Lacey with the Australians of Queensland, and several times by Mr. Geach with the Malays of the interior of Malacca. What the meaning or cause of this action may be cannot at present be explained, but here we have another instance of movement round the eyes in relation to the state of the mind. The vacant expression of the eyes is very peculiar, and at once shows when a man is completely lost in thought. Professor Donders has, with his usual kindness, investigated this subject for me. He has observed others in this condition, and has been himself observed by Professor Engelman. The eyes are not then fixed on any object, and therefore not, as I have imagined, on some distant object. The lines of vision of the two eyes even often become slightly divergent. The divergence, if the head be held vertically, with the plane of vision horizontal, amounting to an angle of two degrees as a maximum. This was ascertained by observing the crossed double image of a distant object. When the head droops forward, as often occurs with a man absorbed in thought, owing to the general relaxation of his muscles, if the plane of vision be still horizontal, the eyes are necessarily a little turned upwards, and then the divergence is as much as three degrees, or three degrees five minutes. If the eyes are turned still more upwards, it amounts to between six degrees and seven degrees. Professor Donders attributes this divergence to the almost complete relaxation of certain muscles of the eyes, which would be apt to follow from the mind being wholly absorbed. The active condition of the muscles of the eyes is that of convergence, and Professor Donders remarks, as bearing on their divergence during a period of complete abstraction, that when one eye becomes blind, it almost always, after a short lapse of time, deviates outwards, for its muscles are no longer used in moving the eyeball inwards for the sake of binocular vision. Perplexed reflection is often accompanied by certain movements or gestures. At such times we commonly raise our hands to our foreheads, mouths, or chins, but we do not act thus, as far as I have seen, when we are quite lost in meditation, and no difficulty is encountered. Plotus, describing one of his plays, A Puzzled Man, says, Now look, he has pillared his chin upon his hand. 
even so trifling and apparently unmeaning a gesture as the raising of the hand to the face has been observed with some savages j mansell wheel has seen it with the kaffirs of south africa and the native chief gaika adds that men then sometimes pull their beards mr washington matthews who attended to some of the wildest tribes of indians in the western regions of the united states remarks that he has seen them when concentrating their thoughts bring their hands usually the thumb and index finger in contact with some part of the face commonly the upper lip we can understand why the forehead should be pressed or rubbed as deep thought tries the brain but why the hand should be raised to the mouth or face is far from clear ill temper we have seen that frowning is the natural expression of some difficulty encountered or of something disagreeable experienced either in thought or action and he whose mind is often and readily affected in this way will be apt to be ill-tempered or slightly angry or peevish and will commonly show it by frowning but a cross expression due to a frown may be counteracted if the mouth appears sweet from being habitually drawn into a smile and the eyes are bright and cheerful so it will be if the eye is clear and steady and there is the appearance of earnest reflection frowning with some depression or the corners of the mouth which is a sign of grief gives an air of peevishness if a child frowns much whilst crying but does not strongly contract in the usual manner the orbicular muscles a well-marked expression of anger or even rage together with misery is displayed if the whole frowning brow be drawn much downward by the contraction of the pyramidal muscles of the nose which produces transverse wrinkles or folds across the base of the nose the expression becomes one of moroseness duchene believes that the contraction of this muscle without any frowning gives the appearance of extreme and aggressive hardness but I much doubt whether this is a true or natural expression. I have shown Duchesne's photograph of a young man with his muscles strongly contracted by means of galvanism to eleven persons, including some artists, and none of them could form an idea what was intended, except one, a girl, who answered correctly, Surely reserve. When I first looked at this photograph, knowing what was intended, my imagination added, as I believe what was necessary, namely a frowning brow, and consequently the expression appeared to me true and extremely morose. A firmly closed mouth, in addition to a lowered and frowning brow, gives determination to the expression, or may make it obstinate and sullen. How it comes that the firm closure of the mouth gives the appearance of determination will presently be discussed. An expression of sullen obstinacy has been clearly recognized by my informants in the natives of six different regions of Australia. It is well marked, according to Mr. Scott, with the Hindus. It has been recognized with the Malays, Chinese, Kaffirs, Abyssinians, and in a conspicuous degree, according to Dr. Rothrock, with the wild Indians of North America, and according to Mr. D. Forbes, with the Amara of Bolivia. I have also observed it with the Arocano of southern Chile. Mr. Dyson Lacey remarks that the natives of Australia, when in this frame of mind, sometimes fold their arms across their breasts, an attitude which may be seen with us. A firm determination amounting to obstinacy is, also, sometimes expressed by both shoulders being kept raised, the meaning of which gesture will be explained in the following chapter. With young children, sulkiness is shown by pouting, or, as it is sometimes called, making a snout. When the corners of the mouth are much depressed, the lower lip is a little everted and protruded, and this is likewise called a pout. But the pouting here referred to consists of the protrusion of both lips into a tubular form, sometimes to such an extent as to project as far as the end of the nose, if this be short. Pouting is generally accompanied by frowning, and sometimes by the utterance of a booing or hooing noise. This expression is remarkable, as almost the sole one, as far as I know, which is exhibited much more plainly during childhood, at least with Europeans, than during maturity. 
there is however some tendency to the protrusion of the lips with the adults of all races under the influence of great rage some children pout when they are shy and they can then hardly be called sulky from inquiries which i have made in several large families pouting does not seem very common with european children but it prevails throughout the world and must be common and strongly marked with most savage races as it has caught the attention of many observers it has been noticed in eight different districts of australia and one of my informants remarks how greatly the lips of children are then protruded two observers have seen pouting with the children of hindus three with those of kaffirs and fingos of south africa and with the hottentots and two with the children of the wild indians of north america pouting has also been observed with the chinese abyssinians malays of malacca dyaks of borneo and often with the new zealanders mr mansell wheel informs me that he has seen the lips much protruded not only with the children of the kaffirs but with the adults of both sexes when sulky and mr stack has sometimes observed the same thing with the men and very frequently with the women of new zealand a trace of the same expression may occasionally be detected even with adult europeans we thus see that the protrusion of the lips especially with young children is characteristic of sulkiness throughout the greater part of the world this movement apparently results from the retention chiefly during youth of a primordial habit or from an occasional reversion to it young orangs and chimpanzees protrude their lips to an extraordinary degree as described in a former chapter when they are discontented somewhat angry or sulky also when they are surprised a little frightened and even when slightly pleased their mouths are protruded apparently for the sake of making the various noises proper to these several states of mind and its shape as i observed with the chimpanzee differed slightly when the cry of pleasure and that of anger were uttered as soon as these animals became enraged the shape of the mouth wholly changes and the teeth are exposed the adult orang when wounded is said to emit a singular cry consisting at first of high notes which at length deepen into a low roar while giving out the high note he thrusts out his lips into a funnel shape but in uttering the low notes he holds his mouth wide open with the gorilla the lower lip is said to be capable of great elongation if then our semi-human progenitors protruded their lips when sulky or a little angered in the same manner as do the existing anthropoid apes it is not an anomalous though a curious fact that our children should exhibit when similarly affected a trace of the same expression together with some tendency to utter a noise for it is not at all unusual for animals to retain more or less perfectly during early youth and subsequently to lose characters which were aboriginally possessed by their adult progenitors and which are still retained by distinct species their near relations nor is it an anomalous fact that the children of savages should exhibit a stronger tendency to protrude their lips when sulky than the children of civilized europeans for the essence of savagery seems to consist in the retention of a primordial condition and this occasionally holds good even with bodily peculiarities it may be objected to this view of the origin of pouting that the anthropoid apes likewise protrude their lips when astonished and even when a little pleased whilst with us this expression is generally confined to a sulky frame of mind but we shall see in a future chapter that with men of various races surprise does sometimes lead to a slight protrusion of the lips though great surprise or astonishment is more commonly shown by the mouth being widely opened as when we smile or laugh we draw back the corners of the mouth we have lost any tendency to protrude the lips when pleased if indeed our early progenitors thus expressed pleasure a little gesture made by sulky children may here be noticed namely their showing a cold shoulder this has a different meaning as i believe from the keeping both shoulders raised a cross child sitting on its parent's knee will lift up the near shoulder then jerk it away as if from a caress and afterwards give a backward push with it as if to push away the offender 
I have seen a child standing at some distance from anyone clearly express its feelings by raising one shoulder, giving it a little backward movement, and then turning away its whole body. Decision or Determination The firm closure of the mouth tends to give an expression of determination or decision to the countenance. No determined man probably ever had an habitually gaping mouth. Hence also a small and weak lower jaw, which seems to indicate that the mouth is not habitually and firmly closed, is commonly thought to be characteristic of feebleness of character. A prolonged effort of any kind, whether of body or mind, implies previous determination. And if it can be shown that the mouth is generally closed with firmness before and during a great and continued exertion of the muscular system, then, through the principle of association, the mouth would almost certainly be closed as soon as any determined resolution was taken. Now several observers have noticed that a man, in commencing any violent muscular effort, invariably first distends his lungs with air, and then compresses it by the strong contraction of the muscles of the chest, and to effect this the mouth must be firmly closed. Moreover, as soon as the man is compelled to draw breath, he still keeps his chest as much distended as possible. Various causes have been assigned for this manner of acting. Sir C. Bell maintains that the chest is distended with air and is kept distended at such times in order to give a fixed support to the muscles which are thereto attached. Hence, as he remarks, when two men are engaged in a deadly contest, a terrible silence prevails, broken only by hard, stifled breathing. There is silence, because to expel the air in the utterance of any sound would be to relax the support for the muscles of the arms. If an outcry is heard, supposing the struggle to take place in the dark, we at once know that one of the two has given up in despair. Gratiolet admits that when a man has to struggle with another to his utmost, or has to support a great weight, or to keep for a long time the same forced attitude, it is necessary for him first to make a deep inspiration, and then to cease breathing. But he thinks that Sir C. Bell's explanation is erroneous. He maintains that arrested respiration retards the circulation of the blood, of which I believe there is no doubt, and he adduces some curious evidence from the structure of the lower animals, showing, on the one hand, that a retarded circulation is necessary for prolonged muscular exertion, and on the other hand, that a rapid circulation is necessary for rapid movements. According to this view, when we commence any great exertion, we close our mouths and stop breathing, in order to retard the circulation of the blood. Gratiolet sums up the subject by saying, C'est là la vraie théorie de l'effort continu. But how far this theory is admitted by other psychologists, I do not know. Dr. Piederit accounts for the firm closure of the mouth during strong muscular exertion on the principle that the influence of the will spreads to other muscles besides those necessarily brought into action in making any particular exertion and it is natural that the muscles of respiration and of the mouth, from being so habitually used, should be especially liable to be thus acted on. It appears to me that there probably is some truth in this view, for we are apt to press the teeth hard together during violent exertion, and this is not requisite to prevent expiration, whilst the muscles of the chest are strongly contracted. Lastly, when a man has to perform some delicate and difficult operation, not requiring the exertion of any strength, he nevertheless generally closes his mouth and ceases for a time to breathe. But he acts thus in order that the movements of his chest may not disturb those of his arms. A person, for instance, whilst threading a needle, may be seen to compress his lips and either to stop breathing or to breathe as quietly as possible. So it was, as formerly stated, with a young and sick chimpanzee, whilst it amused itself by killing flies with its knuckles as they buzzed about on the window panes. To perform an action, however trifling, if difficult, implies some amount of previous determination. 
there appears nothing improbable in all the above assigned causes having come into play in different degrees either conjointly or separately on various occasions the result would be a well-established habit now perhaps inherited of firmly closing the mouth at the commencement of and during any violent and prolonged exertion or any delicate operation through the principle of association there would also be a strong tendency towards the same habit as soon as the mind had resolved on any particular action or line of conduct even before there was any bodily exertion or if none were requisite the habitual and firm closure of the mouth would thus come to show decision of character and decision readily passes into Section 18 of The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avahi in May 2016. The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin. Chapter 10 hatred and anger hatred rage effects off on the system uncovering of the teeth rage in the insane anger and indignation as expressed by the various races of man sneering and defiance the uncovering of the canine tooth on one side of the face if we have suffered or expect to suffer some willful injury from a man or if he is in any way offensive to us we dislike him and dislike easily rises into hatred such feelings if experienced in a moderate degree are not clearly expressed by any movement of the body or features excepting perhaps by a certain gravity of behavior or by some ill temper few individuals however can long reflect about a hated person without feeling and exhibiting signs of indignation or rage but if the offending person be quite insignificant we experience merely disdain or contempt if on the other hand he is all-powerful then hatred passes into terror as when a slave thinks about a cruel master or a savage about a bloodthirsty malignant deity most of our emotions are so closely connected with their expression that they hardly exist if the body remains passive the nature of the expression depending in chief part on the nature of the actions which have been habitually performed under this particular state of the mind a man for instance may know that his life is in the extremest peril and may strongly desire to save it yet as louis the sixteenth said when surrounded by a fierce mob am i afraid feel my pulse so a man may intensely hate another but until his bodily frame is affected he cannot be said to be enraged rage i have already had occasion to treat of this emotion in the third chapter when discussing the direct influence of the excited sensorium on the body in combination with the effects of habitually associated actions rage exhibits itself in the most diversified manner the heart and circulation are always affected the face reddens or becomes purple with the veins on the forehead and neck distended the reddening of the skin has been observed with the copper-colored indians of south america and even as it is said on the white cicatrices left by old wounds on negroes monkeys also redden from passion with one of my own infants under four months old i repeatedly observed that the first symptom of an approaching passion was the rushing of the blood into his bare scalp on the other hand the action of the heart is sometimes so much impeded by great rage that the countenance becomes pallid or livid and not a few men with heart disease have dropped down dead under this powerful emotion the respiration is likewise affected 
the chest heaves and the dilated nostrils quiver as tennyson writes sharp breaths of anger puffed her fairy nostrils out hence we have such expressions as breathing out vengeance and fuming with anger the excited brain gives strength to the muscles and at the same time energy to the will the body is commonly held erect ready for instant action but sometimes it is bent forward towards the offending person with the limbs more or less rigid the mouth is generally closed with firmness showing fixed determination and the teeth are clenched or ground together such gestures as the rising of the arms with the fists clenched as if to strike the offender are common few men in a great passion and telling someone to be gone can resist acting as if they intended to strike or push the man violently away the desire indeed to strike often becomes so intolerably strong that inanimate objects are struck or dashed to the ground but the gestures frequently become altogether purposeless or frantic young children when in a violent rage roll on the ground on their backs or bellies screaming kicking scratching or biting everything within reach so it is as i hear from mr scott with hindu children and as we have seen with the young of the anthropomorphous apes but the muscular system is often affected in a wholly different way for trembling is a frequent consequence of extreme rage the paralyzed lips then refuse to obey the will and the voice sticks in the throat or it is rendered loud harsh and discordant if there be much and rapid speaking the mouth froths the hair sometimes bristles but i shall return to this subject in another chapter when i treat of the mingled emotions of rage and terror there is in most cases a strongly marked frown on the forehead for this follows from the sense of anything displeasing or difficult together with concentration of mind but sometimes the brow instead of being much contracted and lowered remains smooth with the glaring eyes kept widely open the eyes are always bright or may as homer expresses it glisten with fire they are sometimes bloodshot and are said to protrude from their sockets the result no doubt of the head being gorged with blood as shown by the veins being distended according to gratiolet the pupils are always contracted in rage and i hear from dr crichton brown that this is the case in the fierce delirium of meningitis but the movements of the iris under the influence of the different emotions is a very obscure subject shakespeare sums up the chief characteristics of rage as follows Quote, in peace there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility but when the blast of war blows in our ears then imitate the action of the tiger stiffen the sinews summon up the blood then lend the eye a terrible aspect now set the teeth and stretch the nostril wide hold hard the breath and bend up every spirit to his full height on on you noblest english End quote. from henry the fourth act three scene one the lips are sometimes protruded during rage in a manner the meaning of which i do not understand unless it depends on our descent from some ape-like animal instances have been observed not only with europeans but with the australians and hindus the lips however are much more commonly retracted the grinning or clenched teeth being thus exposed this has been noticed by almost every one who has written on expression the appearance is as if the teeth were uncovered ready for seizing or tearing an enemy though there may be no intention of acting in this manner mr dyson lacy has seen this grinning expression with the australians when quarrelling and so has gaika with the kaffirs of south america dickens in speaking of an atrocious murderer who had just been caught and was surrounded by a furious mob describes the people as jumping up one behind another snarling with their teeth and making at him like wild beasts 
every one who has had much to do with young children must have seen how naturally they take to biting when in a passion it seems as instinctive in them as in young crocodiles who snap their little jaws as soon as they emerge from the egg a grinning expression and the protrusion of the lips appear sometimes to go together a close observer says that he has seen many instances of intense hatred which can hardly be distinguished from rage more or less suppressed in orientals and once in an elderly english woman in all these cases there was a grin not a scowl the lips lengthening the cheeks settling downwards the eyes half closed whilst the brow remained perfectly calm this retraction of the lips and uncovering of the teeth during paroxysms of rage as if to bite the offender is so remarkable considering how seldom the teeth are used by men in fighting that i inquired from dr j crichton brown whether the habit was common in the insane whose passions are unbridled he informs me that he has repeatedly observed it both with the insane and idiotic and has given me the following illustrations shortly before receiving my letter he witnessed an uncontrollable outbreak of anger and delusive jealousy in an insane lady at first she vituperated her husband and whilst doing so foamed at the mouth next she approached close to him with compressed lips and a virulent set frown then she drew back her lips especially the corners of the upper lip and showed her teeth at the same time aiming a vicious blow at him a second case is that of an old soldier who when he is requested to conform to the rules of the establishment gives way to discontent terminating in fury he commonly begins by asking dr brown whether he is not ashamed to treat him in such a manner he then swears and blasphemes paces tip and down tosses his arms wildly about and menaces any one near him at last as his exasperation culminates he rushes up towards dr brown with a peculiar sidelong movement shaking his doubled fist and threatening destruction then his upper lip may be seen to be raised especially at the corners so that his huge canine teeth are exhibited he hisses forth his curses through his set teeth and his whole expression assumes the character of extreme ferocity a similar description is applicable to another man excepting that he generally foams at the mouth and spits dancing and jumping about in a strange rapid manner shrieking out his maledictions in a shrill falsetto voice dr brown also informs me of the case of an epileptic idiot incapable of independent movements and who spends the whole day in playing with some toys but his temper is morose and easily roused into fierceness when any one touches his toys he slowly raises his head from its habitual downward position and fixes his eyes on the offender with a tardy yet angry scowl if the annoyance be repeated he draws back his thick lips and reveals a prominent row of hideous fangs large canines being especially noticeable and then makes a quick and cruel clutch with his open hand at the offending person the rapidity of this clutch as dr brown remarks is marvellous in a being ordinarily so torpid that he takes about fifteen seconds when attracted by any noise to turn his head from one side to the other if when thus incensed a handkerchief book or other article be placed into his hands he drags it to his mouth and bites it mr nicoll has likewise described to me two cases of insane patients whose lips are retracted during paroxysms of rage dr maudsley after detailing various strange animal-like traits in idiots asks whether these are not due to the reappearance of primitive instincts a faint echo from a far distant past testifying to a kinship which man has almost outgrown he adds that as every human brain passes in the course of its development through the same stages as those occurring in the lower vertebrate animals and as the brain of an idiot is in an arrested condition we may presume that it will manifest its most primitive functions and no higher functions 
Dr. Maudsley thinks that the same view may be extended to the brain in its degenerated condition in some insane patients, and asks whence come the savage snarl, the destructive disposition, the obscene language, the wild howl, the offensive habits displayed by some of the insane. Why should a human being, deprived of his reason, ever become so brutal in character, as some do, unless he has the brute nature within him? This question must, as it would appear, be answered in the affirmative. Anger, Indignation These states of the mind differ from rage only in degree, and there is no marked distinction in their characteristic signs. Under moderate anger the action of the heart is a little increased, the colour heightened, and the eyes become bright. The respiration is likewise a little hurried, and as all the muscles serving for this function act in association, the wings of the nostrils are somewhat raised to allow of a free indraught of air, and this is a highly characteristic sign of indignation. The mouth is commonly compressed, and there is almost always a frown on the brow. Instead of the frantic gestures of extreme rage, an indignant man unconsciously throws himself into an attitude ready for attacking or striking his enemy, whom he will perhaps scan from head to foot in defiance. He carries his head erect, with his chest well expanded, and the feet planted firmly on the ground. He holds his arms in various positions, with one or both elbows squared, or with the arms rigidly suspended by his sides. With Europeans the fists are commonly clenched. The figures 1 and 2 in plate 6 are fairly good representations of men simulating indignation. As one may see in a mirror, if he will vividly imagine that he has been insulted and demands an explanation in an angry tone of voice, that he suddenly and unconsciously throws himself into some such attitude. Rage, anger, and indignation are exhibited in nearly the same manner throughout the world, and the following descriptions may be worth giving as evidence of this, and as illustrations of some of the foregoing remarks. There is, however, an exception with respect to clenching the fists, which seems confined chiefly to the men who fight with their fists. With the Australians, only one of my informants has seen the fist clenched. All agree about the body being held erect, and all, with two exceptions, state that the brows are heavily contracted. Some of them allude to the firmly compressed mouth, the distended nostrils, and flashing eyes. According to the Reverend Mr. Taplin, rage, with the Australians, is expressed by the lips being protruded, the eyes being widely open, and, in the case of the women, by their dancing about and casting dust into the air. Another observer speaks of the native men, when enraged, throwing their arms wildly about. I have received similar accounts, except as to the clenching of the fists, in regard to the Malays of the Malacca Peninsula, the Abyssinians, and the natives of South Africa. So it is with the Dakota Indians of North America, and, according to Mr. Matthews, they then hold their hands erect, frown, and often stalk away with long strides. Mr. Bridges states that the Fuegians, when enraged, frequently stamp on the ground, walk distractedly about, sometimes cry and grow pale. The Reverend Mr. Stack watched a New Zealand man and woman quarrelling, and made the following entry in his notebook. Eyes dilated, body swayed violently backwards and forwards, head inclined forwards, fists clenched, now thrown behind the body, now directed towards each other's faces. Mr. Swinhoe says that my description agrees with what he has seen of the Chinese, excepting that an angry man generally inclines his body towards his antagonist, and pointing at him, pours forth a volley of abuse. Lastly, with respect to the natives of India, Mr. J. Scott has sent me a full description of their gestures and expression when enraged. The low-caste Bengalese disputed about a loan. 
at first they were calm but soon grew furious and poured forth the grossest abuse on each other's relations and progenitors for many generations past their gestures were very different from those of europeans for though their chests were expanded and shoulders squared their arms remained rigidly suspended with the elbows turned inwards and the hands alternately clenched and opened their shoulders were often raised high and then again lowered they looked fiercely at each other from under their lowered and strongly wrinkled brows and their protruded lips were firmly closed they approached each other with hands and necks stretched forwards and pushed scratched and grasped at each other this protrusion of the head and body seems a common gesture with the enraged and i have noticed it with degraded english women whilst quarrelling violently in the streets in such cases it may be presumed that neither party expects to receive a blow from the other a bengalee employed in the botanic gardens was accused in the presence of mr scott by the native overseer of having stolen a valuable plant he listened silently and scornfully to the accusation his attitude erect chest expanded mouth closed lips protruding eyes firmly set and penetrating he then defiantly maintained his innocent with upraised and clenched hands his head being now pushed forwards with the eyes widely open and eyebrows raised mr scott also watched two mechis in sikkim quarrelling about their share of payment they soon got into a furious passion and then their bodies became less erect with their heads pushed forwards they made grimaces at each other their shoulders were raised their arms rigidly bent inwards at the elbows and their hands spasmodically closed but not properly clenched they continually approached and retreated from each other and often raised their arms as if to strike but their hands were open and no blow was given mr scott made similar observations of the lepchas whom he often saw quarrelling and he noticed that they kept their arms rigid and almost parallel to their bodies with the hands pushed somewhat backwards and partially closed but not clenched sneering defiance uncovering the canine tooth on one side the expression which i wish here to consider differs but little from that already described when the lips are retracted and the grinning teeth exposed the difference consists solely in the upper lip being retracted in such a manner that the canine tooth on one side of the face alone is shown the face itself being generally a little upturned and half averted from the person causing offence the other signs of rage are not necessarily present this expression may occasionally be observed in a person who sneers at or defies another though there may be no real anger as when any one is playfully accused of some fault and answers i scorn the imputation the expression is not a common one but i have seen it exhibited with perfect distinctness by a lady who was being quizzed by another person it was described by parsons as long ago as seventeen forty six with an engraving showing the uncovered canine on one side mr raylander without my having made any allusion to the subject asked me whether i had ever noticed this expression as he had been much struck by it he has photographed for me plate four figure one a lady who sometimes unintentionally displays the canine on one side and who can do so voluntarily with unusual distinctness the expression of a half playful sneer graduates into one of great ferocity when together with a heavily frowning brow and fierce eye the canine tooth is exposed a bengalee boy was accused before mr scott of some misdeed the delinquent did not dare to give vent to his wrath in words but it was plainly shown on his countenance sometimes by a defiant frown and sometimes by a thoroughly canine snarl when this was exhibited the corner of the lip over the eye tooth which happened in this case to be large and projecting was raised on the side of his accuser a strong frown being still retained on the brow 
sir c bell states that the actor cook could express the most determined hate when with the oblique cast of his eyes he drew up the outer part of the upper lip and discovered a sharp angular tooth the uncovering of the canine tooth is the result of a double movement the angle or corner of the mouth is drawn a little backwards and at the same time a muscle which runs parallel to and near the nose draws up the outer part of the upper lip and exposes the canine on this side of the face the contraction of this muscle makes a distinct furrow on the cheek and produces strong wrinkles under the eye especially at its inner corner the action is the same as that of a snarling dog and a dog when pretending to fight often draws up the lip on one side alone namely that facing his antagonist our word sneer is in fact the same as snarl which was originally snar the l being merely an element implying continuance of action i suspect that we see a trace of this same expression in what is called a derisive or a sardonic smile the lips are then kept joined or almost joined but one corner of the mouth is retracted on the side towards the derided person and this drawing back of the corner is part of a true sneer although some persons smile more on one side of their face than on the other it is not easy to understand why in cases of derision the smile if a real one should so commonly be confined to one side i have also on these occasions noticed a slight twitching of the muscle which draws up the outer part of the upper lip and this movement if fully carried out would have uncovered the canine and would have produced a true sneer mr balmer an australian missionary in a remote part of gippsland says in answer to my query about the uncovering of the canine on one side i find that the natives in snarling at each other speak with the teeth closed the upper lip drawn to one side and a general angry expression of face but they look direct at the person addressed three other observers in australia one in abyssinia and one in china answer my query on this head in the affirmative but as the expression is rare and as they enter into no details i am afraid of implicitly trusting them it is however by no means improbable that this animal-like expression may be more common with savages than with civilized races mr gage is an observer who may be fully trusted and he has observed it on one occasion in a malay in the interior of malacca the rev s o glini answers we have observed this expression with the natives of ceylon but not often lastly in north america dr rothrock has seen it with some wild indians and often in a tribe adjoining the atnas although the upper lip is certainly sometimes raised on one side alone in sneering at or defying any one i do not know that this is always the case for the face is commonly half averted and the expression is often momentary the movement being confined to one side may not be an essential part of the expression but may depend on the proper muscles being incapable of movement excepting on one side i asked four persons to endeavor to act voluntarily in this manner two could expose the canine only on the left side one only on the right side and the fourth on neither side nevertheless it is by no means certain that these same persons if defying any one in earnest would not unconsciously have uncovered their canine tooth on the side whichever it might be towards the offender for we have seen that some persons cannot voluntarily make their eyebrows oblique yet instantly act in this manner when affected by any real although most trifling cause of distress the power of voluntarily uncovering the canine on one side of the face being thus often wholly lost indicates that it is a rarely used and almost abortive action it is indeed a surprising fact that man should possess the power or should exhibit any tendency to its use for mr sutton has never noticed the snarling action in our nearest allies namely the monkeys in the zoological gardens 
and he is positive that the baboons though furnished with great canines never act thus but uncover all their teeth when feeling savage and ready for an attack whether the adult anthropomorphous apes in the males of whom the canines are much larger than in the females uncover them when prepared to fight is not known the expression here considered whether that of a playful sneer or ferocious snarl is one of the most curious which occurs in man it reveals his animal descent for no one even if rolling on the ground in a deadly grapple with an enemy and attempting to bite him would try to use his canine teeth more than his other teeth we may readily believe from our affinity to the anthropomorphous apes that our male semi-human progenitors possessed great canine teeth and men are now occasionally born having them of unusually large size with interspaces in the opposite jaw for their reception we may further suspect notwithstanding that we have no support from analogy that our semi-human progenitors uncovered their canine teeth when prepared for battle as we still do when feeling ferocious or when merely sneering at or defying some Section 19 of the Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin. Chapter 11. Disdain, Contempt, Disgust, Guilt, Pride, etc helplessness patience affirmation and negation part one contempt scorn and disdain variously expressed derisive smile gestures expressive of contempt disgust guilt deceit pride etc helplessness or impotence patience obstinacy shrugging the shoulders common to most of the races of man signs of affirmation and negation scorn and disdain can hardly be distinguished from contempt excepting that they imply a rather more angry frame of mind nor can they be clearly distinguished from the feelings discussed in the last chapter under the terms of sneering and defiance Disgust is a sensation rather more distinct in its nature and refers to something revolting, primarily in relation to the sense of taste, as actually perceived or vividly imagined, and secondarily to anything which causes a similar feeling through the sense of smell, touch, and even of eyesight. Nevertheless, extreme contempt, or as it is often called, loathing contempt, hardly differs from disgust. These several conditions of the mind are, therefore, nearly related, and each of them may be exhibited in many different ways. Some writers have insisted chiefly on one mode of expression, and others on a different mode. From this circumstance, M. Lemoine has argued that their descriptions are not trustworthy, but we shall immediately see that it is natural that the feelings which we have here to consider should be expressed in many different ways, inasmuch as various habitual actions serve equally well through the principle of association for their expression. Scorn and disdain, as well as sneering and defiance, may be displayed by a slight uncovering of the canine tooth on one side of the face, and this movement appears to graduate into one closely like a smile. Or the smile or laugh may be real, although one of derision and this implies that the offender is so insignificant that he excites only amusement, but the amusement is generally a pretense. Geika, in his answers to my queries, remarks that contempt is commonly shown by his countrymen, the Kafirs, by smiling, and the Raja Brook makes the same observation with respect to the Dyaks of Borneo. 
as laughter is primarily the expression of simple joy very young children do not i believe ever laugh in derision the partial closure of the eyelids as duchesne insists or the turning away of the eyes or of the whole body are likewise highly expressive of disdain these actions seem to declare that the despised person is not worth looking at or is disagreeable to behold the accompanying photograph by mr raylander shows this form of disdain it represents a young lady who was supposed to be tearing up the photograph of a despised lover the most common method of expressing contempt is by movements about the nose or round the mouth but the latter movements when strongly pronounced indicate disgust the nose may be slightly turned up which apparently follows from the turning up of the upper lip or the movement may be abbreviated into the mere wrinkling of the nose the nose is often slightly contracted so as partly to close the passage and this is commonly accompanied by a slight snort or expiration all these actions are the same with those which we employ when we perceive an offensive odor and wish to exclude or expel it in extreme cases as dr pitteret remarks we protrude and raise both lips or the upper lip alone so as to close the nostrils as by a valve the nose being thus turned up we seem thus to say to the despised person that he smells offensively in nearly the same manner as we express to him by half closing our eyelids or turning away our faces that he is not worth looking at it must not however be supposed that such ideas actually pass through the mind when we exhibit our contempt but as whenever we have perceived a disagreeable odor or seen a disagreeable sight actions of this kind have been performed they have become habitual or fixed and are now employed under any analogous state of mind various odd little gestures likewise indicate contempt for instance snapping one's fingers this as mr taylor remarks it is not very intelligible as we generally see it but when we notice that the same sign made quite gently as if rolling some tiny object away between the finger and thumb or the sign of flipping it away with the thumbnail and forefinger are usual and well understood deaf and dumb gestures denoting anything tiny insignificant contemptible it seems as though we had exaggerated and conventionalized a perfectly natural action so as to lose sight of its original meaning there is a curious mention of this gesture by strabo mr washington matthews informs me that with the dakota indians of north america contempt is shown not only by movements of the face such as those above described but conventionally by the hand being closed and held near the breast then as the forearm is suddenly extended the hand is opened and the fingers separated from each other if the person at whose expense the sign is made is present the hand is moved towards him and the head sometimes averted from him this sudden extension and opening of the hand perhaps indicates the dropping or throwing away a valueless object the term disgust in its simplest sense means something offensive to the taste it is curious how readily this feeling is excited by anything unusual in the appearance odor or nature of our food in tierra del fuego a native touched with his finger some cold preserved meat which i was eating at our bivouac and plainly showed utter disgust at its softness whilst i felt utter disgust at my food being touched by a naked savage though his hands did not appear dirty a smear of soup on a man's beard looks disgusting though there is of course nothing disgusting in the soup itself i presume that this follows from the strong association in our minds between the sight of food however circumstanced and the idea of eating it as the sensation of disgust primarily arises in connection with the act of eating or tasting it is natural that its expression should consist chiefly in movements round the mouth but as disgust also causes annoyance 
it is generally accompanied by a frown and often by gestures as if to push away or to guard oneself against the offensive object in the two photographs mr raylander has simulated this expression with some success with respect to the face moderate disgust is exhibited in various ways by the mouth being widely opened as if to let an offensive morsel drop out by spitting by blowing out of the protruded lips or by a sound as of clearing the throat such guttural sounds are written ach or ugh and their utterance is sometimes accompanied by a shudder the arms being pressed close to the sides and the shoulders raised in the same manner as when horror is experienced extreme disgust is expressed by movements round the mouth identical with those preparatory to the act of vomiting the mouth is opened widely with the upper lip strongly retracted which wrinkles the sides of the nose and with the lower lip protruded and everted as much as possible this latter movement requires the contraction of the muscles which draws downward the corners of the mouth it is remarkable how readily and instantly retching or actual vomiting is induced in some persons by the mere idea of having partaken of any unusual food as of an animal which is not commonly eaten although there is nothing in such food to cause the stomach to reject it when vomiting results as a reflex action from some real cause as from too rich food or tainted meat or from an emetic it does not ensue immediately but generally after a considerable interval of time therefore to account for retching or vomiting being so quickly and easily excited by a mere idea the suspicion arises that our progenitors must formerly have had the power like that possessed by ruminants and some other animals of voluntarily rejecting food which disagreed with them or which they thought would disagree with them and now this power has been lost as far as the will is concerned it is called into involuntary action through the force of a formerly well-established habit whenever the mind revolts at the idea of having partaken of any kind of food or at anything disgusting this suspicion receives support from the fact of which i am assured by mr sutton that the monkeys in the zoological gardens often vomit whilst in perfect health which looks as if the act were voluntary we can see that as man is able to communicate by language to his children and others the knowledge of the kinds of food to be avoided he would have little occasion to use the faculty of voluntary rejection so that this power would tend to be lost through disuse as the sense of smell is so intimately connected with that of taste it is not surprising that an excessively bad odor should excite retching or vomiting in some persons quite as readily as the thought of revolting food does and that as a further consequence a moderately offensive odor should cause the various expressive movements of disgust the tendency to retch from a fetid odor is immediately strengthened in a curious manner by some degree of habit though soon lost by longer familiarity with the cause of offence and by voluntary restraint for instance i wish to clean the skeleton of a bird which had not been sufficiently macerated and the smell made my servant and myself we not having had much experience in such work wretch so violently that we were compelled to desist during the previous days i had examined some other skeletons which smelt slightly yet the odor did not in the least affect me but subsequently for several days whenever i handled these same skeletons they made me wretch from the answers received from my correspondence it appears that the various movements which have now been described as expressing contempt and disgust prevail throughout a large part of the world dr rothrock for instance answers with a decided affirmative with respect to certain wild indian tribes of north america krantz says that when a greenlander denies anything with contempt or horror he turns up his nose and gives a slight sound through it mr scott has sent me a graphic description of the face of a young hindu at the sight of castor oil 
which he was compelled occasionally to take. Mr. Scott has also seen the same expression on the faces of high-caste natives who have approached close to some defiling object. Mr. Bridges says that the Fugians express contempt by shooting out the lips and hissing through them, and by turning up the nose. The tendency either to snort through the nose or to make a noise expressed by ug or ach is noticed by several of my correspondents. Shakespeare makes the Duke of Norfolk say, I spit at him, call him a slanderous coward and a villain. So again Falstaff says, Tell thee what, Hal, if I tell thee a lie, spit in my face. Leichhardt remarks that the Australians interrupted their speeches by spitting and uttering a noise like poo-poo, apparently expressive of their disgust. And Captain Burton speaks of certain Negroes spitting with disgust upon the ground. Captain Speedy informs me that this is likewise the case with the Abyssinians. Mr. Geish says that with the Malays of Malacca, the expression of disgust answers to spitting from the mouth and with the Fugians, according to Mr. Bridges, to spit at one is the highest mark of contempt. I never saw disgust more plainly expressed than on the face of one of my infants at the age of five months, when for the first time some cold water, and again a month afterwards when a piece of ripe cherry was put into his mouth. This was shown by the lips and whole mouth assuming a shape which allowed the contents to run or fall quickly out, the tongue being likewise protruded. These movements were accompanied by a little shudder. It was all the more comical, as I doubt whether the child felt real disgust, the eyes and forehead expressing much surprise and consideration. The protrusion of the tongue is letting a nasty object fall out of the mouth may explain how it is that lolling out the tongue universally serves as a sign of contempt and hatred. We have now seen that scorn, disdain, contempt, and disgust are expressed in many different ways, by movements of the features and by various gestures, and that these are the same throughout the world. They all consist of actions representing the rejection or exclusion of some real object which we dislike or abhor, but which does not excite in us certain other strong emotions such as rage or terror and through the force of habit and association similar actions are performed, whenever any analogous sensation arises in our minds. Jealousy, envy, avarice, revenge, suspicion, deceit, slyness, guilt, vanity, conceit, ambition, pride, humility, etc. It is doubtful whether the greater number of the above complex states of mind are revealed by any fixed expression, sufficiently distinct to be described or delineated. When Shakespeare speaks of envy as lean-faced or black or pale, and jealousy as the green-eyed monster, and when Spencer describes suspicion as foul, ill-favored, and grim, they must have felt this difficulty. Nevertheless, the above feelings, at least many of them, can be detected by the eye, for instance, conceit, but we are often guided in as much greater degree than we suppose by our previous knowledge of the persons or circumstances. My correspondents almost unanimously answer in the affirmative to my query whether the expression of guilt and deceit can be recognized among the various races of men, and I have confidence in their answers, as they generally deny that jealousy can thus be recognized. In the cases in which details are given, the eyes are almost always referred to. The guilty man is said to avoid looking at his accuser or to give him stolen looks. The eyes are said to be turned askant or to waver from side to side, or the eyelids to be lowered and partly closed. This latter remark is made by Mr. Hagenauer with respect to the Australians and by Geika with respect to the Kaifers. The restless movements of the eyes apparently follow, as will be explained when we treat of blushing, from the guilty man not enduring to meet the gaze of his accuser. I may add that I have observed a guilty expression without a shade of fear in some of my own children at a very early age. 
In one instance, the expression was unmistakably clear in a child two years and seven months old, and led to the detection of his little crime. It was shown, as I record in my notes made at the time, by an unnatural brightness in the eyes, and by an odd, affected manner impossible to describe. Slyness is also, I believe, exhibited chiefly by movements about the eyes, for these are less under the control of the will, owing to the force of long-continued habit, than are the movements of the body. Mr. Herbert Spencer remarks, When there is a desire to see something on one side of the visual field without being supposed to see it, the tendency is to check the conspicuous movement of the head, and to make the required adjustment entirely with the eyes, which are therefore drawn very much to one side. Hence, when the eyes are turned to one side, while the face is not turned to the same side, we get the natural language of what is called slyness. Of all the above-named complex emotions, pride, perhaps, is the most plainly expressed. A proud man exhibits his sense of superiority over others by holding his head and body erect. He is haughty, hot or high, and makes himself appear as large as possible, so that metaphorically he is said to be swollen or puffed up with pride. A peacock or a turkey cock strutting about with puffed up feathers is sometimes said to be an emblem of pride. The arrogant man looks down on others, and with lowered eyelids hardly condescends to see them, or he may show his contempt by slight movements, such as those before described, about the nostrils or lips. Hence the muscle which everts the lower lip has been called the musculus superbus. In some photographs of patients affected by a monomania of pride, sent me by Dr. Crichton Brown, the head and body were held erect and the mouth firmly closed. This latter action, expressive of decision, follows, I presume, from the proud man feeling perfect self-confidence in himself. The whole expression of pride stands in direct antithesis Section 20 of the Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin. Chapter 11. Disdain, Contempt, Disgust, Guilt, pride, etc., helplessness, patience, affirmation, and negation. Continued. Part 2. Helplessness, impotence, shrugging the shoulders. When a man wishes to show that he cannot do something or prevent something being done, he often raises, with a quick movement, both shoulders, at the same time, if the whole gesture is completed, he bends his elbows closely inwards, raising his open hands, turning them outwards, with the fingers separated. The head is often thrown a little on one side. The eyebrows are elevated, and this causes wrinkles across the forehead. The mouth is generally opened. I may mention, in order to show how unconsciously the features are thus acted on, that though I had often intentionally shrugged my shoulders to observe how my arms were placed, I was not at all aware that my eyebrows were raised and mouth opened, until I looked at myself in the glass. And since then I have noticed the same movements in the faces of others. In the accompanying plate 6, figures 3 and 4, Mr. Raylander has successfully acted the gesture of shrugging the shoulders. Englishmen are much less demonstrative than the men of most other European nations, and they shrug their shoulders far less frequently and energetically than Frenchmen or Italians do. 
The gesture varies in all degrees from the complex movement just described to only a momentary and scarcely perceptible raising of both shoulders, or, as I have noticed in a lady sitting in an armchair, to the mere turning slightly outwards of the open hands with separated fingers. I have never seen very young English children shrug their shoulders, but the following case was observed with care by a medical professor and excellent observer, and has been communicated to me by him. The father of this gentleman was a Parisian, and his mother a Scotch lady. His wife is of British extraction on both sides, and my informant does not believe that she ever shrugged her shoulders in her life. His children have been reared in England, and the nursemaid is a thorough Englishwoman who has never been seen to shrug her shoulders. Now his eldest daughter was observed to shrug her shoulders at the age of between sixteen and eighteen months, her mother exclaiming at the time, Look at the little French girl shrugging her shoulders. At first she often acted thus, sometimes throwing her head a little backwards and on one side, but she did not, as far as was observed, move her elbows and hands in the usual manner. The habit gradually wore away, and now, when she is a little over four years old, she is never seen to act thus. The father is told that he sometimes shrugs his shoulders, especially when arguing with anyone but it is extremely improbable that his daughter should have imitated him at so early an age, for, as he remarks, she could not possibly have often seen this gesture in him. Moreover, if the habit had been acquired through imitation, it is not probable that it would so soon have been spontaneously discontinued by this child, and, as we shall immediately see by a second child, though the father still lived with his family. This little girl, it may be added, resembles her Parisian grandfather in countenance to an almost absurd degree. She also presents another and very curious resemblance to him, namely, by practicing a singular trick. When she impatiently wants something, she holds out her little hand and rapidly rubs the thumb against the index and middle finger. Now this same trick was frequently performed under the same circumstances by her grandfather. This gentleman's second daughter also shrugged her shoulders before the age of 18 months, and afterward discontinued the habit. It is, of course, possible that she may have imitated her elder sister, but she continued it after her sister had lost the habit. She at first resembled her Parisian grandfather in a less degree than did her sister at the same age, but now in a greater degree. She likewise practices to the present time the peculiar habit of rubbing together when impatient, her thumb and two of her forefingers. In this latter case we have a good instance, like those given in a former chapter, of the inheritance of a trick or gesture, for no one, I presume, will attribute to mere coincidence so peculiar a habit as this, which was common to the grandfather and his two grandchildren, who had never seen him. Considering all the circumstances with reference to these children shrugging their shoulders, it can hardly be doubted that they have inherited the habit from their French progenitors, although they have only one quarter French blood in their veins, and although their grandfather did not often shrug his shoulders. There is nothing very unusual, though the fact is interesting, in these children having gained by inheritance a habit during early youth and then discontinuing it, for it is of frequent occurrence with many kinds of animals that certain characters are retained for a period by the young, and are then lost. As it appeared to me at one time, improbable in a high degree, that so complex a gesture as shrugging the shoulders together with the accompanying movements should be innate, I was anxious to ascertain whether the blind and deaf Laura Bridgman who could not have learnt the habit by imitation, practiced it, and I have heard, through Dr. Eines, from a lady who has lately had charge of her, that she does shrug her shoulders, turn in her elbows, and raise her eyebrows in the same manner as other people, and under the same circumstances. I was also anxious to learn whether this gesture was practiced by the various races of men, 
especially by those who never had much intercourse with Europeans. We shall see that they act in this manner, but it appears that the gesture is sometimes confined to merely raising or shrugging the shoulders without the other movements. Mr. Scott has frequently seen this gesture in the Bengalese and Dangars, the later constituting a distinct race, who are employed in the botanic garden at Calcutta, when, for instance, they have declared that they could not do some work, such as lifting a heavy weight. He ordered a Bengali to climb a lofty tree, but the man, with a shrug of his shoulders and a lateral shake of his head, said he could not. Mr. Scott, knowing that the man was lazy, thought he could, and insisted on his trying. His face now became pale, his arms dropped to his sides, his mouth and eyes were widely opened, and again surveying the tree, he looked askant at Mr. Scott, shrugged his shoulders, inverted his elbows, extended his open hands, and with a few quick lateral shakes of the head, declared his inability. Mr. H. Erskine has likewise seen the natives of India shrugging their shoulders, but he has never seen the elbows turned so much inwards as with us, and whilst shrugging their shoulders they sometimes lay their uncrossed hands on their breasts. With the wild Malays of the interior of Malacca, and with the Bugis, true Malays, though speaking a different language, Mr. Geach has often seen this gesture. I presume that it is complete as, in answer to my query descriptive of the movements of the shoulders, arms, hands, and face, Mr. Geach remarks, it is performed in a beautiful style. I have lost an extract from a scientific voyage in which shrugging the shoulders by some natives, Micronesians, of the Caroline Archipelago in the Pacific Ocean was well described. Captain Speedy informs me that the Abyssinians shrug their shoulders, but enters into no details. Mr. Asa Gray saw an Arab dragoman in Alexandria acting exactly as described in my query, when an old gentleman on whom he attended would not go in the proper direction which had been pointed out to him. Mr. Washington Matthews says, in reference to the wild Indian tribes of the western parts of the United States, I have on a few occasions detected men using a slight apologetic shrug, but the rest of the demonstration which you described I have not witnessed. Fritz Muller informs me that he has seen the Negroes in Brazil shrugging their shoulders, but it is, of course, possible that they may have learned to do so by imitating the Portuguese. Mrs. Barber has never seen this gesture with the Kafirs of South Africa, and Geika, judging from his answer, did not even understand what was meant by my description. Mr. Swinho is also doubtful about the Chinese, but he has seen them, under the circumstances which would make us shrug our shoulders, press their right elbow against their side, raise their eyebrows, lift up their hand with the palm directed toward the person addressed, and shake it from right to left. Lastly, with respect to the Australians, four of my informants answer by a simple negative and one by a simple affirmative. Mr. Bunnett, who has had excellent opportunities for observation on the borders of the Colony of Victory, also answers by a yes, adding that the gesture is performed in a more subdued and less demonstrative manner than is the case with civilized nations. This circumstance may account for its not having been noticed by four of my informants. These statements relating to Europeans, Hindus, the hill tribes of India, Malays, Micronesians, Abyssinians, Arabs, Negroes, Indians of North America, and apparently to the Australians, Many of these natives, having had scarcely any intercourse with Europeans, are sufficient to show that shrugging the shoulders, accompanied in some cases by other proper movements, is a gesture natural to mankind. This gesture implies an unintentional or unavoidable action on our part, or one that we cannot perform, or an action performed by another person which we cannot prevent. It accompanies such speeches as, It was not my fault. It is impossible for me to grant this favor. 
He must follow his own course. I cannot stop him. Shrugging the shoulders likewise expresses patience, or the absence of any intention to resist. Hence the muscles which raise the shoulders are sometimes called, as I have been informed by an artist, the patience muscles. Shylock the Jew says, Signor Antonio, many a time and oft, in the Rialto you have rated me. About my monies and usances, still I have borne it with a patient shrug. Merchant of Venice, Act One, Scene Three. Sir Charles Bell has given a lifelike figure of a man who is shrinking back from some terrible danger and is on the point of screaming out in abject terror. He is represented with his shoulders lifted up almost to his ears, and this at once declares that there is no thought of resistance. A shrugging the shoulders generally implies, I cannot do this or that. So, by a slight chance, it sometimes implies, I won't do it. The movement then expresses a dogged determination not to act. Olmsted describes an Indian in Texas as giving a great shrug to his shoulders when he was informed that a party of men were Germans and not Americans, thus expressing that he would have nothing to do with them. Sulky and obstinate children may be seen with both their shoulders raised high up, but this movement is not associated with the others which generally accompany a true shrug. An excellent observer in describing a young man who was determined not to yield to his father's desire says, He thrust his hands deep down into his pockets and set up his shoulders to his ears, which was a good warning that, come right or wrong, this rock should fly from its firm base as soon as Jack would, and that any remonstrance on the subject was purely futile. As soon as the sun got his own way, he put his shoulders into their natural position. Resignation is sometimes shown by the open hands being placed one over the other on the lower part of the body. I should not have thought this little gesture worth even a passing notice had not Dr. William Ogle remarked to me that he had two or three times observed it in patients who were preparing for operations under chloroform. They exhibited no great fear, but seemed to declare by this posture of their hands that they had made up their minds and were resigned to the inevitable. We may now inquire why men in all parts of the world, when they feel whether or not they wish to show this feeling that they cannot or will not do something, or will not resist something if done by another, shrug their shoulders, at the same time often bending in their elbows, showing the palms of their hands with extended fingers, often throwing their heads a little on one side, raising their eyebrows and opening their mouths. These states of the mind are either simply passive or show a determination not to act, None of the above movements are of the least service. The explanation lies, I cannot doubt, in the principle of unconscious antithesis. This principle here seems to come into play as clearly as in the case of a dog, who, when feeling savage, puts himself in the proper attitude for attacking and for making himself appear terrible to his enemy. But as soon as he feels affectionate, throws his whole body into a directly opposite attitude, though this is of no direct use to him. Let it be observed how an indignant man who resents and will not submit to some inquiry holds his head erect, squares his shoulders, and expands his chest. He often clenches his fist and puts one or both arms in the proper position for attack or defense, with the muscles of his limbs rigid. He frowns, that is, he contracts and lowers his brows, and being determined, closes his mouth. The actions and attitude of a helpless man are, in every one of these respects, exactly the reverse. In plate six, we may imagine one of the figures on the left side who have just said, What do you mean by insulting me? And one of the figures on the right to answer, I really could not help it. The helpless man unconsciously contracts the muscles of his forehead, which are antagonistic to those that cause a frown, and thus raises his eyebrows, 
At the same time, he relaxes the muscles about the mouth so that the lower jaw drops. The antithesis is complete in every detail, not only in the movements of the features, but in the position of the limbs and in the attitude of the whole body, as may be seen in the accompanying plate. As the helpless or apologetic man often wishes to show his state of mind, he then acts in a conspicuous or demonstrative manner. In accordance with the fact that squaring the elbows and clenching the fists are gestures by no means universal with the men of all races when they feel indignant and are prepared to attack their enemy, so it appears that a helpless or apologetic frame of mind is expressed in many parts of the world by merely shrugging the shoulders without turning inwards the elbows and opening the hands. The man or child who is obstinate or one who is resigned to some great misfortune, has in neither case any idea of resistance by active means, and he expresses this state of mind by simply keeping his shoulders raised, or he may possibly fold his arms across his breast. Signs of affirmation or approval, and of negation or disapproval, nodding and shaking the head. I was curious to ascertain how far the common signs used by us in affirmation and negation were general throughout the world. These signs are, indeed, to a certain extent, expressive of our feelings as we give a vertical nod of approval with a smile to our children, when we approve of their conduct, and shake our heads laterally with a frown when we disapprove. With infants, the first act of denial consists in refusing food and I repeatedly noticed with my own infants that they did so by withdrawing their heads laterally from the breast or from anything offered them in a spoon. In accepting food and in taking it into their mouths, they incline their heads forwards. Since making these observations, I have been informed that the same idea had occurred to Charma. It deserves notice that in accepting or taking food, there is only a single movement forward, and a single nod implies an affirmation. On the other hand, in refusing food, especially if it be pressed on them, children frequently move their heads several times from side to side, as we do in shaking our heads in negation. Moreover, in the case of refusal, the head is not rarely thrown backwards, or the mouth is closed, so that these movements might likewise come to serve as signs of negation. Mr. Wedgwood remarks on this subject that when the voice is exerted with closed teeth or lips, it produces the sound of the letter N or M. Hence, we may account for the use of the particle NE to signify negation, and possibly also of the Greek M in the same sense. That these signs are innate or instinctive, at least with Anglo-Saxons, is rendered highly probable by the blind and deaf Laura Bridgman, constantly accompanying her yes with the common affirmative nod, and her no with our negative shake of the head. Had not Mr. Lieber stated to the contrary, I should have imagined that these gestures might have been acquired or learnt by her, considering her wonderful sense of touch and appreciation of the movements of others. With microcephalous idiots who are so degraded that they never learn to speak, one of them is described by vote as answering, when asked whether he wished for more food or drink, by inclining or shaking his head. Schmaltz, in his remarkable dissertation on the education of the deaf and dumb, as well as of children raised only one degree above idiocy, assumes that they can always both make and understand the common signs of affirmation and negation. Nevertheless, if we look to the various races of man, these signs are not so universally employed as I should have expected. Yet they seem too general to be ranked as altogether conventional or artificial. My informants assert that both signs are used by the Malays, by the natives of Ceylon, the Chinese, the Negroes of the Guinea coast, and, according to Geika, by the Kiefers of South Africa, though with these latter people Mrs. Barber has never seen a lateral shake used as a negative. With respect to the Australians, seven observers agree that a nod is given in affirmation. Five agree about a lateral shake in negation, accompanied or not by some word. 
but Mr. Dyson Lacey has never seen this latter sign in Queensland, and Mr. Bulmer says that in Gippsland, a negative is expressed by throwing the head a little backwards and putting out the tongue. At the northern extremity of the continent, near Torres Straits, the natives, when uttering a negative, don't shake the head with it, but holding up the right hand, shake it by turning it half round and back again two or three times. The throwing back of the head with a cluck of the tongue is said to be used as a negative by the modern Greeks and Turks, the latter people expressing yes by a movement like that made by us when we shake our heads. The Abyssinians, as I am informed by Captain Speedy, express a negative by jerking the head to the right shoulder, together with a slight cluck, the mouth being closed. An affirmation is expressed by the head being thrown backwards, and the eyebrows raised for an instant. The Tagals of Luzon in the Philippine archipelago, as I hear from Dr. Adolf Meyer, when they say yes, also throw the head backwards. According to the Raja Brook, the Dyaks of Borneo express an affirmation by raising the eyebrows, and a negation by slightly contracting them together with a peculiar look from the eyes. With the Arabs on the Nile, Professor and Mrs. Asa Gray concluded that nodding in affirmation was rare, whilst shaking the head in negation was never used, and was not even understood by them. With the Eskimo, a nod means yes, and a wink, no. The New Zealanders elevate the head and chin in place of nodding acquiescence. With the Hindus, Mr. H. Erskine concludes, from inquiries made from experienced Europeans and from native gentlemen, that the signs of affirmation and negation vary, a nod and a lateral shake being sometimes used as we do, but a negative is more commonly expressed by the head being thrown suddenly backwards and a little to one side with a cluck of the tongue. What the meaning may be of this cluck of the tongue which has been observed with various people, I cannot imagine. A native gentleman stated that affirmation is frequently shown by the head being thrown to the left. I asked Mr. Scott to attend particularly to this point, and after repeated observations, he believes that a vertical nod is not commonly used by the natives in affirmation, but that the head is first thrown backwards, either to the left or to the right, and then jerked obliquely forwards only once. This movement would perhaps have been described by a less careful observer as a lateral shake. He also states that in negation the head is usually held nearly upright and shaken several times. Mr. Bridges informs me that the Fugians nod their heads vertically in affirmation and shake them laterally in denial. With the wild Indians of North America, according to Mr. Washington Matthews, nodding and shaking the head have been learnt from Europeans and are not naturally employed. They express affirmation by describing with the hand, all the fingers except the index being flexed a curve downwards and outwards from the body, whilst negation is expressed by moving the open hand outwards with the palm facing inwards. Other observers state that the sign of affirmation with these Indians is the forefinger being raised and then lowered and pointed to the ground, or the hand is waved straight forward from the face, and that the sign of negation is the finger or whole hand shaken from side to side. This latter movement probably represents in all cases the lateral shaking of the head. The Italians are said, in like manner, to move the lifted finger from right to left in negation, as indeed we English sometimes do. On the whole, we find considerable diversity in the signs of affirmation and negation in the different races of man. With respect to negation, if we admit that the shaking of the finger or hand from side to side is symbolic of the lateral movement of the head, and if we admit that the sudden backward movement of the head represents one of the actions often practiced by young children in refusing food, then there is much uniformity throughout the world in the signs of negation, and we can see how they originated. The most marked exceptions are presented by the Arabs, Eskimo, some Australian tribes, and Dyaks. With the latter, a frown is the sign of negation, 
and with us frowning often accompanies a lateral shake of the head. With respect to nodding in affirmation, the exceptions are rather more numerous, namely with some of the Hindus, with the Turks, Abyssinians, Dayaks, Tagals, and New Zealanders. The eyebrows are sometimes raised in affirmation as a person in bending his head forwards and downwards naturally looks up to the person whom he addresses, he will be apt to raise his eyebrows. And this sign may thus have arisen as an abbreviation. So again with the New Zealanders, the lifting up of the chin and head in affirmation may perhaps represent Section 21 of the Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Chicago, USA. The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin. Chapter 12. Surprise, Astonishment, Fear, Horror. Part 1. Surprise, astonishment, elevation of the eyebrows, opening the mouth, protrusion of the lips, gestures accompanying surprise, admiration, fear, terror, erection of the hair, contraction of the platysma muscle, dilatation of the pupils, horror, conclusion. Attention, if sudden and close, graduates into surprise, and this into astonishment, and this into stupefied amazement. The latter frame of mind is closely akin to terror. Attention is shown by the eyebrows being slightly raised, and as this state increases into surprise, they are raised to a much greater extent, with the eyes and mouth widely open. The raising of the eyebrows is necessary in order that the eyes should be opened quickly and widely, and this movement produces transverse wrinkles across the forehead. The degree to which the eyes and mouth are opened corresponds with the degree of surprise felt, but these movements must be coordinated, for a widely opened mouth with eyebrows only slightly raised results in a meaningless grimace, as Dr. Duchesne has shown in one of his photographs. On the other hand, a person may often be seen to pretend surprise by merely raising his eyebrows. Dr. Duchenne has given a photograph of an old man with his eyebrows well elevated and arched by the galvanization of the frontal muscle, and with his mouth voluntarily opened. This figure expresses surprise with much truth. I showed it to 24 persons without a word of explanation, and one alone did not at all understand what was intended. A second person answered terror, which is not far wrong. Some of the others, however, added to the words surprise or astonishment, the epithets horrified, woeful, painful, or disgusted. The eyes and mouth being widely open is an expression universally recognized as one of surprise or astonishment. Thus, Shakespeare says, I saw a smith stand with open mouth swallowing a tailor's news. King John, Act 4, Scene 2. And again, they seemed almost with staring on one another, to tear the cases of their eyes. There was speech in the dumbness, language in their very gesture. They looked as they had heard of a world destroyed. Winter's Tale, Act 5, Scene 2. My informants answer with remarkable uniformity to the same effect, with respect to the various races of man, the above movements of the features being often accompanied by certain gestures and sounds, presently to be described. Twelve observers in different parts of Australia agree on this head. Mr. Winwood Reed has observed this expression with the Negroes on the Guinea coast. 
the chief Gaika and others answer yes to my query with respect to the Kafirs of South Africa, and so do others emphatically with reference to the Abyssinians, Ceylonese, Chinese, Fuegians, various tribes of North America, and New Zealanders. With the latter, Mr. Stack states that the expression is more plainly shown by certain individuals than by others, though all endeavor as much as possible to conceal their feelings. The Dayaks of Borneo are said by the Raja Brook to open their eyes widely when astonished, often swinging their heads to and fro and beating their breasts. Mr. Scott informs me that the workmen in the botanic gardens at Calcutta are strictly ordered not to smoke, but they often disobey this order, and when suddenly surprised in the act, they first open their eyes and mouths widely. They then often slightly shrug their shoulders as they perceive that discovery is inevitable, or frown and stamp on the ground from vexation. Soon they recover from their surprise, and abject fear is exhibited by the relaxation of all their muscles. Their heads seem to sink between their shoulders, their fallen eyes wander to and fro, and they supplicate forgiveness. The well-known Australian explorer, Mr. Stewart, has given a striking account of stupefied amazement, together with terror, in a native who had never before seen a man on horseback. Mr. Stewart approached unseen and called to him from a little distance. He turned round and saw me. What he imagined I was, I do not know, but a finer picture of fear and astonishment I never saw. He stood incapable of moving a limb, riveted to the spot, mouth open and eyes staring. He remained motionless until our black got within a few yards of him, when suddenly throwing down his waddies, he jumped into a mulga bush as high as he could get. He could not speak, and answered not a word to the inquiries made by the black, but trembling from head to foot, waved with his hand for us to be off. That the eyebrows are raised by an innate or instinctive impulse may be inferred from the fact that Laura Bridgman invariably acts thus when astonished, as I have been assured by the lady who has lately had charge of her. As surprise is excited by something unexpected or unknown, we naturally desire, when startled, to perceive the cause as quickly as possible, and we consequently open our eyes fully so that the field of vision may be increased, and the eyeballs moved easily in any direction. But this hardly accounts for the eyebrows being so greatly raised as is the case, and for the wild staring of the open eyes. The explanation lies, I believe, in the impossibility of opening the eyes with great rapidity by merely raising the upper lids. To effect this, the eyebrows must be lifted energetically. Any one who will try to open his eyes as quickly as possible before a mirror will find that he acts thus and the energetic lifting up of the eyebrows opens the eyes so widely that they stare, the white being exposed all round the iris. Moreover, the elevation of the eyebrows is an advantage in looking upwards, for as long as they are lowered they impede our vision in this direction. Sir C. Bell gives a curious little proof of the part which the eyebrows play in opening the eyelids. In the stupidly drunken man, all the muscles are relaxed, and the eyelids consequently droop, in the same manner as when we are falling asleep. To counteract this tendency, the drunkard raises his eyebrows, and this gives to him a puzzled, foolish look, as is well represented in one of Hogarth's drawings. The habit of raising the eyebrows, having once been gained in order to see as quickly as possible all around us, the movement would follow from the force of association whenever astonishment was felt from any cause, even from a sudden sound or an idea. With adult persons, when the eyebrows are raised, the whole forehead becomes much wrinkled in transverse lines. But with children, this occurs only to a slight degree. The wrinkles run in lines concentric with each eyebrow, 
and are partially confluent in the middle. They are highly characteristic of the expression of surprise or astonishment. Each eyebrow, when raised, becomes also, as Duchenne remarks, more arched than it was before. The cause of the mouth being opened when astonishment is felt is a much more complex affair, and several causes apparently concur in leading to this movement. It has often been supposed that the sense of hearing is thus rendered more acute, but I have watched persons listening intently to a slight noise, the nature and source of which they knew perfectly, and they did not open their mouths. Therefore, I at one time imagined that the open mouth might aid in distinguishing the direction whence the sound proceeded, by giving another channel for its entrance into the ear through the eustachian tube. But Dr. W. Ogle has been so kind as to search the best recent authorities on the functions of the eustachian tube, and he informs me that it is almost conclusively proved that it remains closed except during the act of deglutition, and that in persons in whom the tube remains abnormally open. The sense of hearing, as far as external sounds are concerned, is by no means improved. On the contrary, it is impaired by the respiratory sounds being rendered more distinct. If a watch be placed within the mouth but not allowed to touch the sides, the ticking is heard much less plainly than when held outside. In persons in whom from disease or a cold the eustachian tube is permanently or temporarily closed, the sense of hearing is injured, but this may be accounted for by mucus accumulating within the tube and the consequent exclusion of air. We may therefore infer that the mouth is not kept open under the sense of astonishment for the sake of hearing sounds more distinctly notwithstanding that most deaf people keep their mouths open. Every sudden emotion, including astonishment, quickens the actions of the heart, and with it the respiration. Now we can breathe, as Gratiolet remarks, and it appears to me to be the case, much more quietly through the open mouth than through the nostrils. Therefore, when we wish to listen intently to any sound, we either stop breathing or breathe as quietly as possible by opening our mouths, at the same time keeping our bodies motionless. One of my sons was awakened in the night by a noise under circumstances which naturally led to great care, and after a few minutes he perceived that his mouth was widely open. He then became conscious that he had opened it for the sake of breathing as quietly as possible. This view receives support from the reversed case which occurs with dogs. A dog, when panting after exercise or on a hot day, breathes loudly. But if his attention be suddenly aroused, he suddenly pricks his ears to listen, shuts his mouth, and breathes quietly, as he is enabled to do through his nostrils. When the attention is concentrated for a length of time with fixed earnestness on any object or subject, all the organs of the body are forgotten and neglected, and as the nervous energy of each individual is limited in amount, little is transmitted to any part of the system, excepting that which is at the time brought into energetic action. Therefore, many of the muscles tend to become relaxed, and the jaw drops from its own weight. This will account for the dropping of the jaw and open mouth of a man stupefied with amazement, and perhaps, when less strongly affected, I have noticed this appearance, as I find recorded in my notes, in very young children when they were only moderately surprised. There is still another and highly effective cause leading to the mouth being opened, when we are astonished, and more especially, when we are suddenly startled. We can draw a full and deep inspiration much more easily through the widely open mouth than through the nostrils. Now, when we start at any sudden sound or sight, almost all the muscles of the body are involuntarily and momentarily thrown into strong action for the sake of guarding ourselves against or jumping away from the danger 
which we habitually associate with anything unexpected. But we always unconsciously prepare ourselves for any great exertion, as formerly explained, by first taking a deep and full inspiration, and we consequently open our mouths. If no exertion follows and we still remain astonished, we cease for a time to breathe or breathe as quietly as possible in order that every sound may be distinctly heard. Or again, if our attention continues long and earnestly absorbed, all our muscles become relaxed and the jaw, which was at first suddenly opened, remains dropped. Thus, several causes concur towards the same movement whenever surprise, astonishment, or amazement is felt. Although when thus affected, our mouths are generally opened, yet the lips are often a little protruded. This fact reminds us of the same movement, though in a much more strongly marked degree, in the chimpanzee and orang when astonished. As a strong expiration naturally follows the deep inspiration which accompanies the first sense of startled surprise, and as the lips are often protruded, the various sounds which are then commonly uttered can apparently be accounted for. But sometimes a strong expiration alone is heard. Thus, Laura Bridgman, when amazed, rounds and protrudes her lips, opens them, and breathes strongly. One of the commonest sounds is a deep O, oh, and this would naturally follow, as explained by Helmholtz, from the mouth being moderately opened and the lips protruded. On a quiet night, some rockets were fired from the Beagle in a little creek in Tahiti to amuse the natives, and as each rocket was let off, there was absolute silence. But this was invariably followed by a deep groaning O, oh, resounding all round the bay. Mr. Washington Matthews says that the North American Indians express astonishment by a groan, and the Negroes on the west coast of Africa, according to Mr. Winwood Reed, protrude their lips and make a sound like, Hey, hey! If the mouth is not much opened, whilst the lips are considerably protruded, a blowing, hissing, or whistling noise is produced. Mr. R. Bro Smith informs me that an Australian from the interior was taken to the theater to see an acrobat rapidly turning head over heels. He was greatly astonished and protruded his lips, making a noise with his mouth as if blowing out a match. According to Mr. Bulmer, the Australians, when surprised, utter the exclamation, Corky! And to do this, the mouth is drawn out as if going to whistle. We Europeans often whistle as a sign of surprise. Thus, in a recent novel, it is said, Here the man, expressing his astonishment and disapprobation by a prolonged whistle. A Kaffir girl, as Mr. J. Mansell Wheel informs me, on hearing of the high price of an article, raised her eyebrows and whistled, just as a European would. Mr. Wedgwood remarks that such sounds are written down as woo, and they serve as interjections for surprise. According to three other observers, the Australians often evince astonishment by a clucking noise. Europeans also sometimes express gentle surprise by a little clicking noise of nearly the same kind. We have seen that when we are startled, the mouth is suddenly opened, and if the tongue happens to be then pressed closely against the palate, its sudden withdrawal will produce a sound of this kind, which might thus come to express surprise. Turning to Gestures of the Body a surprised person often raises his open hands high above his head or by bending his arms only to the level of his face. The flat palms are directed towards the person who causes this feeling 
and the straightened fingers are separated. This gesture is represented by Mr. Rege Lander in Plate 7, Figure 1, in The Last Supper, by Leonardo da Vinci. Two of the apostles have their hands half uplifted, clearly expressive of their astonishment. A trustworthy observer told me that he had lately met his wife under most unexpected circumstances. She started, opened her mouth and eyes very widely, and threw up both her arms above her head. Several years ago, I was surprised by seeing several of my young children earnestly doing something together on the ground, but the distance was too great for me to ask what they were about. Therefore, I threw up my open hands with extended fingers above my head, and as soon as I had done this, I became conscious of the action. I then waited without saying a word to see if my children had understood this gesture. And as they came running to me, they cried out, We saw that you were astonished at us. I do not know whether this gesture is common to the various races of man, as I neglected to make inquiries on this head. That it is innate or natural may be inferred from the fact that Laura Bridgman, when amazed, spreads her arms and turns her hands with extended fingers upwards. Nor is it likely, considering that the feelings of surprise is generally a brief one, that she should have learnt this gesture through her keen sense of touch. Hushki describes a somewhat different yet allied gesture, which he says is exhibited by persons when astonished. They hold themselves erect with the features as before described, but with the straightened arms extended backwards the stretched fingers being separated from each other. I have never myself seen this gesture, but Hushki is probably correct, for a friend asked another man how he would express great astonishment, and he at once threw himself into this attitude. These gestures are, I believe, explicable on the principles of antithesis. We have seen that an indignant man holds his head erect, squares his shoulders, turns out his elbows, often clenches his fist, frowns, and closes his mouth, whilst the attitude of a helpless man is in every one of these details the reverse. Now, a man in an ordinary frame of mind, doing nothing and thinking of nothing in particular, usually keeps his two arms suspended laxly by his sides, with his hands somewhat flexed and the fingers near together. Therefore, to raise the arms suddenly, either the whole arms or the forearms, to open the palms flat and to separate the fingers, or again, to straighten the arms, extending them backwards with separated fingers, are movements in complete antithesis to those preserved under an indifferent frame of mind and they are in consequence unconsciously assumed by an astonished man. There is also often a desire to display surprise in a conspicuous manner, and the above attitudes are well fitted for this purpose. It may be asked, why should surprise in only a few other states of the mind be exhibited by movements in antithesis to others? But this principle will not be brought into play in the case of those emotions, such as terror, great joy, suffering, or rage, which naturally lead to certain lines of action and produce certain effects on the body. For the whole system is thus preoccupied, and these emotions are already thus expressed with the greatest plainness. There is another little gesture expressive of astonishment, of which I can offer no explanation, namely the hand being placed over the mouth or on some part of the head. This has been observed with so many races of man that it must have some natural origin. A wild Australian was taken into a large room full of official papers, which surprised him greatly, and he cried out, 
cluck, 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 putting the back of his hand towards his lips. Mrs. Barber says that the kafirs and fingos express astonishment by a serious look and by placing the right hand upon the mouth, littering the word mawo, which means wonderful. The bushmen are said to put their right hands to their necks, bending their heads backwards. Mr. Winwood Reed has observed that the Negroes on the west coast of Africa, when surprised, clap their hands to their mouths, saying at the same time, My mouth cleaves to me, i.e., to my hands, and he has heard that this is their usual gesture on such occasions. Captain Speedy informs me that the Abyssinians place their right hand to the forehead with the palm outside. Lastly, Mr. Washington Matthews states that the conventional sign of astonishment with the wild tribes of the western parts of the United States is made by placing the half-closed hand over the mouth. In doing this, the head is often bent forwards and words or low groans are sometimes uttered. Catlin makes the same remark about the hand being pressed over the mouth by the Mandans and other Indian tribes. Admiration. Little need be said on this head. Admiration apparently consists of surprise associated with some pleasure and a sense of approval. When vividly felt, the eyes are opened and the eyebrows raised. The eyes become bright instead of remaining blank, as under simple astonishment, and the mouth, instead of gaping open, expands into a smile. Fear. Terror. The word fear seems to be derived from what is sudden and dangerous, and that of terror from the trembling of the vocal organs and body. I use the word terror for extreme fear, but some writers think it ought to be confined to cases in which the imagination is more particularly concerned. Fear is often preceded by astonishment, and is so far akin to it that both lead to the senses of sight and hearing being instantly aroused. In both cases, the eyes and mouth are widely opened and the eyebrows raised. The frightened man at first stands like a statue motionless and breathless, or crouches down as if instinctively to escape observation. The heart beats quickly and violently, so that it palpitates or knocks against the ribs, but it is very doubtful whether it then works more efficiently than usual, so as to send a greater supply of blood to all parts of the body for the skin instantly becomes pale, as during incipient faintness. This paleness of the surface, however, is probably in large part or exclusively due to the vasomotor center being affected in such a manner as to cause the contraction of the small arteries of the skin. That the skin is much affected under the sense of great fear we see in the marvelous and inexplicable manner in which perspiration immediately exudes from it. This exudation is all the more remarkable, as the surface is then cold, and hence the term a cold sweat, whereas the sudorific glands are properly excited into action when the surface is heated. The hairs also on the skin stand erect and the superficial muscles shiver. In connection with the disturbed action of the heart, the breathing is hurried. The salivary glands act imperfectly. The mouth becomes dry, and is often opened and shut. I have also noticed that under slight fear, there is a strong tendency to yawn. One of the best marked symptoms is the trembling of all the muscles of the body and this is often first seen in the lips. From this cause, and from the dryness of the mouth, the voice becomes husky or indistinct, or may altogether fail. 
obstupui steteruntque, come et vox falsibus hisit. Of vague fear there is a well-known and grand description in Job. In thoughts from the visions of the night, when deep sleep falleth on men, fear came upon me, and trembling, which made all my bones to shake. Then a spirit passed before my face. The hair of my flesh stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern the form thereof. An image was before my eyes. There was silence, and I heard a voice saying, Shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? Job 4.13 As fear increases into an agony of terror, we behold, as under all violent emotions, diversified results. The heart beats wildly, or may fail to act, and faintness ensue. There is a death-like pallor, the breathing is labored. The wings of the nostrils are wildly dilated. There is a gasping and convulsive motion of the lips, a tremor on the hollow cheek, a gulping and catching of the throat. The uncovered and protruding eyeballs are fixed on the object of terror, or they may roll restlessly from side to side. Huc iluc volvens, oculos Totumque pererat. The pupils are said to be enormously dilated. All the muscles of the body may become rigid or may be thrown into convulsive movements. The hands are alternately clenched and opened, often with a twitching movement. The arms may be protruded as if to avert some dreadful danger or may be thrown wildly over the head. The Reverend Mr. Hagenauer has seen this latter action in a terrified Australian. In other cases, there is a sudden and uncontrollable tendency to headlong flight, and so strong is this that the boldest soldiers may be seized with a sudden panic. As fear rises to an extreme pitch, the dreadful scream of terror is heard. Great beads of sweat stand on the skin. All the muscles of the body are relaxed. Utter prostration soon follows, and the mental powers fail. The intestines are affected. The sphincter muscles cease to act and no longer retain the Section 22 of the Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Chicago, USA. The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin. Chapter 12 surprise astonishment fear horror part two dr j crichton brown has given me so striking an account of intense fear in an insane woman aged thirty-five that the description though painful ought not to be omitted when a paroxysm seizes her she screams out this is hell there is a black woman i can't get out and other such exclamations. When thus screaming, her movements are those of alternate tension and tremor. For one instant, she clenches her hands, holds her arms out before her in a stiff, semi-flexed position, then suddenly bends her body forwards, sways rapidly to and fro, draws her fingers through her hair, clutches at her neck, and tries to tear off her clothes. The sternocleidomastoid muscles which serve to bend the head on the chest, stand out prominently as if swollen, and the skin in front of them is much wrinkled. Her hair, which is cut short at the back of her head, 
and is smooth when she is calm, now stands on end, that in front being disheveled by the movements of her hands. The countenance expresses great mental agony. The skin is flushed over the face and neck, down to the clavicles, and the veins of the forehead and neck stand out like thick cords. The lower lip drops and is somewhat everted. The mouth is kept half open with the lower jaw projecting. The cheeks are hollow and deeply furrowed in curved lines, running from the wings of the nostrils to the corners of the mouth. The nostrils themselves are raised and extended. The eyes are widely opened, and beneath them the skin appears swollen. The pupils are large. The forehead is wrinkled transversely in many folds, and at the inner extremities of the eyebrows it is strongly furrowed in diverging lines, produced by the powerful and persistent contraction of the corrugators. Mr. Bell has also described an agony of terror and of despair, which he witnessed in a murderer, whilst carried to the place of execution in Turin. On each side of the car the officiating priests were seated, and in the center sat the criminal himself. It was impossible to witness the condition of this unhappy wretch without terror, and yet, as if impelled by some strange infatuation, it was equally impossible not to gaze upon an object so wild, so full of horror. He seemed about thirty-five years of age, of large and muscular form, his countenance marked by strong and savage features, half-naked, pale as death, agonized with terror, every limb strained in anguish, his hands clenched convulsively, the sweat breaking out on his bent and contracted brow. He kissed incessantly the figure of our Savior, painted on the flag which was suspended before him, but with an agony of wildness and despair, of which nothing ever exhibited on the stage can give the slightest conception. I will add only one other case, illustrative of a man utterly prostrated by terror. An atrocious murderer of two persons was brought into a hospital under the mistaken impression that he had poisoned himself, and Dr. W. Ogle carefully watched him the next morning while he was being handcuffed and taken away by the police. His pallor was extreme, and his prostration so great that he was hardly able to dress himself. His skin perspired, and his eyelids and head drooped so much that it was impossible to catch even a glimpse of his eyes. His lower jaw hung down. There was no contraction of any facial muscle, and Dr. Ogle is almost certain that the hair did not stand on end, for he observed it narrowly as it had been dyed for the sake of concealment. With respect to fear, as exhibited by the various races of man, my informants agree that the signs are the same as with Europeans. They are displayed in an exaggerated degree with the Hindus and natives of Ceylon. Mr. Geach has seen Malays, when terrified, turn pale and shake, and Mr. Bro Smith states that a native Australian, being on one occasion much frightened, showed a complexion as nearly approaching to what we call paleness, as can well be conceived in the case of a very black man. Mr. Dyson Lacey has seen extreme fear shown in an Australian by a nervous twitching of the hands, feet, and lips, and by the perspiration standing on the skin. Many savages do not repress the signs of fear so much as Europeans, and they often tremble greatly. With the Kafir, Gaika says, in his rather quaint English, the shaking of the body is much experienced, and the eyes are widely open. With savages, the sphincter muscles are often relaxed, just as may be observed in much frightened dogs, and as I have seen with monkeys when terrified by being caught. The Erection of the Hair Some of the signs of fear deserve a little further consideration. Poets continually speak of the hair standing on end. Brutus says to the ghost of Caesar, That makes my blood cold and my hair to stare. 
and Cardinal Beaufort, after the murder of Gloucester, exclaims, Comb down his hair. Look, look, it stands upright. As I did not feel sure whether writers of fiction might not have applied to man what they had often observed in animals, I begged for information from Dr. Crichton Brown with respect to the insane. He states in answer that he has repeatedly seen their hair erected under the influence of sudden and extreme terror. For instance, it is occasionally necessary to inject morphia under the skin of an insane woman who dreads the operation extremely, although it causes very little pain, for she believes that poison is being introduced into her system and that her bones will be softened and her flesh turned to dust. She becomes deadly pale. Her limbs are stiffened by a sort of tetanic spasm, and her hair is partially erected on the front of the head. Dr. Brown further remarks that the bristling of the hair, which is so common in the insane, is not always associated with terror. It is perhaps most frequently seen in chronic maniacs, who rave incoherently and have destructive impulses, but it is during their paroxysms of violence that the bristling is most observable. The fact of the hair becoming erect under the influence both of rage and fear agrees perfectly with what we have seen in the lower animals. Dr. Brown adduces several cases in evidence. Thus with a man now in the asylum, before the recurrence of each maniacal paroxysm, the hair rises up from his forehead like the mane of a Shetland pony. He has sent me photographs of two women taken in the intervals between their paroxysms, and he adds with respect to one of these women that the state of her hair is a sure and convenient criterion of her mental condition. I have had one of these photographs copied, and the engraving gives, if viewed from a little distance, a faithful representation of the original, with the exception that the hair appears rather too coarse and too much curled. The extraordinary condition of the hair in the insane is due not only to its erection, but to its dryness and harshness, consequent on the subcutaneous glands failing to act. Dr. Bucknell has said that a lunatic is a lunatic to his finger's ends, he might have added, and often to the extremity of each particular hair. Dr. Brown mentions as an empirical confirmation of the relation which exists in the insane between the state of their hair and minds, that the wife of a medical man who has charge of a lady suffering from acute melancholia with a strong fear of death for herself, her husband and children, reported verbally to him the day before receiving my letter as follows. I think Mrs. will soon improve, for her hair is getting smooth, and I always notice that our patients get better whenever their hair ceases to be rough and unmanageable. Dr. Brown attributes the persistently rough condition of the hair in many insane patients in part to their minds being always somewhat disturbed and in part to the effects of habit that is, to the hair being frequently and strongly erected during their many recurrent paroxysms. In patients in whom the bristling of the hair is extreme, the disease is generally permanent and mortal, but in others in whom the bristling is moderate, as soon as they recover their health of mind, the hair recovers its smoothness. In a previous chapter, we have seen that with animals the hairs are erected by the contraction of minute, unstriped, and involuntary muscles, which run to each separate follicle. In addition to this action, Mr. J. Wood has clearly ascertained by experiment, as he informs me, that with man the hairs on the front of the head, which slope forwards, and those on the back, which slope backwards, are raised in opposite directions by the contraction of the occipito frontalis, or scalp muscle, so that this muscle seems to aid in the erection of the hairs on the head of man in the same manner as the homologous paniculus carnosus aids, or takes the greater part 
in the erection of the spines on the backs of some of the lower animals. Contraction of the platysma myoides muscle. This muscle is spread over the sides of the neck, extending downwards to a little beneath the collarbones and upwards to the lower part of the cheeks. A portion called the risorius is represented in the woodcut. The contraction of this muscle draws the corners of the mouth and the lower parts of the cheeks downwards and backwards. It produces at the same time divergent longitudinal prominent ridges on the sides of the neck and the young, and in old thin persons fine transverse wrinkles. This muscle is sometimes said not to be under the control of the will, but almost every one, if told to draw the corners of his mouth backwards and downwards with great force, brings it into action. I have, however, heard of a man who can voluntarily act on it only on one side of his neck. Sir C. Bell and others have stated that this muscle is strongly contracted under the influence of fear, and Duchesne insists so strongly on its importance in the expression of this emotion that he calls it the muscle of fright. He admits, however, that its contraction is quite inexpressive unless associated with widely open eyes and mouth. He has given a photograph, copied and reduced in the accompanying woodcut, of the same old man as on former occasions, with his eyebrows strongly raised his mouth opened, and the platysma contracted, all by means of galvanism. The original photograph was shown to 24 persons, and they were separately asked, without any explanation being given, what expression was intended. 20 instantly answered intense fright, or horror. 3 said pain, and 1 extreme discomfort. Dr. Duchesne has given another photograph of the same old man with the platysma contracted, the eyes and mouth opened, and the eyebrows rendered oblique by means of galvanism. The expression thus induced is very striking, the obliquity of the eyebrows adding the appearance of great mental distress. The original was shown to 15 persons, Twelve answered terror or horror, and three agony or great suffering. From these cases and from an examination of the other photographs given by Dr. Duchesne, together with his remarks thereon, I think there can be little doubt that the contraction of the platysma does add greatly to the expression of fear. Nevertheless, this muscle ought hardly to be called that of fright for its contraction is certainly not a necessary concomitant of this state of mind. A man may exhibit extreme terror in the plainest manner by death-like power, by drops of perspiration on his skin, and by utter prostration with all the muscles of his body, including the platysma, completely relaxed. Although Dr. Brown has often seen this muscle quivering and contracting in the insane, he has not been able to connect its action with any emotional condition in them. Though he carefully attended to patients suffering from great fear, Mr. Nicole, on the other hand, has observed three cases in which this muscle appeared to be more or less permanently contracted under the influence of melancholia associated with much dread. But in one of these cases, various other muscles about the neck and head were subject to spasmodic contractions. Dr. W. Ogle observed for me in one of the London hospitals about 20 patients, just before they were put under the influence of chloroform for operations. They exhibited some trepidation, but no great terror. In only four of the cases was the platysma visibly contracted, and it did not begin to contract until the patients began to cry. The muscles seemed to contract at the moment of each deep-drawn inspiration, so that it is very doubtful whether the contraction depended at all on the emotion of fear. 
In a fifth case, the patient who was not chloroformed was much terrified, and his platysma was more forcibly and persistently contracted than in the other cases. But even here there is room for doubt, for the muscle, which appeared to be unusually developed, was seen by Dr. Ogle to contract as the man moved his head from the pillow after the operation was over. As I felt much perplexed why, in any case, a superficial muscle on the neck should be especially affected by fear, I applied to my many obliging correspondents for information about the contraction of this muscle under other circumstances. It would be superfluous to give all the answers which I have received. They show that this muscle acts, often in a variable manner and degree, under many different conditions. It is violently contracted in hydrophobia, and in a somewhat less degree in lockjaw. Sometimes in a marked manner during the insensibility from chloroform. Dr. W. Ogle observed two male patients suffering from such difficulty in breathing that the trachea had to be opened, and in both the platysma was strongly contracted. One of these men overheard the conversation of the surgeons surrounding him, and when he was able to speak, declared that he had not been frightened. In some other cases of extreme difficulty of respiration, though not requiring tracheotomy, observed by doctors Ogle and Langstaff, the platysma was not contracted. Mr. J. Wood, who has studied with such care the muscles of the human body, as shown by his various publications, has often seen the platysma contracting in vomiting, nausea, and disgust, also in children and adults under the influence of rage, for instance, in Irish women, quarreling and brawling together with angry gesticulations. This may possibly have been due to their high and angry tones, for I know a lady, an excellent musician, who, in singing certain high notes, always contracts her platysma. So does a young man, as I have observed, in sounding certain notes on the flute. Mr. J. Wood informs me that he has found the platysma best developed in persons with thick necks and broad shoulders, and that in families inheriting these peculiarities, its development is usually associated with much voluntary power over the homologous occipitofrontalis muscle by which the scalp can be moved. None of the foregoing cases appear to throw any light on the contraction of the platysma from fear, but it is different, I think, with the following cases. The gentleman before referred to, who can voluntarily act on this muscle only on one side of his neck, is positive that it contracts on both sides whenever he is startled. Evidence has already been given showing that this muscle sometimes contracts perhaps for the sake of opening the mouth widely, when the breathing is rendered difficult by disease, and during the deep inspirations of crying fits before an operation. Now, whenever a person starts at any sudden sight or sound, he instantaneously draws a deep breath, and thus the contraction of the platysma may possibly have become associated with the sense of fear. But there is, I believe, a more efficient relation. The first sensation of fear or the imagination of something dreadful commonly excites a shudder. I have caught myself giving a little involuntary shudder at a painful thought, and I distinctly perceived that my platysma contracted. So it does if I simulate a shudder. I have asked others to act in this manner, and in some the muscle contracted, but not in others. One of my sons, whilst getting out of bed, shuddered from the cold, and as he happened to have his hand on his neck, he plainly felt that this muscle strongly contracted. He then voluntarily shuddered, as he had done on former occasions, but the platysma was not then affected. Mr. J. Wood has also several times observed this muscle contracting in patients when stripped for examination 
and who were not frightened, but shivered slightly from the cold. Unfortunately, I have not been able to ascertain whether, when the whole body shakes, as in the cold stage of an ague fit, the platysma contracts. But as it certainly often contracts during a shudder, and as a shudder or shiver often accompanies the first sensation of fear, we have, I think, a clue to its action in this latter case. Its contraction, however, is not an invariable concomitant of fear, for it probably never acts under the influence of extreme prostrating terror. Dilation of the Pupils Gratiolet repeatedly insists that the pupils are enormously dilated whenever terror is felt. I have no reason to doubt the accuracy of this statement, but have failed to obtain confirmatory evidence excepting in the one instance before given of an insane woman suffering from great fear. When writers of fiction speak of the eyes being widely dilated, I presume that they refer to the eyelids. Monroe's statement that with parrots the iris is affected by the passions, independently of the amount of light, seems to bear on this question. But Professor Donders informs me that he has often seen movements in the pupils of these birds which he thinks may be related to their power of accommodation to distance, in nearly the same manner as our own pupils contract when our eyes converge for near vision. Gratiolet remarks that the dilated pupils appear as if they were gazing into profound darkness. No doubt the fears of man have often been excited in the dark, but hardly so often or so exclusively as to account for a fixed and associated habit having thus arisen. It seems more probable, assuming that Gratiolet's statement is correct, that the brain is directly affected by the powerful emotion of fear and reacts on the pupils. But Professor Donders informs me that this is an extremely complicated subject. I may add, as possibly throwing light on the subject, that Dr. Fife of Netley Hospital has observed in two patients that the pupils were distinctly dilated during the cold stage of an ague fit. Professor Donders has also seen dilation of the pupils in incipient faintness. Horror. The state of mind expressed by this term implies terror and is in some cases almost synonymous with it. Many a man must have felt, before the blessed discovery of chloroform, great horror at the thought of an impending surgical operation. He who dreads, as well as hates a man, will feel, as Milton uses the word, a horror of him. We feel horror if we see any one, for instance a child, exposed to some instant and crushing danger. Almost everyone would experience the same feeling in the highest degree in witnessing a man being tortured or going to be tortured. In these cases, there is no danger to ourselves, but from the power of the imagination and of sympathy, we put ourselves in the position of the sufferer and feel something akin to fear. Sir C. Bell remarks that horror is full of energy, the body is in the utmost tension, not unnerved by fear. It is therefore probable that horror would generally be accompanied by the strong contraction of the brows. But as fear is one of the elements, the eyes and mouth would be opened and the eyebrows would be raised, as far as the antagonistic action of the corrugators permitted this movement. Duchesne has given a photograph of the same old man as before, with his eyes somewhat staring, the eyebrows partially raised, and at the same time strongly contracted, the mouth opened, and the platysma in action, all affected by the means of galvanism. He considers that the expression thus produced shows extreme terror with horrible pain or torture. A tortured man as long as his sufferings allow him to feel any dread for the future, 
would probably exhibit horror in an extreme degree. I have shown the original of this photograph to 23 persons of both sexes and various ages, and 13 immediately answered horror, great pain, torture, or agony. Three answered extreme fright, so that 16 answered nearly in accordance with Duchenne's belief. Six, however, said anger, guided no doubt by the strongly contracted brows, and overlooking the peculiarly open mouth. One said disgust. On the whole, the evidence indicates that we have here a fairly good representation of horror and agony. The photograph before referred to likewise exhibits horror, but in this, the oblique eyebrows indicate great mental distress in place of energy. Horror is generally accompanied by various gestures which differ in different individuals. Judging from pictures, the whole body is often turned away or shrinks, or the arms are violently protruded as if to push away some dreadful object. The most frequent gesture, as far as can be inferred from the action of persons who endeavor to express a vividly imagined scene of horror, is the raising of both shoulders, with the bent arms pressed closely against the sides or chest. These movements are nearly the same with those commonly made when we feel very cold, and they are generally accompanied by a shudder, as well as a deep expiration or inspiration, according as the chest happens at the time to be expanded or contracted. The sounds thus made are expressed by words like uh or ugh. It is not, however, obvious why, when we feel cold or express a sense of horror, we press our bent arms against our bodies, raise our shoulders, and shudder. Conclusion I have now endeavored to describe the diversified expressions of fear in its gradations from mere attention to a start of surprise into extreme terror and horror. Some of the signs may be accounted for through the principles of habit, association, and inheritance, such as the wide opening of the mouth and eyes with upraised eyebrows so as to see as quickly as possible all around us and to hear distinctly whatever sound may reach our ears. For we have thus habitually prepared ourselves to discover and encounter any danger. Some of the other signs of fear may likewise be accounted for, at least in part, through these same principles. Men, during numberless generations, have endeavored to escape from their enemies or danger by headlong flight, or by violently struggling with them, and such great exertions will have caused the heart to beat rapidly, the breathing to be hurried, the chest to heave, and the nostrils to be dilated. As these exertions have often been prolonged to the last extremity, the final result will have been utter prostration, pallor, perspiration, trembling of all the muscles, or their complete relaxation. And now, whenever the emotion of fear is strongly felt, though it may not lead to any exertion, the same results tend to reappear through the force of inheritance and association. Nevertheless, it is probable that many or most of the above symptoms of terror, such as the beating of the heart, the trembling of the muscles, cold perspiration, etc., are in large part directly due to the disturbed or interrupted transmission of nerve force from the cerebrospinal system to various parts of the body, owing to the mind being so powerfully affected. We may confidently look to this cause, independently of habit and association, in such cases as the modified secretions of the intestinal canal and the failure of certain glands to act. With respect to the involuntary bristling of the hair, we have good reason to believe that in the case of animals, this action, however it may have originated, serves, together with certain voluntary movements, to make them appear terrible to their enemies, 
and as the same involuntary and voluntary actions are performed by animals nearly related to man, we are led to believe that man has retained through inheritance a relic of them, now become useless. It is certainly a remarkable fact that the minute unstriped muscles by which the hairs thinly scattered over a man's almost naked body are erected should have been preserved to the present day and that they should still contract under the same emotions, namely terror and rage, which cause the hairs to stand on end in the lower members of the order Section 23 of the Expressions of the Emotions in Man and Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin. Chapter 13 self-attention, shame, shyness, modesty, blushing. Nature of a blush. Inheritance. The parts of the body most affected. Blushing in the various races of man. Accompanying gestures. Confusion of mind. Causes of blushing. Self-attention. The fundamental element, shyness, shame from broken moral laws and conventional rules, modesty, theory of blushing, recapitulation. Blushing is the most peculiar and the most human of all expressions. Monkeys redden from passion but it will require an overwhelming amount of evidence to make us believe that any animal could blush. The reddening of the face from a blush is due to the relaxation of the muscular coats of the small arteries, by which the capillaries become filled with blood. And this depends on the proper vasomotor center being affected. No doubt if there be at the same time much mental agitation, the general circulation will be affected. But it is not due to the action of the heart that the network of minute vessels covering the face becomes under a sense of shame gorged with blood. We can cause laughing by tickling the skin, weeping or frowning by a blow, trembling from the fear of pain, and so forth. But we cannot cause a blush, as Dr. Burgess remarks, by any physical means. That is by any action on the body. It is the mind which must be affected. Blushing is not only involuntary, but the wish to restrain it by leading to self-attention actually increases the tendency. The young blush much more freely than the old, but not during infancy which is remarkable as we know that infants at a very early age redden from passion. I have received authentic accounts of two little girls blushing at the ages of between two and three years, and of another sensitive child, a year older, blushing when reproved for a fault. Many children at a somewhat more advanced age blush in a strongly marked manner. It appears that the mental powers of infants are not as yet sufficiently developed to allow of their blushing. Hence also it is that idiots rarely blush. Dr. Crichton Brown observed for me those under his care, but never saw a genuine blush, though he has seen their faces flash, apparently from joy, when food was placed before them, and from anger. Nevertheless some if not utterly degraded, are capable of blushing. A microcephalous idiot, for instance, thirteen years old, whose eyes brightened a little when he was pleased or amused, has been described by Dr. Ben 
as blushing and turning to one side when undressed for medical examination. Women blush much more than men. It is rare to see an old man, but not nearly so rare to see an old woman blushing. The blind do not escape. Laura Bridgman, born in this condition, as well as completely deaf, blushes. The Reverend R. H. Blair, principal of the Worcester College, informs me that three children born blind, out of seven or eight then in the asylum, are great blushers. The blind are not at first conscious that they are observed, and it is the most important part of their education, as Mr. Blair informs me, to impress this knowledge on their minds and the impression thus gained would greatly strengthen the tendency to blush by increasing the habit of self-attention. The tendency to blush is inherited. Dr. Burgess gives the case of a family consisting of a father, mother, and ten children, all of whom, without exception, were prone to blush to a most painful degree. The children were grown up and some of them were sent to travel in order to wear away this diseased sensibility. But nothing was of the slightest avail. Even peculiarities in blushing seemed to be inherited. Sir James Paget, whilst examining the spine of a girl, was struck at her singular manner of blushing. A big splash of red appeared first on one cheek, and then other splashes, variously scattered over the face and neck. He subsequently asked the mother whether her daughter always blushed in this peculiar manner, and was answered, Yes, she takes after me. Sir J. Paget then perceived that, by asking this question, he had caused the mother to blush, and she exhibited the same peculiarity as her daughter. In most cases, the face ears and neck are the sole parts which redden but many persons whilst blushing intensely feel that their whole bodies grow hot and tingle and this shows that the entire surface must be in some manner affected blushes are said sometimes to commence on the forehead but more commonly on the cheeks afterwards spreading to the ears and neck in two albinos examined by Dr. Burgess, the blushes commenced by a small circumscribed spot on the cheeks, over the parotidian plexus of nerves, and then increased into a circle. Between this blushing circle and the blush on the neck, there was an evident line of demarcation, although both arose simultaneously. The retina which is naturally red in the albino, invariably increased at the same time in redness. Everyone must have noticed how easily after one blush, fresh blushes chase each other over the face. Blushing is preceded by a peculiar sensation in the skin. According to Dr. Burgess, the reddening of the skin is generally succeeded by a slight pallor, which shows that the capillary vessels contract after dilating. In some rare cases, paleness instead of redness is caused under conditions which would naturally induce a blush. For instance, a young lady told me that in a large and crowded party she caught her hair so firmly on the button of a passing servant that it took some time before she could be extricated. From her sensations, she imagined that she had blushed crimson, but was assured by a friend that she had turned extremely pale. I was desirous to learn how far down the body blushes extend, and Sir J. Paget, who necessarily has frequent opportunities for observation, has kindly attended to this point for me during two or three years. He finds that, with women who blush intensely on the face, ears, and nape of neck, the blush does not commonly extend any lower down the body. 
it is rare to see it as low down as the collar bones and shoulder blades and he has never himself seen a single instance in which it extended below the upper part of the chest he has also noticed that blushes sometimes die away downwards not gradually and insensibly but by irregular ruddy blotches dr langstaff has likewise observed for me several women whose bodies did not in the least redden while their faces were crimsoned with blushes with the insane, some of whom appear to be particularly liable to blushing, Dr. J. Crichton Brown has several times seen the blush extend as far down as the collar bones, and in two instances to the breast. He gives me the case of a married woman, aged 27, who suffered from epilepsy. On the morning after her arrival in the asylum, Dr. Brown together with his assistants, visited her while she was in bed. The moment that he approached, she blushed deeply over her cheeks and temples, and the blush spread quickly to her ears. She was much agitated and tremulous. He unfastened the collar of her chemise in order to examine the state of her lungs, and then a brilliant blush rushed over her chest in an arch line over the upper third of each breast, and extended downwards between the breasts nearly to the ensiform cartilage of the sternum this case is interesting as the blush did not thus extend downwards until it became intense by her attention being drawn to this part of her person as the examination proceeded she became composed and the blush disappeared but on several subsequent occasions the same phenomena were observed the foregoing facts show that, as a general rule, with English women, blushing does not extend beneath the neck and upper part of the chest. Nevertheless, Sir J. Paget informs me that he has lately heard of a case on which he can fully rely in which a little girl, shocked by what she imagined to be an act of indelicacy, blushed all over her abdomen and the upper parts of her legs. Maru also relates on the authority of a celebrated painter that the chest, shoulders, arms, and whole body of a girl who unwillingly consented to serve as a model reddened when she was first divested of her clothes. It is a rather curious question why, in most cases, the face, ears, and neck alone redden, inasmuch as the whole surface of the body often tingles and grows hot. It seems to depend chiefly on the face and adjoining parts of the skin having been habitually exposed to the air, light, and alternations of temperature, by which the small arteries not only have acquired the habit of readily dilating and contracting, but appear to have unusually developed in comparison with other parts of the surface. It is probably owing to the same cause as Monsieur Moreau and Dr. Burgess have remarked, that the face is so liable to redden under various circumstances, such as fever fit, ordinary heat, violent exertion, anger, a slight blow, etc. And on the other hand, that it is liable to grow pale from cold and fear, and to be discolored during pregnancy. The face is also particularly liable to be affected by cutaneous complaints, by smallpox, erysipelas, etc. This view is likewise supported by the fact that the men of certain races, who habitually go nearly naked, often blush over their arms and chests and even down to their waists. A lady, who is a great blusher, informs Dr. Crichton Brown that when she feels ashamed or is agitated, she blushes over her face, neck, wrists, and hands, that is, over all the exposed portions of her skin. Nevertheless, it may be doubted whether the habitual exposure of the skin, of the face and neck, and its consequent power of reaction under stimulants of all kinds, is by itself sufficient to account for the much greater tendency in English women of these parts than of others to blush. 
for the hands are well supplied with nerves and small vessels and have been as much exposed to the air as the face or neck and yet the hands rarely blush we shall presently see that the attention of the mind having been directed much more frequently and earnestly to the face than to any other part of the body probably affords a sufficient explanation blushing in the various races of man the small vessels of the face become filled with blood from the emotion of shame in almost all the races of man though in the very dark races no distinct change of colour can be perceived blushing is evident in all the aryan nations of europe and to a certain extent with those of india but mr erskine has never noticed that the necks of the hindus are decidedly affected with the lepchas of Sikkim, Mr. Scott has often observed a faint blush on the cheeks, base of the ears, and sides of the neck, accompanied by sunken eyes and lowered head. This has occurred when he has detected them in a falsehood, or has accused them of ingratitude. The pale, sallow complexions of these men render a blush much more conspicuous than in most of the other natives of India. With the latter, shame, or it may be in part fear, is expressed, according to Mr. Scott, much more plainly by the head being averted, or bent down, with the eyes wavering or turned askant, than by any change of color in the skin. The Semitic races blush freely, as might have been expected, from their general similitude to the Aryans. Thus with the Jews, it is said in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 6, 15, Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Mrs. Asa Gray saw an Arab managing his boat clumsily on the Nile, and when laughed at by his companions, he blushed quite to the back of his neck. Lady Duff Gordon remarks that a young Arab blushed on coming into her presence. Mr. Swinhoe has seen the Chinese blushing, but he thinks it is rare, yet they have the expression to redden with shame. Mr. Geech informs me that the Chinese settled in Malacca and the native Malays of the interior both blush. Some of these people go nearly naked, and he particularly attended to the downward extension of the blush. Omitting the cases in which the face alone was seen to blush, Mr. Geech observed that the face, arms, and breasts of a Chinaman, aged twenty-four years, reddened from shame. And with another Chinese, when asked why he had not done his work in better style, the whole body was similarly affected. In two Malays, he saw the face, neck, breast, and arms blushing. And in a third Malay, a Bugis, the blush extended down to the waist. The Polynesians blush freely. The Reverend Mr. Stack has seen hundreds of instances with the New Zealanders. The following case is worth giving, as it relates to an old man who was unusually dark-colored and partly tattooed. After having let his land to an Englishman for a small yearly rental, a strong passion seized him to buy a gig, which had lately become the fashion with the Maoris. He consequently wished to draw all the rent for four years from his tenant, and consulted Mr. Stack whether he could do so. The man was old, clumsy, poor, and ragged, and the idea of his driving himself about in his carriage for display amused Mr. Stack so much that he could not help bursting out into a laugh and then the old man blushed up to the roots of his hair. Forster says that you may easily distinguish a spreading blush on the cheeks of the fairest woman in Tahiti. The natives, also of several of the other archipelagos in the Pacific, have been seen to blush. Mr. Washington Matthews has often seen a blush on the faces of the young squalls belonging to various wild Indian tribes of North America. At the opposite extremity of the continent in Tierra del Fuego, the natives, according to Mr. Bridges, blush much, but
but chiefly in regard to women but they certainly blush also at their own personal appearance this latter statement agrees with what i remember of the fusion jemmy button who blushed when he was quizzed about the care which he took in polishing his shoes and in otherwise adorning himself with respect to the aymara indians on the lofty plateaus of bolivia mr forbes say that from the colour of their skins it is impossible that their blushes should be as clearly visible as in the white races still under such circumstances as would raise a blush in us there can always be seen the same expression of modesty or confusion and even in the dark a rise of temperature of the skin of the face can be felt exactly as occurs in the european with the indians who inhabit the hot equable and damp parts of south america the skin apparently does not answer to mental excitement so readily as with the natives of the northern and southern parts of the continent who have long been exposed to great vicissitudes of climate for humboldt quotes without a protest the sneer of the spaniard how can those be trusted who know not how to blush von spix and martius in speaking of the aborigines of brazil assert that they cannot properly be said to blush it was only after long intercourse with the whites and after receiving some education that we perceived in the indians a change of colour expressive of the emotions of their minds it is however incredible that the power of blushing could have thus originated but the habit of self-attention consequent on their education and new course of life would have much increased any innate tendency to blush several trustworthy observers have assured me that they have seen on the faces of negroes an appearance resembling a blush under circumstances which would have excited one in us though their skins were of an ebony black tint some describe it as blushing brown but most say that the blackness becomes more intense an increased supply of blood in the skin seems in some manner to increase its blackness thus certain exanthematous diseases cause the affected places in the negro to appear blacker instead of as with us redder the skin perhaps from being rendered more tense by the filling of the capillaries would reflect a somewhat different tint to what it did before that the capillaries of the face in the negro become filled with blood under the emotion of shame we may feel confident because a perfectly characterized albino negress described by buffon showed a faint tinge of crimson on her cheeks when she exhibited herself naked cicatrices of the skin remained for a long time white in the negro and dr burgess who had frequent opportunities of observing a scar of this kind on the face of a negress distinctly saw that it invariably became red whenever she was abruptly spoken to or charged with any trivial offence the blush could be seen proceeding from the circumference of the scar towards the middle but it did not reach the centre mulattoes are often great blushers blush succeeding blush over their faces from these facts there can be no doubt that negroes blush although no redness is visible on the skin i am assured by gaika and by mrs barber that the kaffirs of south africa never blush but this may only mean that no change of colour is distinguishable gaika adds that under the circumstances which would make a european blush his countrymen looked ashamed to keep their heads up it is asserted by four of my informants that the australians who are almost as black as negroes never blush a fifth answered doubtfully remarking that only a very strong blush could be seen on account of the dirty state of their skins three observers state that they do blush 
Mr. S. Wilson adding that this is noticeable only under a strong emotion, and when the skin is not too dark from long exposure and want of cleanliness. Mr. Lang answers, I have noticed that shame almost always excites a blush, which frequently extends as low as the neck. Shame is also shown, as he adds, by the eyes being turned from side to side. As Mr. Lang was a teacher in a native school, it is probable that he chiefly observed children, and we know that they blush more than adults. Mr. G. Taplin has seen half-caste blushing, and he says that the Aborigines have a word expressive of shame. Mr. Hagen Neuer, who is one of those who has never observed the Australians to blush, says that he has seen them looking down to the ground on account of shame. And the missionary, Mr. Bulmer, remarks that though I have not been able to detect anything like shame in the adult Aborigines, I have noticed that the eyes of the children, when ashamed, present a restless, watery appearance, as if they did not know where to look. The facts now given are sufficient to show that blushing, whether or not there is any change of color, is common to most, probably to all, of the races of man. Movements and Gestures Which Accompany Blushing Under a keen sense of shame there is a strong desire for concealment. We turn away the whole body, more especially the face, which we endeavor in some manner to hide. An ashamed person can hardly endure to meet the gaze of those present, so that he almost invariably casts down his eye or look askant. As there generally exists at the same time a strong wish to avoid the appearance of shame, a vain attempt is made to look direct at the person who causes this feeling and the antagonism between these opposite tendencies lead to various restless movements in the eyes. I have noticed two ladies who, whilst blushing, to which they are very liable, have thus acquired, as it appears, the oddest trick of incessantly blinking their eyelids with extraordinary rapidity. An intense blush is sometimes accompanied by a slight effusion of tears, and this I presume is due to the lacrimal glands partaking of the increased supply of blood, which we know rushes into the capillaries of the adjoining parts, including the retina. Many writers, ancient and modern, have noticed the foregoing movements, and it has already been shown that the aborigines in various parts of the world often exhibit their shame by looking downwards or asking, are by restless movements of their eyes. Ezra cries out, Chapter 9, 6 O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my head to thee, my God. In Isaiah, chapter 1, 6, we meet with the words, I hid not my face from shame. Seneca remarks, Epistle 11, 5 that the Roman players hang down their heads, fix their eyes on the ground, and keep them lowered, but are unable to blush in acting shame. According to Macrobius, who lived in the 5th century, Saturnalia, B. 7, C. 11, natural philosophers assert that nature, being moved by shame, spreads the blood before herself as a veil as we see any one blushing often put his hands before his face. Shakespeare makes Marcus, Titus Andronicus, Act 2, Scene 5, say to his knees, Ah, now thou turns away thy face for shame. A lady informs me that she found in the lock hospital a girl whom she had formerly known and who had become a wretched castaway, and the poor creature, when approached, hid her face under the bedclothes, and could not be persuaded to uncover it. We often see little children, when shy or ashamed, turn away, and still standing up, bury their
Section 24 of the Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hannah Lynn. The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin. Chapter 13. Self-Attention, Shame, Shyness, Modesty, Blushing, Continued part two confusion of mind most persons whilst blushing intensely have their mental powers confused this is recognized in such common expressions as she was covered with confusion persons in this condition lose their presence of mind and utter singularly inappropriate remarks they are often much distressed stammer and make awkward movements or strange grimaces in certain cases, involuntarily twitchings of some of the facial muscles may be observed. I have been informed by a young lady, who blushes excessively, that at such time she does not even know what she is saying. When it was suggested to her that this might be due to her distress from the consciousness that her blushing was noticed, she answered that this could not be the case, as she had sometimes felt quite as stupid when blushing at a thought in her own room. I will give an instance of the extreme disturbance of mind to which some sensitive men are liable. A gentleman, on whom I can rely, assured me that he had been an eyewitness of the following scene. A small dinner party was given in honor of an extremely shy man who, when he rose to return thanks, rehearsed the speech, which he had evidently learned by heart, in absolute silence and did not utter a single word but he acted as if he were speaking with much emphasis his friends perceiving how the case stood loudly applauded the imaginary burst of eloquence whenever his gestures indicated a pause and the man never discovered that he had remained the whole time completely silent on the contrary he afterwards remarked to my friend with much satisfaction that he thought he had succeeded uncommonly well. When a person is much ashamed or very shy and blushes intensely, his heart beats rapidly and his breathing is disturbed. This can hardly fail to affect the circulation of the blood within the brain, and perhaps the mental powers. It seems, however, doubtful, judging from the still more powerful influence of anger and fear on the circulation, whether we can thus satisfactorily account for the confused state of mind in persons whilst blushing intensely. The true explanation apparently lies in the intimate sympathy which exists between the capillary circulation of the surface of the head and face and that of the brain. On applying to Dr. J. Crichton Brown for information, he has given me various facts bearing on this subject. When the sympathetic nerve is divided on one side of the head, the capillaries on this side are relaxed and become filled with blood, causing the skin to redden and to grow hot, and at the same time the temperature within the cranium on the same side rises. Inflammation of the membranes of the brain leads to the engorgement of the face, ears, and eyes with blood. The first stage of an epileptic fit appears to be the contraction of the vessels of the brain, and the first outward manifestation is an extreme pallor of countenance. Erysipelas of the head commonly induces delirium. Even the relief given to a severe headache by burning the skin with strong lotion depends, I presume, on the same principle. Dr. Brown has often administered to his patients the vapor of the nitrite of amyl which has the singular property of causing vivid redness of the face in from thirty to sixty seconds. This flushing resembles blushing in almost every detail. It begins at several distinct points on the face and spreads till it involves the whole surface of the head, neck, and front of the chest, but has been observed to extend only in one case to the abdomen. The arteries in the retina becomes enlarged, the eyes glisten, and in one instance there was a slight effusion of tears. 
The patients are at first pleasantly stimulated, but as the flushing increases, they become confused and bewildered. One woman, to whom the vapor had often been administered, asserted that as soon as she grew hot, she grew muddled. With persons just commencing to blush, it appears, judging from their bright eyes and lively behavior, that their mental powers are somewhat stimulated. It is only when the blushing is excessive that the mind grows confused. Therefore, it would seem that the capillaries of the face are affected both during the inhalation of the nitrite of amyl and during blushing before that part of the brain is affected on which the mental powers depend conversely when the brain is primarily affected the circulation of the skin is so in a secondary manner dr brown has frequently observed as he informs me scattered red blotches and mottlings on the chest of epileptic patients in these cases when the skin on the thorax or abdomen is gently rubbed with a pencil or other object, or in strongly marked cases is merely touched by the finger, the surface becomes suffused in less than half a minute with bright red marks, which spread to some distance on each side of the touched point, and persists for several minutes. These are the cerebral maculae of Trousseau, and they indicate, as Dr. Brown remarks, a highly modified condition of the cutaneous vascular system. If then there exists, as cannot be doubted, an intimate sympathy between the capillary circulation in that part of the brain on which our mental powers depend, and in the skin of the face, it is not surprising that the moral causes which induce intense blushing should likewise induce, independently of their own disturbing influence, much confusion of mind. The nature of the mental states which induce blushing. These consist of shyness, shame, and modesty. The essential element in all being self-attention. Many reasons can be assigned for believing that originally self-attention directed to personal appearance, in relation to the opinion of others, was the exciting cause, the same effect being subsequently produced through the force of association, by self-attention in relation to moral conduct. It is not the simple act of reflecting on our own appearance, but the thinking what others think of us, which excites a blush. In absolute solitude, the most sensitive person would be quite indifferent about his appearance. We feel blame or disapprobation more acutely than approbation, and consequently depreciatory remarks, or ridicule whether our appearance or conduct causes us to blush much more readily than does praise. But undoubtedly praise and admiration are highly efficient. A pretty girl blushes when a man gazes intently at her, though she may know perfectly well that he is not depreciating her. Many children, as well as old and sensitive persons, blush when they are much praised. Hereafter the question will be discussed how it has arisen that the consciousness that others are attending to our personal appearance should have led to the capillaries, especially those of the face, instantly becoming filled with blood. My reasons for believing that attention directed to personal appearance and not to moral conduct has been the fundamental element in the acquirement of the habit of blushing will now be given. They are separately light, but combined possesses, as it appears to me, considerable weight. It is notorious that nothing makes a shy person blush so much as any remark, however slight, on his personal appearance. One cannot notice even the dress of a woman much given to blushing without causing her face to crimson. It is sufficient to stare hard at some person to make them, as Coleridge remarks, blush account for that he who can with the two albinos observed by dr burgess the slightest attempt to examine their peculiarities invariably caused them to blush deeply women are much more sensitive about their personal appearance than men are especially elderly women in comparison with elderly men and they blush much more freely the young of both sexes are much more sensitive on the same head than the old, and they also blush much more freely than the old. 
Children at a very early age do not blush, nor do they show those other signs of self-consciousness which generally accompany blushing. And it is one of their chief charms that they think nothing about what others think of them. At this early age, they will stare at a stranger with a fixed gaze and unblinking eyes, as on an inanimate object, in a manner which we elders cannot imitate. It is plain to everyone that young men and women are highly sensitive to the opinion of each other with reference to their personal appearance, and they blush incomparably more in the presence of the opposite sex than in that of their own. A young man, not very liable to blush, will blush intensely at any slight ridicule of his appearance from a girl whose judgment on any important subject lie with disregard. No happy pair of young lovers, valuing each other's admiration and love more than anything else in the world, probably ever courted each other without many a blush. Even the barbarians of Tierra del Fuego, according to Mr. Bridges, blush chiefly in regard to women, but certainly also at their own personal appearance. Of all parts of the body, the face is most considered and regarded, as is natural from its being the chief seat of expression and the source of the voice. It is also the chief seat of beauty and of ugliness, and throughout the world is the most ornamented. The face, therefore, will have been subjected during many generations to much closer and more earnest self-attention than any other part of the body. And in accordance with the principle here advanced, we can understand why it should be the most liable to blush, although exposure to alternations of temperature and etc. has probably much increased the power of dilatation and contraction in the capillaries of the face and adjoining parts, yet this by itself will hardly account for these parts blushing much more than the rest of the body for it does not explain the fact of the hands rarely blushing with europeans the whole body tingles slightly when the face blushes intensely and with the races of men who habitually go nearly naked the blushes extend over a much larger surface than with us these facts are to a certain extent intelligible as the self-attention of primeval man as well as of the existing races which still go naked will not have been so exclusively confined to their faces as is the case with the people who now go clothed we have seen that in all parts of the world persons who feel shame for some moral delinquency are apt to avert bend down or hide their faces independently of any thought about their personal appearance the object can hardly be to conceal their blushes for the face is thus averted or hidden under circumstances which exclude any desire to conceal shame as when guilt is fully confessed and repented of it is however probable that primeval man before he had acquired much moral sensitiveness would have been highly sensitive about his personal appearance at least in reference to the other sex and he would consequently have felt distress at any depreciatory remarks about his appearance and this is one form of shame and as the face is the part of the body which is most regarded it is intelligible that any one ashamed of his personal appearance would desire to conceal this part of his body. The habit, having been thus acquired, would naturally be carried on when shame from strictly moral causes was felt, and it is not easy otherwise to see why under these circumstances there should be a desire to hide the face more than any other part of the body. The habit, so general with every one who feels ashamed, of turning away, or lowering his eyes, or restlessly moving them from side to side, probably follows from each glance directed towards those present, bringing home the conviction that he is intently regarded. And he endeavors, by not looking at those present, and especially not at their eyes, momentarily to escape from this painful conviction shyness this odd state of mind often called shamefacedness or false shame or mauvaise honte appears to be one of the most efficient of all the causes of blushing 
Shyness is, indeed, chiefly recognized by the face reddening, by the eyes being averted or cast down, and by awkward, nervous movements of the body. Many a woman blushes from this cause a hundred, perhaps a thousand times, to once that she blushes from having done anything deserving blame, and of which she is truly ashamed. Shyness seems to depend on sensitiveness to the opinion, whether good or bad, of others, more especially with respect to external appearance. Strangers neither know nor care anything about our conduct or character, but they may, and often do, criticize our appearance. Hence shy persons are particularly apt to be shy and to blush in the presence of strangers. The consciousness of anything peculiar, or even new, in the dress, or any slight blemish on the person, and more especially on the face, points which are likely to attract the attention of strangers, makes the shy intolerably shy. On the other hand, in those cases in which conduct and not personal appearance is concerned, we are much more apt to be shy in the presence of acquaintances, whose judgment we in some degree value, than in that of strangers. A physician told me that a young man, a wealthy duke, with whom he had travelled as medical attendant, blushed like a girl when he paid him his fee. Yet this young man probably would not have blushed and been shy had he been paying a bill to a tradesman. Some persons, however, are so sensitive that the mere act of speaking to almost anyone is sufficient to rouse their self-consciousness, and a slight blush is the result. This approbation or ridicule, from our sensitiveness on this head, causes shyness and blushing much more readily than this approbation, though the latter with some persons is highly efficient. The conceited are rarely shy, for they value themselves much too highly to expect depreciation. Why a proud man is often shy, as appears to be the case, is not so obvious, unless it be that, with all his self-reliance, he really thinks much about the opinion of others, although in a disdainful spirit. Persons who are exceedingly shy are rarely shy in the presence of those with whom they are quite familiar, and of whose good opinion and sympathy they are perfectly assured. For instance, a girl in the presence of her mother. I neglected to inquire in my printed paper whether shyness can be detected in the different races of man, but a Hindu gentleman assured Mr. Erskine that it is recognizable in his countrymen. Shyness, as the derivation of the word indicates in several languages, is closely related to fear. Yet it is distinct from fear in the ordinary sense. A shy man no doubt dreads the notice of strangers, but can hardly be said to be afraid of them. He may be as bold as a hero in battle, and yet have no self-confidence about trifles in the presence of strangers. Almost every one is extremely nervous when first addressing a public assembly, and most men remain so throughout their lives. But this appears to depend on the consciousness of a great coming exertion, with its associated effects on the system, rather than on shyness. Although a timid or shy man no doubt suffers on such occasions indefinitely more than another. With very young children, it is difficult to distinguish between fear and shyness, but this latter feeling with them has often seemed to me to partake of the character of the wildness of an untamed animal. Shyness comes on at a very early age. In one of my own children, when two years and three months old, I saw a trace of what certainly appeared to be shyness, directed towards myself after an absence from home of only a week. This was shown not only by a blush, but by the eyes being for a few minutes slightly averted from me. I have noticed on other occasions that shyness or shamefacedness and real shame are exhibited in the eyes of young children before they have acquired the power of blushing. 
As shyness apparently depends on self-attention, we can perceive how right are those who maintain that reprehending children for shyness instead of doing them any good does much harm, as it calls their attention still more closely to themselves. It has been well urged that nothing hurts young people more than to be watched continually about their feelings, to have their countenances scrutinized, and the degrees of their sensibility measured by the surveying eye of the unmerciful spectator. Under the constraint of such examinations, they can think of nothing but that they are looked at, and feel nothing but shame or apprehension. Moral Causes Guilt with respect to blushing from strictly moral causes, we meet with the same fundamental principle as before, namely, regard for the opinion of others. It is not the conscience which raises a blush, for a man may sincerely regret some slight fault committed in solitude, or he may suffer the deepest remorse for an undetected crime, but he will not blush. I blush, says Dr. Burgess, in the presence of my accusers. It is not the sense of guilt, but the thought that others think or know us to be guilty, which crimsons the face. A man may feel thoroughly ashamed at having told a small falsehood without blushing, but if he even suspects that he is detected, he will instantly blush, especially if detected by one whom he reveres. On the other hand, a man may be convinced that God witnesses all his actions, and he may feel deeply conscious of some fault and pray for forgiveness, but this will not, as a lady who is a great blusher believes, ever excite a blush. The explanation of this difference between the knowledge by God and man of her action lies, I presume, in man's disapprobation of immoral conduct, being somewhat akin in nature to his depreciation of our personal appearance, so that through association both lead to similar results, whereas the disapprobation of God brings up no such association. Many a person has blushed intensely when accused of some crime, though completely innocent of it. Even the thought, as the lady before referred to has observed to me, that others think that we have made an unkind or stupid remark, is amply sufficient to cause a blush, although we know all the time that we have been completely misunderstood. An action may be meritorious or of an indifferent nature, but a sensitive person, if he suspects that others take a different view of it, will blush. For instance, a lady by herself may give money to a beggar without a trace of a blush, but if others are present, and she doubts whether they approve or suspects that they think her influenced by display, she will blush. So it will be if she offers to relieve the distress of a decayed gentlewoman, more particularly of one whom she had previously known under better circumstances, as she cannot then feel sure how her conduct will be viewed. But such cases as these blend into shyness. Breaches of Etiquette The rules of etiquette always refers to conduct in the presence of or towards others. They have no necessary connection with the moral sense and are often meaningless. Nevertheless, as they depend on the fixed custom of our equals and superiors, whose opinion we highly regard, they are considered almost as binding as are the laws of honor to a gentleman. Consequently, the breach of the laws of etiquette, that is, any impoliteness or gaucherie, any impropriety, or an inappropriate remark, though quite accidental, will cause the most intense blushing of which a man is capable. Even the recollection of such an act, after an interval of many years, will make the whole body to tingle. So strong, also, is the power of sympathy that a sensitive person, as a lady has assured me, will sometimes blush at a flagrant breach of etiquette.